that this meeting is being recorded. I'll take a, a, a roll call just to confirm that we have our report. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Good morning. Commissioner Zinnega. Here. Good morning. Good morning. And Commissioner Stebbins. Here. Good morning, everyone. And there we have all five of us. We'll get, get started. Just a reminder that we are using uh, remote collaborative technology today in accordance with the governor's advisor uh, order that allows us some relief from the open meeting law, allowing us, as you are now well acquainted, to uh, conduct our public meetings this way. So thank you for joining us today. It is a, um, a special agenda. It is public meeting number 305. And it's Thursday, June 11th at 10 a.m. And this meeting has a, a, a limited agenda. Agenda, I, uh, we have no meeting minutes to address. I just want to uh, address <clears throat> what the outcome is. And then Karen and team will proceed with, with the substantive matter. We do not have this agenda marked up for a vote. And I want to make sure my fellow commissioners are comfortable with this. Um, we thought that today would be an opportunity to go through the good work that the, uh, the team has done um, under Karen's leadership with a lot of input from all of our team and a lot of crafting from Loretta. Um, <clears throat> we would look to see where we have clear consensus or close consensus and then those uh, provisions where we might need to go back to the, the industry, to each of the licensees for further clarification or if it's really a matter of public health, where we go to both the state and local public health officials for further guidance. Uh, and <clears throat> then when we uh, tinker with the guidelines further and get closer to where we uh, will probably have a, a consensus, we'll bring it back for a vote. Does that make sense? Uh, any? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I mean, a Agreed. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, Commissioner Zunica and Stevan. Okay, good. Thanks, Bruce. You're all set. Agreed. Yep. Okay, Sorry. excellent. So, Karen, do you want to proceed yeah. with how? Yeah, I'll just I'll just kick it off, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. As you are well aware, the governor set out his guidelines for the reopening of Massachusetts, and the casino opening and the uh, racetrack opening were put in phase three. So in an effort to assist the commission with any guidelines that they may want to impose for the opening of the casinos in that initial phase when they, right when they open, uh, staff put together a uh, memorandum and then also uh, sort of a chart for you to look at options of different things that are happening in different parts of the country or different things that are suggested so that we can put together any guidelines that you may want to require before the casinos open. And I'd like to uh, specifically thank the team that put a lot of work into this. There was a lot going on across the country in different areas and gathering that information uh, was difficult. Bruce Band and Burt Kane and his team, and particularly Loretta Lilios, combining all that information into one document was a lot of work and, and they did a tremendous job here and sort of that universe of what options there are for the commission. So I'd really like to compliment the staff on putting that together. Uh, and then uh, I think that what would make sense, uh, Madam Chair, is for you to sort of guide the discussion with the commissioners on uh, going through that chart and getting some thoughts and feedback. And then also the uh, licensees are on the call, they're available, they did. Uh, all have experts within their uh, companies that they hired in order to get some good feedback on safe procedures. So they're available if with any questions or if you need any feedback on these guidelines and what makes sense for reopening Massachusetts casinos. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Attorney Lilios just to, to give you sort of a, uh, an overview of this and then we can proceed if that makes sense, Madam Chair. That makes great sense. Okay. Thanks. And, sure. and I think we can see uh, many of our uh, colleagues from the licensees, but if there's a particular person that you want to speak with, just, you know, you can ask commissioners or somebody will chime in for each licensee. Thanks. Go ahead. Sorry, Loretta. 
Uh, sure, uh, thank you and good morning. So as Karen mentioned, uh, the purpose of the uh, materials that you have in front of you is to provide you with a list of potential measures for the initial stage of the phase three uh, casino reopening with a focus in the areas of the hygiene, the sanitization, social distancing, as well as reporting measures. Um, the chart that you have in front of you was designed as a continuum of measures uh, in increasing uh, aspects of comprehensiveness from column A through column C. It was not intended though as an exhaustive list and not intended that you would end up selecting you know, the entirety of measures in one column versus another. It's really a tool uh, for your uh, discussion um, uh, and consideration. Inherent in the materials before you is uh, required compliance with all CDC guidelines, uh, Department of Public Health guidelines, governor's guidelines, as well as any sector specific guidance that the governor's office uh, may, uh, may promulgate uh, in the week, days and weeks ahead. Also inherent in this, as the memo mentions, is the requirement that each property uh, develop a plan in conjunction with its public health and epidemiological experts. I know that they have been working with those experts uh, for months now. And a requirement that oversight of adherence to their plan and to the required measure measures that you end up uh, putting into place uh, fall uh, under the rubric of their compliance department and that uh, communication and reporting um, of compliance be made on a routine uh, basis uh, to, the, uh, to the commission. Uh, there also is a suggestion in one of the measures, uh, the general measures of the designation of a pandemic safety officer to work in, in conjunction with the compliance department and to be a liaison with public health officials uh, here in Massachusetts. So you'll see that the categories for your discussion are on uh, pre-opening, um, compliance with the public health measures, entry process and screening process for guests, occupancy levels, uh, then some measures uh, for consideration around slots and table games, cage uh, measures, uh, and some additional general measures for the gaming area, for the game sense area, and uh, for uh, employee related measures. Um, so those are my general comments, but uh, hope in, in conjunction with Bruce and Burke to be able to uh, address any questions that you may have as you uh, discuss this. And, and one other thing, uh, Madam Chair and members of the commission to remember is that also the governor's advisory board may come out with some uh, industry specific guidelines, which we would lay on top of any guidelines that we have. So we would not want to be in, uh, in contrast to any guidelines by the governor. So while we are going through these, it's, it's important to remember that that is also happening simultaneously. The governor's advisory board is looking at different industries. So we have to be aware that those guidelines may come out and uh, inform what the commission's ultimate decisions may be. And I think we should also add the local public health. Correct. Uh, is it, are they councils or public health departments? The three? I so think we, they're departments. But okay. Laura, you may, Laura had a contact with them. She may be able to help there. Yes, public health departments. Um, and uh, I have been in contact uh, with two of the three. They may even be on this, uh, on this mm -hmm. call, and I'm in the process of making, um, uh, making contact with, uh, with the third. Um, uh, and it's my understanding that uh, there are uh, reporting obligations for any positive cases and that the local departments are liaisons to the state department in that uh, aspect, uh, especially as would relate to contact, contact tracing uh, responsibilities. 
Good. I'm, I'm glad if they're joined, if they've joined, because I did see that that is the, that would be the immediate contact should there be a positive case that the state's making sure that the locals are the first point of contact, which makes great sense. All righty. So uh, Loretta, does it make sense and Karen to have Loretta walk us through the chart? Uh, the first two so. um, look like they're the same. Uh, I think it would be really helpful for you to, to walk us through and, and inform us of your thinking. Uh, sure. So the first uh, category is on the pre-opening cleaning uh, and the measures across all three groups are the same. Uh, and that's, you know, a full deep cleaning and disinfecting uh, of the uh, gaming establishment, all areas that would be open in accordance with uh, the guidelines that the C CDC has uh, put out for uh, cleaning and disinfecting your facility. Uh, and then, as Karen mentioned, any uh, specifics uh, sector guidance that the governor uh, may, uh, may put out. Uh, so it would be this measure is an expectation that each of the facilities would comply with that pre-opening uh, process. Uh, and on the, those, on that three, um, just so that we understand the structure, those three are exactly alike. When you were, when you were uh, drafting these, Loretta, you looked at practices from across the country, you were informed by the licensees, you made some judgment calls uh, based on the expertise from our our internal team, and in this case, you found that there really isn't a continuum here. This is the best practice. That that is exactly right. That that uh, would be the minimum expectation in in this area for an opening measure. Okay. So what I'm going to do is at the end of each one, unless I see somebody raising their hand, we'll continue to the next one. Enrique. Yeah, yeah, thank you. No, uh, thank you. I think these, um, these are very uh, intuitive and make a lot of sense. Um, I think a lot of what the, the jurisdictions around the country and other industries, not just gaming, are doing. I, I just have to ask for uh, out of curiosity, uh, when it comes to the pre-opening cleaning, my understanding is that uh, uh, the, the risk is uh, that, that the virus might linger in, in surfaces for at least a couple of days, but everybody seems to un agree that much, not much longer than that. So what is, um, besides reassuring the public, which I think is very significant, what would be um, the, the, the rationale behind uh, a deep cleaning prior to opening, especially in areas that have been really right. vacant for a long time? Well, I do expect that uh, in preparation for reopening that there would be staff and vendors uh, that would have to uh, be making preparations to get the properties ready. Uh, so, um, you know, as a last step before reopening, uh, the cleaning would address any uh, issues that you know might have happened uh, during that preparation process. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Any further questions, comments from my fellow? I see no hands, no shouts. Okay, that seems to make good sense. Let's move on to your second bullet. Uh, similarly, the uh, second bullet is consistent in all three categories, and as we've already discussed, it's you know, compliance with the CDC uh, guidance and protocols with the State Department of Public Health guidance and protocols, and any measures uh, from the governor, general measures, or some of those sector-specific measures that we uh, have not yet seen, but may be for, uh, forthcoming uh, for dealing with this uh, pandemic. Could we uh, just include locals to there, please, Loretta? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from my fellow commissioners on that? Enrique? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think um, there's not a straight uh, answer to this question for this moment, but I suspect it will touch on other aspects as we go forward. But I, I'll ask it now. Um, I, I think the, the general thrust of, of having licensees have a compliance program like you articulated earlier and everybody comply with all the guidelines this, this makes a lot of sense of obviously um, I think the, 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 the challenge might be in the fact that it 
that it eventually permeates down to the public adhering to a lot of these uh, guidelines. Um, and it is at least feasible that, um, you know, we will encounter um, the occasional person who is either unaware or unwilling uh, 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 to comply, members of the public, to comply with some of these. So as we, as we keep going with this discussion, my, my overarching question is um, to, to kind of have, be, be cognizant that we will likely have we, we, we can leverage uh, uh, on licensees as it is uh, our only recourse, uh, but we'll also are going to have to depend on adherence from the public. Yeah, I suspect um, there'll be enforcement questions as we go along. Uh, commissioners, do we agree? Yes. Yeah, I can and see. Page, with, with respect to that uh, point, uh, Enrique, on page eight under your general measures, uh, there is a point for each licensee's plan to detail their procedures for dealing with um, guests who are non-compliant uh, with the protocols. So there's an expectation that thought be given uh, to that in advance uh, implementation of uh, you know, their staff on the security uh, side uh, uh, and uh, you know, if necessary, a GEU uh, staff as well. Loretta, I, you're I, absolutely I, right about uh, guests having responsibilities as well. Loretta, I, whoops, I'm sorry. I would just echo Enrique's point. We're obviously uh, reopening to unusual circumstances, and our hope is trying to minimize any patron disruption or events yeah. on the floor. And a lot of that is going to be around the adherence of the patrons uh, to these guidelines as well. Yeah. Commissioner Cameron, do you want to chime in? Then we'll continue to move. I know this is going to be a concern for most of us if you want to echo it, and then we can just really be cognizant of that particular. Uh, yeah, thank you. I don't have anything to add at this time. I'm listening to everyone and. Uh, you know, the Excellent. thoughtful planning that went into this. So great. I'm all set for now. Okay, great. Commissioner O'Brien? Uh, no, I don't. This is uh, a lot of work went into this. It's very helpful. I have some questions once we hit the next category, but I'm, I'm fine to this point. Okay, great. Thank you. All righty, moving on then to your, your third area, uh, Loretta. So the third area, there are some differences in the categories. This is around the uh, entry and screening of guests. And the first category um, uh, is san hand sanitizer available at every entrance and signage uh, and greeters, whether that be uh, separate greeters or security staff, uh, encouraging guests to use the sanitizer before entering. And this is in, in category A, uh, san sanitizer to comply with the CDC guidelines. Uh, signage encouraging the wearing of uh, masks covering the uh, nose and mouth uh, while in the gaming area in category A except while eating or drinking. Uh, uh, plans uh, for doing identity uh, checks so a safe location for guests to uh, lower the masks uh, briefly for uh, identity checks uh, when necessary and uh, discouraging the wearing of uh, hats because the hat and the mask can make identi identification especially difficult and appropriate uh, receptacles for disposal of uh, PPE uh, throughout the property. So those are the group A uh, measures. The group B uh, measures on the hand sanitizer is the same as A. Um, uh, uh, points of entry, the greeters to offer guests masks if they need one, uh, uh, signage that would require the wearing of masks as opposed to encouraging the wearing, wearing of masks, except while drinking. And in the B category, there would be no food allowed in the gaming area. Uh, in terms of screening for category B, signage listing the COVID-19 symptoms, uh, 
as well as uh, restricted travel areas that the CDC has designated as level three warning countries and asking guests not to enter if they have answered yes to any of the symptoms for uh, travel. Uh, training employees to identify symptomatic individuals and developing procedures to uh, implement further screening when guests are identified as exhibiting symptoms and prohibiting entrance or requiring guests who are symptomatic to leave. Category B requires the licensee to consider performing the temperature checks and prohibiting entry to anyone over 100.4 degrees. Uh, again, uh, safe locations for identity uh, checks and discouraging the weary, wearing of hats and staff uh, being present at entry points to ensure compliance. Category C adds some additional measures like separating the points of entry from the points of exit to discourage uh, two-way traffic, requiring touchless hand sanitizer dispensers at points of entry and requiring guests to use it providing guests with masks, requiring guests to use it, and not allowing any food or any drink in the gaming area. This category C also would require the non-touch temperature checks at points of entry, would require a, an individualized questionnaire, either orally or in writing, rather than the, just the signage in category three. Uh, listing the symptoms and the uh, travel and prohibiting entry to any affirmative answers. Um, the identity check measures are the, are the same as the other categories. Uh, and the one additional measure in category C is uh, aimed at uh, facilitating contact tracing uh, and it was actually taken from a sector specific measure that the governor has implemented on restaurants and uh, asks for the retention of a telephone number for guests for possible future contact tracing. So Madam Chair and members of the commission, what I'm, I'm going to do while you're having your discussion, I'll be somewhat of a, a note taker here and mark up. Uh, I have a, a draft here and I'll mark up sort of what I see is, is your um, guidance on these. What would be helpful for me and, and sort of an option for you is if uh, we can go through these at the end of their discussion and identify which things you think as a general practice you have consensus that you really want to mandate. Uh, you could also look at these and uh, there is the option of just encouraging the licensees to adopt these practices or you could not even mention this, it's something we really don't want in the guidance document itself. So one of those three categories would be an idea for how it could be helpful to navigate through this. The other option is if there are any of these where you would like to see, maybe if there's any further guidance by the governor's office or public health, if you wanna put it on hold, that would be helpful. And then I can track those so when we come back, we have uh, sort of a, a um, a compilation of what the general consensus was from the commission. Does that make sense or does anyone have any other suggestions on how I can track this to get it back to you later? I think that that really uh, reflects what we started with, why we're not voting today. We'll try to get a, a consensus on measures uh, where, you know, on, on uh, particular categories, particular provisions where we can. And I think you'll see where we're struggling, Karen. So, okay. and, and then we'll we'll take the, the uh, get additional input from okay. other stakeholders. So I think that sounds good. Does that sound good? What uh, Karen outlined. Yes. Yeah, All right. It, Should we just talk, tackle? Let's tackle hand sanitizer. How actually, about, before can we do that? I just have one question. Everything seems to build A, and then you add, and then B adds when you get to C, except for the last bullet in A where it says provide appropriate receptacles for disposal of PPE in A. That might have just been there. And then it disappears. Is that 
just a typo or is there a reason for that? Um, it actually, it, it appears in the additional measures at the end of the document. So it is anticipated that it be provided, that it, that it be a bullet point in all areas. It, all right, so, so we can it, strike that from A because it's basically recommended to be across the board. Okay. Exactly. Okay, um, should we, should, oh, sorry, uh, Bruce? Yeah, uh, no, Loretta, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at column C Excuse me. I'm looking at a lot of the the questions um, that the suggestion is maybe having the you know staff ask each guest upon entry. Um, I want to go back to the earlier conversation we had with our licensees about a robust communications plan in advance of reopening, and that might be a place for some of those questions to be listed again. Um, and I might want to see that as part of the reopening plan is what is your communications plan to patrons? Um, maybe going through some of those questions so it's not something happening on site, but it is something for the patron to be aware of before they even arrive at the property. So, you know, my initial blush, blush at looking at all those questions is, you know, you start running into a back lot, you know, a backup of patrons trying to access the floor when patrons themselves should be answering those questions before they even arrive. And I think, again, building in that robust communications plan, which I think a few of our licensees talked about, um, I think would be an important component to the reopening plan itself. That's an excellent point. And certainly the, un, uh, the there is a, a unwieldy nature of you know, aspect of requiring those questions uh, on site at the door of entry. Right. So uh, that's uh, really what this document is designed to do: is to generate discussion uh, on the topics, and that's uh, perfect comment. Because I'm not sure any of us could identify what the CDC level travel warning countries are right off the top of our head. So I, so I have from my, oh, sorry. So for my notes, it's, it's to require the casino uh, communication plan with their patrons as part of their pre-opening and include questions for the, you know, incorporate some of these questions in that communications plan. Is that what you're saying, Bruce? Yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a reminder of, you know, things to one that the patron patron is going to experience when they show up. They should know they're going to probably get a temperature check. There's some conversation about that. It's kind of helping the patron understand what to expect before they even show up. And, you know, if somebody who answers one of those questions decides maybe I shouldn't go, then it's less hassle on the property. Oh, I see. Itself. I see. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I think there may be requirements even out of the advisory board on, on making sure that you provide that information on your website. The licensees, uh, Jackie, you're nodding your head. I believe that, that those kinds of requirements are, are going to be part of the overall arching plan for industries. But I do hear- Absolutely. That, sorry. Go ahead, uh, that, Jackie. That would, that would absolutely be part of our pre-opening plan that we'd push out uh, to you know, our entire database because they know what to be, they know what to expect once they arrive. Um, you know, our concern about this too was having significant uh, lines because this would, it's four questions and then also language barriers. So the more information we can give to people ahead of time, uh, the better. Okay. So Jackie, you, you yeah. said your database, but also I would assume also just widely available on your website, sort of like any yeah, other facility any where it's, access. right, I'm thinking about places like before you go, you know, certain venues where it's like, you know, you have to be this tall to be able to do it. You have these medical conditions, you can't come in. So that would be also readily available on the website, not just to the database of your red card numbers. That's correct. And it also, uh, you know, the same place where it says you have to be 21 and above, we'd have it easily accessible. Okay. So, but I understand that Commissioner Stebbins is saying, you know, we would like to have an affirmation that those plans will be in place and that the communication plans will be in place and communication plans include the signage requirements. Much of that is incorporated into the governor's advisory um, board's requirements. To the extent we want anything in addition, Bruce, we should take a careful look at that. 
Uh, okay. Make sure, yeah, so maybe we can get some help on, on where for this particular, the particular entities we might want something in addition, or each, uh, each licensee may have something that they want to include that's an addition. Well, I think each, you know, as Jackie just kind of pointed out, they're thinking of a robust communications plan. Every property is different. So giving directions as to how somebody enters the property at one licensee is going to be different. Um, you know, the simple suggestions of don't come wearing a hat, that will help ease the flow of patrons into the facility and, and kind of prevent any unnecessary backups. So just to keep us aligned in terms of time, because we actually do want to pass on the set of the particular provisions, they're clustered together, but there are some differences. So to the extent we can be a little bit methodical to just confirm what we do have firm consensus on, and then what merits additional discussion, we could just kind of save it to the end of the, the particular block and then we can weed out where we're all in agreement, okay? So uh, on hand sanitizer, I don't, um, there's, there seems to be the big difference is whether it's we're requiring touchless or touch, is that the main thing, Loretta? And uh, that's right, I do wanna to bring to your attention that uh, in terms of the availability of some of the touchless measures, it's my understanding that that is, uh, that there is a, an issue of availability for the, the large touchless uh, stands. So if you were inclined to uh, like the touchless, you know, you may consider you know, touchless uh, where, where it's able to be acquired and when it's able to be acquired. And along those, along those lines, uh, this, the way this is written, it assumes hand sanitizer is available. So I, you know, defer to the, the licensees if they anticipate any problems getting the hand sanitizer. Because if that, it's hard to require something if they, you know, and then they can't access it. I see Seth raising his hand. Yeah, uh, and, and, and thank you. Just, yeah, just as an aside, we also will always yield to what the public health department we would expect. Uh, so. If they all of a sudden decided you don't need hand sanitizing, that would make this move. But I, assuming right now, hand sanitizer, we've heard that over and over, that's an essential piece. How are you, how are you on supplies, Seth? Uh, hand sanitizers, hand sanitizer, we're good. Um, uh, wipes, not, not the same. Um, so so I think we're okay with hand sanitizer. Um, okay. Little trickier for the touch list than the, than the manual pump. Um, those are harder to get, but we have some supply. Um, one point I did want to make, I, the distinction, and we, we mentioned this to staff yesterday, um, between at least A and B on hand sanitizer is the, the encouragement versus the requirement. And right. that does go to any, any, I think we, there's consensus among the licensees that we would prefer encouragement than requirement because of the enforcement challenges. Um, whether someone just sanitize their hands, whether they have an allergy to sanitizer, trying to require each person to sanitize their hands, for instance, as they walk in, versus make it available and strongly encourage it. Um, we would prefer the, the latter. Um, so, and I think you'll hear that, that's our perspective on several of these items, where it's a requirement versus a, a strong encouragement because of the enforcement challenges. Thank you. In terms of supplies, you did hear Seth say that the touches might be be harder. I'm not sure if public health has a particular, you know, they're strongly tied to exactly. So let's just say in terms of provide hand sanitizer, the way it's written, does anybody have, if we take out touches, does anybody have a concern about that? I see no, no. no. We're good with hand sanitizer. Yeah. All right, uh, good. Uh, so, Madam Chair, I would just, I would just, um, you know, remind our licensees on the governor's uh, COVID-19 page, there's a list of suppliers in Massachusetts uh, that offer a variety of sanitizing products as well as um, PPE. Um, and a number of those companies are certified as minority women or veteran owned businesses. So 60 companies in Massachusetts supply or manufacture the wipe. So, I would encourage our licensees to check out that page um, to see if there are any contacts that they weren't aware of. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Madam Chair, do we need to discuss encourage versus require for guests? Right. So right now it says provide, and we're not we're not mandating, but but we are requiring them to provide it. In the way well, that's written, Loretta, was that purposeful? Well, uh, it does say. Right. Category C is require guests to use the sanitizer. Oh, yes, require. Yeah. Thank this you. This is B. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yep. B and C. See. Yeah, thank you. So B and C, encourage versus uh, in, in the must. As Seth points out, it's advantageous for the licensees to um, not have to worry about enforcement issues. Do we want to, it's at a point, this is only with respect to point of entry. Yeah. Well, I, I would be um, inclined to be on the required part of this only because when it comes to the point of entry, that's the most critical time uh, after which it's easier to be less of a requirement because we've screened people before they come in into the casino. So um, if there's an area, in my view, if there's an area where we need to be um, perhaps more uh, strict, and I understand that there's an enforcement cost, and, and, and I understand that there's supply issues and implications uh, and long lines, uh, but my, my general preference is to give enough flexibility overall with the, with the overall, uh, 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 you know, have, some, have some discretion on, as to whether, you know, touchless versus um, self dispense or somebody having you know dispensing to every guest or the questions etc but but to me it, in, when it comes to the screening that is the most uh, critical time uh, the, uh, rather okay. the point of entry okay uh, so, after which there's a lot less concern I, I guess i would be interested in those early lessons learned from other jurisdictions because i worry that if this creates a backup at the door um, that's a that's a, a risk too. Having people backed up close together, waiting to get in because the process of entering is onerous. So I just I would want to see what others are doing with regard to requiring or encouraging, and um, again, being cognizant of the fact that we don't want people waiting um, to enter because that's that's a risk right there, right? So I would just want to know what others are doing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I am too. I, I, you know, I've seen, I've, I've waited in line to get to the grocery store, you know, six years hard, <laughs> and that's, and that's just fine. I imagine, you know, that could be the case here too. Um, I, I am interested in, in, in that. I just think that um, there will be, um, there could be procedures, for example, and I understand the question, the notion about asking, pushing notifications and questions to, to databases. But we could easily, they could easily implement uh, uh, handout flyers, let's say, with check off three or four questions, yes or no, um, and collect them at a, at a time that, uh, you know, prior to entry, uh, that forces uh, the waiting patron to, to answer, you know, um, you know, a set of questions. I don't think you necessarily want more touch points, though, because then you're creating another doc. I mean, yeah. I know. You go to a lot of stores now, coupons, everything else are digital because they don't want things like paper flying around as another touch point for transfer. So yeah. um, while my gut would say it'd be great to require it, I'm, I'm not, I can't say definitively now, I'd be curious to know what, if anything, the governor's going to say because knowing that not everyone can get touchless, the risk of backup and not really wanting to generate something else for a touch point, um, I, I don't know what I would do on that. So yeah, maybe Bruce I, and Burke. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner Stevens. Yeah, I, I would just, um, you know, some of the material I've read. I can't recall how other states have dealt with this. Um, spent some time reading Pennsylvania's protocols, but um, you know, I'd be interested in, like Commissioner Cameron, seeing the best practices. But I'm just thinking of the places that we all walk into now, whether it's your local target or your local post office, everything is available to you as soon as you walk in the door, but obviously the post office isn't requiring me to hand sanitize before I approach, uh, you know, approach a patron window 
taking into consideration all the other cleaning and um, and, and hygiene uh, mm -hmm. strategies that they're undertaking. Hi, I see, a, 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 is there anyone, I wanna to turn to Loretta because she may have some insights on what's happening across the country, but from our licensees, is there any practice that, given that you have opened uh, properties now, that you would like to remark on this particular requirement and may help us move along? Jackie, yeah, any? Um, sure. Uh, you know, we've obviously opened in uh, Macau and in Las Vegas, and uh, we provide these items. So we provide the hand sanitizer, we provide masks. We have not in those jurisdictions required people, uh, sorry, Macau is required to wear a mask, but in Las Vegas, it's not a requirement uh, to wear a mask. What about the hand sanitizer? We're stuck uh, on hand know, sanitizer. We, we, uh, in terms of, you know, my concern is this. Um, we don't want to turn into one of those people at the mall who runs around forcing people to, you know, spray perfume on them. And so, you know, our preference would Big be to deal of the day. I see. Uh, is there a caller who's trying to chime in? Okay, I guess not. Yes, um, is there a caller that wants to chime in? No, because I'm getting, you're not muted. So every time there's a noise, you pop up as maybe wanting to speak. That person right there. Okay, you don't want to speak. Okay. 7758. Yeah, 7758, your last four digits. If you mute, that would be helpful because I'm wondering if you want to speak. So if you mute your phone, that would be really helpful because noises come up. Um, all right, Loretta, if you could help, you, you presented these as options. Obviously, number three is the most restrictive. Did you glean from your research that there's an industry standard of practice? Uh, that was pulled from one of the jurisdictions uh, as uh, on their list, similar to the list that you're reviewing now, but not ultimately, I, I believe it was not ultimately voted to by the board. So in uh, other words, it's to provide, make those available. Um, and, and so folks like myself, if I want to clean my hands, because I can't remember where I've been, I can go in, but I'm not required. And then the third one would be required, but otherwise the, the proposal of, by the jurisdiction of, that you took it from, they ended up not ultimately uh, voting. <sighs> Is that right? That's my recollection, uh, Kathy. I would, um, to be absolutely certain, I wanna go back and just review because things are changing, you know, places are opening on a daily basis. So I, it looks like Burke may have an update. Uh, yeah, and, and just so you know, we could do this. We could yield on this one and say, should the governor's office require it to be a must because of the public health issue, we'll adopt it. Um, and right now, just make you know, the provision of it is what I'm hearing might be the right standard. But I want to go to Burke, and then I'll go to Jackie. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a group of our staff uh, researching weekly the changes that are going on, not only in the country, but all over the world. We can uh, put an emphasis on looking at the entranceways. We are hearing that casinos that are open up, California, Connecticut, that the lines are quite uh, quite a challenge. So getting everybody free, uh, free uh, flowing rather freely into the casino is a, a point of concern. 12 o'clock midnight on a Saturday is gonna be more of a challenge than 12 noon on a Tuesday, of course. But um, we can look at uh, the hand sanitizers and different things like that for um, this report. Okay, and, and just to go to back to Jackie. Did you want to comment? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, if I could, I just wanted to add that, you know, in reviewing the state's guidance, the governor's guidance on lodgings, restaurants, retail, and hair salons, the requirements for washing hands and hand sanitizer tends to apply to the employee, but not the guest. Right. So just for a exactly. point of reference. Exactly. Um, so could we, um, I, I heard Enrique's uh, very legitimate concern about that. Well, that seems to be where you would wanna be at your, your best, but can we have say that we've reached a consensus that at the very least we adopt the, um, with respect to provision of hand sanitizers that it doesn't need to be touch, touchless and available and otherwise, um, 
that it's not required as set forth in C. Encourage. Encourage. Uh, I like encourage. Amike? Madam Chair, yeah, my, my point about the screen the, the screening was not limited to the hand sanitizer, it was was about like, you know, it's at the time of screening that I think right. is the most so, uh, so what I would like to do in order to keep this conversation moving is that if we stick to sort of the provisions, because honestly, we actually have to produce these particular guidelines. And so with respect to, I think what you're saying, the other ones, that's a little bit later in this block and we'll get to them. Um, if we collapse them, they, there are so many nuanced conversations. I think it will be difficult. That's why I think Loretta did a great job separating them and, and the whole team. So, because obviously even hand sanitizers presented quite a challenge. Does that make sense? So, okay, great. Um, okay, I'm just getting some guidance on the logistic matter. I'll, I'll try that, Cheryl, thank you. Um, I did it, great tip, thank <laughs> you so much. Um, <laughs> Eileen. Um, so are we good with the least? And then when we get something that really it's too interconnected, we can't separate it out, then let's just say we've got to deal with more. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with encourage. Okay, good. Everybody thumbs up, the five of us? Excellent, yeah. okay, good. Alrighty, um, now moving on to um, the very first bullet perhaps in, in line uh, in group C. Um, might inform the issues around what happens when students really are getting big um, before we get to masks. Provide separate points of entry and exit to avoid two-way flow of guest traffic. Is it fair to say that our licensees are trying to develop plans that can accommodate that as it relates to their particular facilities? In just speaking for Uncle, obviously, for the high traffic areas, we are going to have a uh, create a point of entry and exit. Uh, obviously, people coming out of the elevators, uh, that's, a, that's a little bit different situation, but for the main entrance and exits, yes. For, uh, for Blaine Ridge, uh, we're doing the same thing. We'll have a separate uh, entrance and then two exits that they can use, but they will not cross paths. Thanks, Lance. Again, uh, yeah, for MGM, we'll be using our layout, we would use the same area, but we'd separate the flow of enter and exit, um, but it's one main area. Loretta, do you want to help um, with this part of the conversation in terms of what you're thinking on the entrance? Yeah. Right, so the, uh, the bullet point did, uh, was contemplating those uh, main entrance areas into uh, the casino floor, understanding as uh, Jackie uh, mentioned that there are points of entry, uh, you know, from uh, hotel and so forth that would be more challenging uh, to separate. Uh, so more it was contemplating the, the main uh, areas of, of entry, um, and it's my understanding from some conversations both today and uh, previously with the licensees that they do have plans uh, to have uh, separate the two-way traffic at their significant points of entry and exit. So can we address that third uh, block, the first bullet and the third block in kind of a way that that makes sense for all three licensees that we're encouraging that. I, I want to hear from my fellow commissioners. This I, is I, I, I definitely would want something like that. It seems you go to the grocery store, et cetera, they've been, that's a pretty big part of people being able to stay six feet away and keeping the flow going in a controlled manner. Um, if there are particular challenges, obviously uh, the licensees in IB can have further detailed conversations about that, but I would want that to be part of this. Commissioner Cameron, do you have uh, thoughts on in including in Group C, the Group C bullet uh, as a requirement? Yeah, I think that's fine. In fact, they all explained to us how they're working on that now. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's all the, it's in the yeah. details, right? 
um, no. how you get people to move them. But yes, I think that's important to. So it is important. Do. We're not okay. And Commissioner Zuniga Stebbins, are you in agreement? And then we'll you get. Know, to on, on, on this one, I, perhaps ironically, I'm less less of a concern. I think there's, uh, you know, if, if people are passing each other, um, you know, the, the risk is very small in my view. Although I, I understand the congregation is a concern once once there's you know a cluster of people. So whatever whatever they do, because it makes you know sense for them to manage potential crowds, that, that that's fine by me. So then maybe this is a good place to then go to the next set of bullets about at points of entry signage and greeters are either encouraged or mandated. If I'm reading this correctly, I know I'm reading it quite quickly, to wear masks. Um, right, so the differences there, uh, Madam Chair, are the, in Group A, so uh, encouraging guests to wear masks except while eating or drinking. Mm -hmm. the category B is providing guests with masks if they need them, requiring them to wear them except while drinking. No food would be allowed in the gaming area. And then the third get category is, again, uh, providing guests with masks if needed, requiring them to wear them at all times, no food or drink allowed in the gaming area. And for all of these, uh, there are some exceptions, exemptions, some individuals are exempt from masks, uh, wearing masks, and of course those would be adopted uh, um, as having come from the CDC and, and the governor as well, those exemptions. Right now, if you walk into a restaurant, you're expected to have a mask on, and the only time that there's an exception would be when you're sitting down to eat, is that correct? Under the governor's restaurant rules? Jackie's sitting on, that's my understanding. Okay, so let's talk about entryway. They come, we've got them in some kind of proper entry and exit flow. Do we expect them to come and stand in line while they're waiting in line to get in? Let's hope that would be a great thing if there's a line, as long as it's a good line, would they be required to wear their masks? I believe right now under state law, they would have to. I don't know that it's a law, but but it's I mean, a, it's, state, it's an executive state, order. The under state order. I should have. I should know better. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right now, you know, I think we can address it in our own, you know, in case that's lifted. Do we expect if it were lifted, would we want them? It's hard to imagine if they left it, you know, but. Right now, at this very moment, would you expect to see everyone in masks? Yes, I would. Yeah, okay. uh, I think this one may be one where we don't have to have a firm answer today because we expect further guidance. Okay. Yeah, to me, the, the, the difference, and I agree with, uh, with Gail, the difference is, you know, whether we, um, required not to have drink or food. I, I, I have a technical question on that. Is there much, besides the food trucks that I know um, are in the Encore's um, floor, um, is there any food, a lot of food that, that, uh, that usually makes it to the, to the floor? Okay, so we'll move, we're got, we've shifted from on entry and it's fair, food and drink is going to, to um, introduce new challenges. Right now, I'm hearing Gail say, you know what, let's not even address masks until we get further guidance. But Enrique's near question is, when does food get introduced? When do drinks get introduced? So maybe we could hear from licensees how that's working. Where are folks eating? Where are food, uh, folks drinking? That would then, we could give that guidance to the state and local public health um, uh, Commission so that they or departments so that they could help us determine what the risks are. Well, my my my, my concern is that of course it, it's related to the wearing of the mask. Uh, you know, you could you could require to wear mask, but there's food and drink. They have to take it off. But can uh, the licensees could say what the expectations are in terms of delivering food, Jackie, and drinks? 
Sure, and I have a uh, Brian Gilbrands is on the call too, so he may want yes, to. Yes, I saw that. Brian was Sorry. in. Sorry, um, yes. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, we would propose to continue serving food within the food truck area. It's it's a designated space on the floor. People would not be able to go off the floor in that food truck area. Um, would be treated the same way under the guidance that pertains to other restaurants. Restaurants. With the six feet of table separation. And you can remove your face covering once you're seated at your table. Brian? We, if I may, in addition to that, we also have a partner. We have Dunkin' Donuts off the backside of the casino. Uh, we would want to allow them in their designated seating area, just like we have with the food trucks, to allow them to consume food and beverage just while they're seated in those locations. Can I just ask a point of clarification? Are those those are deemed restaurants for under the advisory board. The, the Duncan is, but the, um, the, the food truck space is just kind of an odd space. <laughs> so but because we sectioned it, you're going to treat it like a restaurant, okay? Mm -hmm. Correct. It okay. does have proper seating. So if we put aside those types of entities, will there be food and drink actually consumed on the gaming floor away from chairs and tables? Is that your point, Enrique? Yeah, well, drink clearly is as a matter of the, the, the business, uh, you know, but well, uh, my well, question we was- don't, We haven't necessarily for, said that no, yet. That's, that's, a, that's an no, open no. question. That may be an open question, but um, my, my question was for food. Um, so if we could address food and we might as well address drinks too, thanks. So I think the food, that would be the only places where we'd say food is, um, the food is permitted within the designated areas. Okay, uh, Lance, good morning. Good morning, uh, similar to, uh, to Jackie and Brian, we would propose to reopen the food court. We've got three outlets there. You've got Duncan, Smash Burger, and then the pizza establishment. Um, we will be, or we would propose removing tables within that food court, and that would be the only designated uh, eating area. And you'd operate in accordance with the restaurant uh, that guidelines? Is, that is okay. correct, yep. And Seth? Similar, similar to Penn, we would have our South End Food Market as the designated um, eating area. And that would be the, the sole um, and, area for food consumption. So right now, now no grab and goes where they could eat along the way. I'm seeing well, that. Fun, okay. Fundamentally, those are at least the South End Market. It's a, it's a food court style. It is grab and go by nature. It's not table service, um, but the we propose that the eating area would be um, during this period in the in the south end market with the segregated seating. In a normal course, they can basically eat it anywhere. But that's right. Okay, thank you. Now drinks. Yes. What? What's, how are you treating drinks? Because uh, you know, Commissioner Zuniga brings up a a good point. If I'll, I'm happy to jump in. Um, sure, sir. We we do propose drink service. Um, it's as Commissioner Zuniga mentioned. It's a it's a key part of the gaming experience. Um, cocktail um, service on the floor, um, and it, it's really um, critical to the business. Um, that's where this really the challenge comes with the encouraged versus required, um, because uh, we see an enforcement challenge where. If you see someone not wearing a mask, you approach them, they say, well, I'm just sipping my drink, I'm, I'll put it back on in a minute. And you have all these negative and challenging interactions with patrons, if there's a really strict requirement versus um, highly encouraged, it, it'll be hard, very hard to police. Um, uh, and if, if drink service is permitted, which we believe it should be, um, because that'll always be the excuse, um, which is, well, I need to remove it to drink. Um, so we do, but we do think it's critical um, to be able to allow. Well, Jackie, how is Macau handling drinking with mask mandatory? Brian, do you know how they, they're handling that? Um, it's same in Vegas. The, the mask is allowed to be brought down when they consume uh, the beverage. And I would say it's the same as the state right now with uh, restaurants. You have to have a mask when you go in. 
when you're sitting down at a, at a restaurant table or a gaming table or a slot machine, you can lower your mask, take a drink, and then put it back up. I would see this similar to a restaurant. It's sitting in location, not walking around, lower, drink, put it back up. Just a suggestion. Yeah, I think it gets more complicated on the floor with that though. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, and I, I think that's a reasonable thing to, um, you know, to try to implement um, what Brian describes. I, um, you know, I, I do get the, uh, the challenge in the enforcement that Seth makes, and that's part of my point towards, you know, maybe at the front end of, you know, the screening is where we can be, you know, um, a little bit on the strict side uh, knowing that we've we've at least minimized uh, some risk of, of of people making it through with with obvious signs of you know te high temperature or or, or or what have you. Can can I ha ask uh, Commissioner O'Brien to elaborate? You're imagining it was a little bit of a difference than what um, uh, Brian indicated that it would be when they're seated playing or at the table, but when they're walking right. around. Well, because I think the exception when you're talking about a restaurant setting, you've got six feet mandatory between it. You've got only your parties in that space. You're sitting for a finite period of time, eating, putting the mask on and leaving. You could be sitting at a gaming table or a slot machine for far longer than a meal would take. The walking that's going to go by you, the service that would go by you, um, who may be near you on the machine or the gaming table is a lot more diverse than simply sitting with your party at a table. And so I'm not so sure I would agree with, well, I totally understand, Brian, where you're coming from in terms of execution, where the mask is mandatory, but we're allowing the drinks on the floor. I'm just not so sure in this opening phase, I'm comfortable with that. Because I don't necessarily think that the restaurant seating with your party is equivalent to you know, eating or drinking something. Obviously eating doesn't sound like anyone's gonna do. Drinking on the floor. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, Madam yes. Chair. I, I would expect you're going to have more interactions between people required to wear a mask and not, re, you know, not choosing to wear a mask than you would have over just situations involving reminding somebody that after they've been drinking to pull their mask back up. I, 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 I think if there's a requirement, everybody's going to wear them. That will maybe limit the number of those interactions that Seth referred to, as opposed to choosing to wear a mask or not choosing to wear a mask, I think is going to create potentially even more of those interactions that might get a little confrontation. Commissioner Cameron? Oh, Commissioner, did well, you want I, I thought we just um, had a consensus on encouraging, not requiring. Did, did that, that not, just not occur? Not for me, no. Correct? No. No. So we, okay. So we're not I, there yet. I think there was a, a we, we, we didn't even we didn't we even left that time. We didn't really get there this because we were at all. Uh, but, I think what I heard from you, Commissioner uh, Cameron, was with respect to entry. You think maybe we put masks to you know the public health because it it's fluid right now. It's they're required. Um, I think it's an important discussion to bifurcate that from the very unique circumstances of casino industry. That's why having a discussion around drinks and food is informative to the public and to the public health folks because they may not really have even visited a casino. But we have established today it's an important part of the business model. Folks are given drinks sometimes while they are playing. That's not an unusual practice. They don't even have to pay for them. They may sit for as long as they want at the slot machine and they will maybe have a constant drink in front of them. Is that fair? So that means, as Brian said, they would keep it up, but when they took their sip, they would take it down and theoretically put their, their mask up. It's not a far to imagine that the mask would stay down predominantly a good amount of time because the drinking component is a big part of the business model. And I want to just go back to the point Dale raised. You know, we might be getting guidance from the governor's 
team That's that it. it's required or not required. I, I, I was trying to make the point of you, you alleviate, you know, the question kind of just the question of the opportunities for these confrontations, which you know, I think Seth pointed out, you know, may not want to tie up the team's time with going over and talking to one patron and another patron by alleviating that by saying the mask is required. You're sitting, you pull it down, you take a drink, you pull it back up. I, I understand that as a process, and I certainly understand it's part of the, you know, the, the drink at a gaming table as part of the casino experience. But um, I didn't mean to suggest that I'm, I'm jumping right over to the mandating the mask requirement. Um, I just think it's something for us to consider. And again, but, not to mention the governor's edict might have something you know that will make our conversations but, kind of weird on this issue. To be clear, though, Brian started the comparable of the restaurants. And so when you're sitting and you're eating and drinking at a restaurant, you are allowed to keep your mask down. When you, if I'm, if you'll allow me, Brian, I think you're extending this an analogy to if you're sitting having your uh, drinks while you're playing at the slots machine, whether it's one drink or two drinks for the evening, you could take your mask down. But I believe in the restaurant scenario, you don't even have to put the rest of the mask on while you're eating or dining. But you're, you're saying that the scenario in the Cal is they keep their mask on and theoretically they put it back up in between sips. Um, that would be hard to enforce, but it's while they're sitting. The same would apply while they're at a table game. And then I think the next scenario is, can they have a drink in their hand and walk around, maybe to Commissioner O'Brien's point, or are they only allowed to have a drink while they're sitting to you know, liken it to the restaurant experience? Well, I, I, I don't know if that was a question for Brian, but I, I, I imagine these scenarios are become increasingly difficult to enforce. Um, I just, if I could just hear um, what's happening uh, in the in the other openings, that would be really helpful to know. Okay, they're served, mask on and off. That I kind of understand. What's happening once you're up and around? You don't have food in your hands. I understand that. Can you have a drink in your hand? Yeah, you, you can in Las Vegas right now. It's not required. It's recommended or encouraged. So there is no real comparison there. Okay. Um, I would assume to uh, Commissioner O'Brien's comment that people would walk around, um, but we would also have our staff and security staff to remind people to keep their mask up. Uh, it's going to happen. People are going to lower their mask to take a drink. Absolutely, you're, you're correct. And then we would uh, absolutely ask them to put it back up. And what about Macau? And if I can jump in on Macau, not that I'm an expert on Macau, but I have had some uh, conversations about this issue in Macau. It's my understanding that culturally, the uh, service uh, of alcohol is different in Macau than it is here. You know, it's kind of uh, consistent with the gaming experience here, but not consistent with the gaming experience in Macau. I do believe that um, drinking tea is uh, common there, and so I'm not sure how that's playing out. But my what, what's been communicated to me is alcohol is not generally part of the experience there. So Seth's comment about it being a critical component of the model here doesn't transfer over to Macau. I think Brian is it's really less of an issue. It's, it's Brian, more. It's, yeah, it's more. Well, well they drink tea. So with the, with the tea, it's the same thing. Masks are required in Macau and they take it down to the tea. And they put it back on. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, if, if, I don't know if Eileen, you're making this point, but um, I think um, prohibiting drinking from, um, from the floor out of the concern that people might not do what, uh, what, what might be, uh, you know, encouraged. Um, is, is begs the question as to kind of like what what for then if there's not going to be drinking at the uh, at the casino. Well, I'm trying to remember. Did Rhode Island say they were going to open without any food or drink service on the floor initially, just in the opening days to get everything worked out before they then moved on to this question? Or 
as everyone. I don't make right right I, um, I, I didn't concentrate on that piece. I don't, so I didn't, it didn't jump out at me. Does somebody remember? I don't think I've seen any, any, yeah. and I try to read, read them all. Um, yeah. I don't think I have seen any yet that has uh, required openings without beverage, so, you know, certainly without food. Uh, in the gaming is, uh, area, but I, agree, I, ha but I, I don't think I've seen without beverage. I agree with Gail. I haven't, but you could always miss something. Does anybody know of that being a requirement? Okay. So I think there have been some limitations on the self-serve beverage, but that's right. not for I wake that. service. Not on that, exactly. So, um, Loretta and, G and Karen, if we could have some guidance here. In terms of um, a consensus with respect to masks, I think I think we all first give the nod that we will absolutely be listening for the guidance from the um, state and local public health departments. There, because we understand they're the ones with the expertise. It's important for them to recognize how casinos operate. We're different than a shopping mall. Uh, because we don't just pass, you know, patrons don't just pass through. They're actually encouraged to linger. But as Brian pointed out, Brian uh, Goldbrunt of, of um, Encore Boston Harbor pointed out, while seated, that the patrons begin to look like a patron at a restaurant. But at a certain point in time, our patrons will stand up, and it's my understanding that the expectation of licensees would be that they would be able to travel with a drink in hand. Do we, um, would we, would it be fair to say we don't have a consensus as to whether we would require masks, or do we have a, maybe I should break it down this way. I guess my point on that right now is if you're inside, you're supposed to have masks on. I mean, that is the standard as of today. So absolutely, if the governor comes out and phase three is relaxing rules, but so far it would seem uh, that's a pretty key component. There's an article about the hairstylists in Missouri not, you know, apparently conveying anything. Um, and one of the things they pointed on is they were, you know, diligent about mask wearing. So I would just point that out that as of today, we don't have the authority to say anything less than that. Very helpful. Very helpful. So could we start with presuming that mask wearing is going to be required as it is today, are we looking for additional guidance around the public health risks with respect to lowering and raising? Or do we, are, do we have a consensus that we would allow lowering and raising for seated patrons at the gaming tables or slot machines as well as standing? So maybe I break it down. Are we all in agreement that we could make the presumption of required masks right now as of well, today? Well, I just think it really does um, depend on what the, the, the phase three guidance is going to be. Exactly. I just. So we will yield to that um, now in terms of, and we'll figure out a way to craft that. Do we have a cons how many would say that they're comfortable with what Brian introduced of sitting? In, um, and if we don't want to do a hand vote, if we just want to say we don't have a consensus, that's okay. Sitting at a table and lowering it, meaning you don't want to judge that because of the public health risk. Um, if you're really comfortable, raise your hand with the idea of you know lowering and, and raising. Okay. Anybody yep. else? Yeah, Bruce. Yes. Um, I think if Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, I I am as well because if we're allowing um, if we're allowing beverages, um, then certainly. You Commissioner Cameron, you just froze beverages. for a second, so could you repeat? Statement? Oh, no, I'm saying if we're allowing beverages, you need a method to consume that beverage. So I'm. I'm in agreement that the lowering and, and raising is, is appropriate. While seated at either the gaming table or at the chair, on yes. uh, the hot chair. Yes. Commissioner O'Brien, your position, if you want to say. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely there yet. Um, 
I am particularly concerned about the walking around with the drink um, because they've, they've moved, you know, bars into phase four now. I don't know the rationale for that. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd, I'd want to know a little bit more, if anything is going to come out of the governor's office guidance on that. I, I don't, the moving the bars to a different phase and then somehow, you know, overlaying it into the scenario, it would almost seem like the casinos would get an exemption on that behavior, which given the size and the flow may be appropriate but I'm not comfortable saying that right now. And right now the bars are not going to be open, correct, licensees? The bars themselves, yeah, the inside bars the bars. Okay, so in terms of the seating, of the, as Brian laid out, seating of slots, we're more comfortable on that. Would it be fair to say we, are, are, we can't come to a consensus today on walking around with drinks? Nast. Or I, 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 well, I think I think the you know trying to police who who left the table with what amount of drink and whether they're just going to another table or another slot machine becomes very unwieldy. Um, and I under, I understand the concern about you know somebody who lowers their mask and now starts to walk around. Um, but but I, but I think you know we need to be uh, you know to allow some flexibility as to you know they they communicate there's um, there's only so much that we can enforce when the public you know is the one actually doing you know the behavior commissioner stebbins you want to weigh in sorry about that um you know i'm 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 comfortable with allowing you know you know to the point of um, enforcing an individual walking across the floor who might have a drink as they move as commissioner zuniga just pointed out um, might be a little unwieldy i i think it's a little bit too early to to get my hands around that okay commissioner cameron Do you yeah again uh, no i i again i point to um, not making a firm decision here and awaiting. We have a little bit of time to await further guidance. I think we've highlighted the, the challenge of this decision making and I think that we can say um, we park this one and get more, got away from more guidance from the public health departments, particularly with respect to the unique uh, situation that we have. Ours are shut down, but we have people who can travel in hand with drinks in our in the normal course of our business, you don't have it in a shopping mall. You know, there you, you know theaters now have it, um, but theaters are right now not um, in phase three. So there's a little bit of a of a challenge. And am I right to say that we we wait for more guidance from on the public health? If we don't get it, that's okay too. We'll have to come back and make our decision. Correct. Right. So, Kathy, just for my note taking for the for the document, what I hear folks saying is generally, uh, right now, the understanding is that masks would be required because that seems to comport with the governor's guidance, uh, but that we're sort of uh, taking a we'll take a look at what the governor may say about eating and uh, eating and drinking and removing the mask, whether it has to be mandated at all times or there's exceptions for consuming a beverage. Is that what I'm hearing? I'm also just curious, uh, and they may not give us this, but the rationale for why they took bars out of three and put them into four, is, mm -hmm. it, you know, is the behaviors that cause them to do that in any way relevant to this discussion, or is it completely a different topic that doesn't bear on any risk associated with people walking around? I still feel like walking around and dropping your mask, restaurants aren't even doing that. I mean, you would be expected to put it on if you walk okay. over to the area. Yeah. And of course, we haven't even mentioned social distancing, but unlike a bar where the congregation of people probably present a risk of violating that social distancing rules, in this case, we're presuming if they're walking around with a drink, the licensees are keeping crowd control uh, to the proper number. And I know you're going to get into that, Loretta, um, more and more. But I think with respect to food and beverage, we've, you know, we've revealed it's a challenge. 
and we'll wait, we'll wait for more information on that. But I think you've outlined it right, Karen. Okay. All right, is everybody fine with that? So licensees, thank you for your patience. This is uh, the job of, of regulating a, a complex matter, so thank you. Okay, moving on to... Um, um, I think the next bullet point hopefully will be uh, a little bit uh, more straightforward. It appears consistently on the document across all three of the groups, and it has to do with the instances where identity checks are required. So there's a discouragement from to discourage guests from wearing hats and to provide uh, for those instances where the identity check is required, you know, payout, that sort of thing, that a safe place be allowed for briefly removing the hat, briefly removing the mask to allow the ID to occur. And I don't know if the licensees have any um, comments on um, uh, on actually implementing that. Sure. Um, you know, we've had uh, numerous conversations with Bruce, his team, uh, and our surveillance to make sure that we can facilitate that. You need to do that for, for first to make sure the person's of age to get into the casino. But if in case you need to identify them at a later date, your surveillance will actually have a photo uh, of the individual that you'll be able to identify the individual at a later date. And just for the commission, we were already doing this right before we closed. Uh, there were some patrons that were on wearing masks or allowing them to, and we were asking them to remove their masks every time we ID them. So it is something we've already done. Commissioner Cameron, you were going to lean in, I thought. Yeah, I just was, um, I, I wanted clarification on a safe place. Does that just mean six feet away from another patron? Is that what we're talking about there? I think from our perspective, as the security line moves, we keep people uh, socially distanced at the six feet. So when we say safe place, it would be you're moving it not within six feet of um, other people on the line. Okay. That's, that's what I thought was the case, but I just wanted that clarification. Thank you. Commissioner Sinica? Yeah, that's, that's, that's I'm, I'm good with that. Good. All right, then we'll move on to, if I don't see any objection to that one because it sounds as though the licensees are it's part of their plan. We'll move on. Should we move on to uh, temperature taking? Do we need to address that, Loretta? Sure. So column A does not address temperature taking. Uh, group B uh, does at, uh, ask the uh, licensees to consider Forming the non-touch temperature checks and prohibiting entry if they do implement them to anybody over 100.4 degrees. Uh, and uh, Group C uh, requires that as part of the screening process uh, to perform the temperature checks on all entering guests and anybody who reaches 100.4 on two consecutive tests uh, to be prohibited from entering. And both of those are envisioned as part, potentially part of a screening process that would include in column B, uh, the posting of the uh, symptoms uh, and uh, posting of uh, a caution if anybody's come into contact with a COVID positive person in 14 days or traveled to and would list the countries. Uh, that are on the CDC list, uh, you know, having that posted uh, and asking em employees to sort of self-identify uh, in column three uh, as part of the screening, which would include the temperature check, would be the uh, actual administering of the verbal or uh, some kind of written questionnaire to the same effect. Yeah, I, I, I am in favor of requiring this. Uh, again, it's the theme that I've been sort of making now a couple of times. Um, any, any one person who we might prevent from entering the casino who has a temperature, um, then in my view mitigates 
uh, a lot of the other um, procedures that we effectively are gonna are considering. Uh, mm -hmm. Removing your mask to take a drink or not. Uh, so I I am on the on the strict side of these one. Loretta, did you find any other any examples of other jurisdictions that are using this? I I know that um, most are doing mandated temperature checks on employees. Uh, I think in uh, Nevada uh, <laughs> they are required or that they, in practice, they do maintain temperature checking for individuals who've been identified as symptomatic or who present to staff as saying they're not feeling well, but I don't believe that it's uh, mandated uh, now. Uh, I, Bruce and Burke, I, are you- I believe, I believe several are using it through the uh, camera system to take temperatures. Is that correct, Jackie? Or are you using that at WIN? Uh, it's separate. It's a separate system. It's the thermal cam thermal cameras that are doing right. it. Yeah. And so, and so, and and you are conducting that now, um, uh, Seth and Lance. Are you at any of your properties required to take temperatures? Uh, we are not. I think to Bruce's point, um, some companies are doing it. Um, I'm not familiar with a jurisdiction that's requiring it of guests and uh, MGM resorts under our current safety plan does not, uh, is not planning on doing mandatory guest uh, temperature screening at, at any properties. Um, and, um, and I don't believe we're required to. Lance? Yeah, I think I have the same answer as, uh, as Seth. I think our practice around the country has been to, uh, we are not required. However, we are administering it for our employees. So, so no on, uh, on customers, yes on employees. Do you do any kind of, of in, uh, the the early questions that are presented in the third column? Uh, you know, Bruce Fisher uh, Stebbins quite properly said, you know, that a lot has to do with the communications plan and what you get out to the patron. You know, for instance, I'm going to get my hair uh, colored uh, uh, soon, and so I'm getting a communications plan from the salon that will tell me what they expect of me. Will you be, could you, and maybe you already are, saying, yes, if you have a, temp, a, a, a high temperature or if you have a temperature, please don't come. If you have the symptoms, are you doing that affirmatively now, uh, not just with respect to being symptom free, do, are you actually addressing temperature? Yes, okay. we will. Lance, same. same, same. I think uh, as a practical matter, we are probably awaiting a few more details of what the guidelines and requirements are, so that we can provide a more comprehensive list. Oh, at, at various jurisdictions, I understand, and also your own public health people, correct? Correct. correct. Okay. What is on your expert suggesting on that? Obviously, you've done the thermal. If you didn't have the thermal, um, do you do you also ask them to about their their in in Nevada? That's mandated for employees. Uh, I don't I don't know offhand if it's mandated for guests. But our employees essentially log into their uh, into our internal system every day and are required to answer the uh, questions. Affirmatively, they are required affirmatively to answer. Um, Guests are not going to affirmatively be required to answer, but I just am wondering, are they informed that temperature matters? As, well, from our perspective, you know, that's, we are, we're telling them that your temperature is going to be taken. Be taken, so, right. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner O'Brien, what are you thinking? Um, so this is one where I, I maybe diverge from my week. I feel like we're coming down on opposite sides all day. Okay. Um, because they have these pre pulse symptomatic asymptomatic transmissions where the people never pop a temperature, um, I'm not as um, firm on requiring it. I think it's a great idea if it's doable. Um, I think the thermal cameras that Encore has will probably you know, serve well in this regard. Um, and I think the, the ability to test somebody if there's some suspicion in terms of why maybe they, they're presenting a certain way or they feel they may, 
Um, I'm just not 100% sure that it's not a panacea because people are going to come in and be symptomatic. And my fear is, do you come through at that point and feel like maybe I can take my mask down more or not sanitize as much because I just got cleared. So I'm on the fence on whether this is really, um, not for the employees, it's a lot easier to administer, people are doing it, et cetera, but in terms of the guests coming in and out. Do we like the idea of consider? You yeah, know? I like that language, I do. I'm just not at mandate. What do you think? Uh, uh, just as a point of uh, science, there is some value of, of related to a mm -hmm. higher temperature. Right. I think it's, I heard maybe 50% could run, um, I, I don't know if you've heard the same thing, if you do have a higher temperature, there's a 50% chance that you are infected. It's, and that's what justifies the, the, the uh, thermal cameras that Wynn has instituted. Is that correct, Jackie, something like 50%, you know? I, I don't know that statistic. I just, I think, you know, we were, this is just another layer, obviously, that we can, uh, that we can implement. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I, well, I think the fact that people are asymptomatic and can still be transmitting it does not negate the higher likelihood of being infected with if you have higher temperature. Um, so it's, 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 you know, I, I think I, I understand there's logistical challenges and nothing is absolute um, in, in this matter. A lot of it is, is somewhat unknown, but um, if, if the person presents uh, a fever, um, given everything going on, uh, I think it's safe to say that it could be related. However, whether it's 50 or less or more, and that's, that's, that's the instance to, in my view, uh, mitigate. I know it's not gonna be the only thing, um, and I know it's not this positive. Maybe the person is having the flu, which is also gonna be, challenging for any other, for, for all, uh, uh, you know, uh, healthcare professionals, but. Can I take a sort of a straw vote on this one? If uh, the language in, in column two, if we used consider performing non-touch temperature checks and prohibiting entry versus um, the, the, it could just be required than that very short bullet and, uh, or it could be, of course, even more as set forth in column C. Now, uh, Enrique, the consider doesn't give you the level of, of confidence that you would want. You would want it to be perform non-test yes. at the very least, okay? Yes, I would. I liken it to um, what I believe the airlines are doing um, because there's, they anticipate that there's gonna be, you know, uh, a, a trip, uh, some period of time where people are going to be, you know, close to each other, uh, um, you know, wearing masks or not to take a drink. Um, I, I'm, I'm on the um, um, on the side of trying to execute as much as we can. At the and end, I, by the way, let me let me mention this that uh, that I think is a good distinction that I haven't spoken to. Um, I think it's great to, to, to do that of employees because of course they're the common denominator uh, on a lot of people coming in and out. So um, um, that's, that's great. Uh, perhaps now we're just, um, you know, fudging a little bit around with, with, with the next step. And, and, and that's what I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting, you know, we could go the extra, the extra step. Commissioner Stebbins, Commissioner. Uh, and then I'll go to Cam Commissioner Cameron afterwards. Commissioner Stebbins. Yeah, at this point, I'm I'm, I'm safe to say um, that we keep keep this to a consideration at this point. Okay, Commissioner Cameron, I, I see. I, you. I I agree with that. Okay, I mean, so just, we have. I fluid. think I would say that we have a consensus and consideration. I think it's fair, Karen, to note that. Um, uh, Commissioner Zuniga has made a really valid point here. He's, if, and I can speak, if I can speak for you briefly, Commissioner Zuniga, you know, really marking the point of entry as being, take the conservative approach there, as conservative as you can, to, um, to protect uh, patrons once they're in. So if that's not lost on me. I think there should be a consensus around consideration with a slant toward you know, if the science proves that this is really a 
an, an important indicator. And if I hear that it's a 50% indicator, I'd like to confirm that. I might be you know, more persuaded that the, the, taking the temperature is a, a critical point. With one caveat, I wanna know how we na na navigate the crowd issue still. And I'm sure that uh, Bruce and Bert, you probably are thinking the same thing. Every, everything that we do at the beginning helps protect on the public health as I'm um, pointed out, but it also creates some queuing issues and points of contact issues that I think are solvable, um, but we would want to address that. So and that gets, of course, to the very first point on column C. So I would just put an asterisk. I would just like to learn a little bit more about the science of, 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 of OK. Yeah, and then, you know, it's at least possible as well that uh, if, if people know that uh, you will be taking your temperature before you, you're allowed into the casino, they themselves might then, you know, think a little bit more critically about their own symptoms, their temperature before they leave the house. Um, that could also act as, you know, um, it doesn't necessarily mean, in, in, in my point, in my view, that there will be uh, unacceptable long lines. <laughs> no, but knowing that you may be subjected to a temperature check may have some deterrent effect as well, even if it falls short of mandatory. Right. Is that enough guidance for this uh, on this point right now, Karen? So I'm yeah, I'm just uh, typing up the notes. My apologies for being loud on the with the typing earlier. Um, so I'll just have. For now, the casinos to consider performing the non-touch temperature checks, but with the caveat to monitor this, basically to monitor the science and the uh, the uh, in how how the temperature checks may inform uh, the existence of COVID infection, something to that effect. So there there would be that caveat. And what was the, there was one other thing you were just saying about? Um, oh, just in terms of queuing, if you do queuing, have that, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. All right, I'll type that up quietly. It would be, um, to Enrique's point though, the, uh, the analogy to the airlines, I don't know, is that mandated for the airlines? Are there any other industries that are opening up where they are mandating this? You know, I'm not familiar whether it's mandated or not. I, I've just seen videos it's and not, reports that- It's not, it's not mandated, no, at the airports, no. Okay. Moving on, I think uh, I would say we have a consensus over consideration <clears throat> at this point. Um, Loretta, uh, you want to help me navigate the next bullet that we should address that's most helpful here? Sure. So I think the next one has to do with uh, whether the guest is exhibiting symptoms, has had contact with the COVID positive person in the past 14 days or has traveled to any of the list of warning countries. I would suggest amending column B at this time, which now would require uh, signage with those questions and amending that to be signage and included in the uh, communication plan and on the website of each of the licensee. So that would be column B. And column C would be administering the questionnaire on those topics. Does anybody have a trouble with that? Those points. I, 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 I yeah. I just don't know how feasible administering to every single patron would be. I, I just. Can, I I'm having a hard time getting my arms around that being feasible, and then again, not having people in the queue so long um that's that's a risk right there so i i i think um b is is probably uh, more appropriate to just push that information out through as many sources as possible yeah, and I if i could offer this was drafted before uh nevada opened yeah. and in, in uh, anticipation that maybe the uh, attendance would be at a lower uh, rate than it has appeared to be. Uh, so, you know, I definitely hear your, your concerns. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. 
I would echo Commissioner Cameron. Some of that stuff I think needs to get pushed out through a communications plan as to as opposed to tying up and creating some some uh, you know backup or line issues. So that what we're really objecting to is that it's it would actually be administered as framed currently under C as opposed to advised through a communications plan. And we're all more comfortable with those questions. In other words, self-assessment. Um, you know, have you had close contact? Please don't come, that kind of thing. In, in their communications plan, is that what we're all comfortable with rather than actually administering those questions? I think, I think we have an understanding. Yep unless otherwise directed. Eileen, are you comfortable with that? No, in an ideal world, you could screen. I just don't see how you execute that in a way that doesn't create more backup and touch points for you know, cross-contamination. But so I think you make it as clear as possible that you shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be there if any of those apply. Yeah, Madam Chair, this is also kind of leading me to thinking about my interest in seeing what the actual training plans are for staff as they come back, um, making it easier as opposed to harder for the employees, I think would be, uh, I, I hope would be reflected in the training that's gonna happen. But um, I might be curious to see what some of those training plans are. And you're gonna back out timelines um, from when, uh, when folks are gonna open, but, um, that might be another component of the reopening plan. Right. So um, right above of the in the middle of B, we do have the, the training of the employees to be able to identify you know, symptomatic individuals. There's also a, a large piece of work at the very end of our document on employees. So can we note um, that we would like to understand with clarity the uh, how the employees are going to be trained. And of course, I think it's important that we also cross train any of the Gaming Commission employees who will be there as well. Uh, Bruce uh, Band, I assume you agree with that, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how are we doing in terms of training? Can we kind of take that note and incorporate that into our final discussion on employees with a note on Commissioner Stebbins that we'd like to understand it better. Sure. Okay. So just for my note taking, so that bullet point on training and, and to identify symptomatic employees, is that adopt, generally the consensus is to adopt that? I think we're asking that, um, Commissioner Stebbins is saying, that he'd like to understand the training, what the training will be. Okay. You know, I'm seeing that that bullet, I don't know if we're actually adopting that bullet per se at this point. What do okay. we, you know, my fellow commissioners, would you like to see that as an element in their training? If yeah. Not, I, yeah. Yes. I, I would. Okay. I think it makes sense as well. Yeah. So, and the signage, we all agree, that's also required signage. We could have, and for this industry, we, we might want to go well beyond the, the, um, the parameters set forth by the advisory board on signage. Okay, um, the last two bullets on C, this actually pertains to, I think, the contact tracing somewhat in terms of Right, this the last bullet appears in B and C, and it's basically, you know, staff there uh, at the entry points, uh, ensuring uh, masks are available, the sanitizer's available, um, and, and uh, you know, moving that part of the process along and make sure it's complying with the plan. And then uh, the final bullet point in C is around the telephone number. And I do believe that the licensees have some uh, input into the actual telephone number as opposed to other potential 
ways of uh, identifying guests. Jackie, would you like to comment on that? Sure, I, I think from an efficiency perspective, stopping each guest as they're coming into the casino and getting a telephone number creates, um, creates a, a huge backup problem for us. Do we have any idea if the governor's advisory board, if, is there anything forthcoming on the contact tracing program? I do know they have a provision in the restaurant. I wish I had it in front of me, but that's, uh, Loretta, do you, maybe you do, or if you want to elaborate, but that's where this comes from. And in fact, yeah. um, they want, they're encouraging, uh, right. hey, they're encouraging the industries to figure out a way to the extent they can who's in the property and who's leaving so that they can improve contact tracing. I think- so I have that in front of me. It says okay. uh, it's a recommended best practice when taking reservations and seating uh, walking customers, restaurants should retain a, a phone number of someone in the party for possible contact tracing. So that's a recommended best practice. I would think, you know, for a large majority of our guests, we would probably be able to identify them through surveillance uh, and the red card use. The red card um, use. You know, not that not that that covers everyone, um, but it's certainly one way of uh, one way of uh, enabling contact tracing. That was going to be my question in terms of your uh, patrons uh, card program. Does that give a lot of that data? We know that the surveillance gives a lot of data, but I just wondered. Um, the that last bullet point is obviously a best practice to support a critically important public health uh, program. So we would just maybe reframe it around that you use your patron um, card programs and then surveillance that will be able to support contact tracing. Is well, is there, any, is there any way to add it to, to the extent that there is traditional restaurant-like function happening that like yeah. other restaurants that you would at, at minimum do it for that and get a number for the party there? We, we do plan on doing that for all of our restaurants, uh, reservations, even walk-ins. We'll take somebody's phone number as they, uh, as they come up. That's, that's a more manageable um, process. So for the restaurants, yes. Okay. Right. I think it's important for us to note we understand that this is a, a, a practice that we would like to support uh, the statewide contact tracing program to the extent it's feasible. And, and there, it may not be a phone number, but we, we have other mechanisms and we should put that in. Okay, great, thank you. Did we get through that section? I think so. All righty. Um, now another easy subject matter. All right. Great, so. So uh, there was a recognition in including the next topic area on occupancy levels that reduced occupancy levels were warranted for this initial phase of reopening. And uh, there are uh, uh, two different methods for uh, going forward on, on that. And the first one in Group A uh, relies on the occupancy levels set by the building code uh, plans and uh, focuses on the occupancy level of the gaming area. And I have some numbers at the bottom of the chart in, in a footnote, and I do have some uh, numbers. The footnote indicates we were waiting for numbers from uh, MGM. We do have that number at 7,480, which includes their gaming floor and food market. Uh, PPC and Encore may want to update the numbers because I think the numbers that I have are gaming area only and do not include uh, uh, the grab and go uh, areas, the food truck at uh, Encore, the grab and go areas at PPC. But in any event, uh, the idea in Group A is to base the occupancy level on some percentage of the building code occupancy levels. The 50% number was uh, suggested uh, in Group A, um, accompanied by a plan on how the licensee would actually count and limit guests uh, uh, 
uh, upon entry. The other two columns uh, disregard the building code occupancy level numbers and instead base occupancy levels on the number of gaming positions. And group B has fewer, uh, excuse me, group C has fewer number of gaming positions than group B. Yeah. Um, Loretta, oh, my, yes. my big question around this is looking at the occupancy and matching that up with what social distancing requirements are gonna be. And how do you take, how do you kind of take that all into consideration? Right, and um, honestly, Bruce, I, uh, I don't have the information on how to engineer that out. Okay, I didn't ask you to be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, we're talking about occupancy and there may be guidelines coming down about occupancy, but we're also gonna be further discussing, you know, number of individuals at table games and that is dependent upon, you know, adequate social distancing, so. Yeah. And, and uh, Bruce and Burke and their teams did put a lot of work into uh, uh, developing with the licensees the, the numbers for column B, columns B and C. Uh, they, they may want to speak uh, to that and the ability to monitor that as opposed, you know, in contrast to column A. Um, can I interject this at this point, though, because Commissioner Stebbins just raised a good point. Bruce and Burke, should we, should we go out of order and should we talk first about the social distancing and, and the recommendation around slot positions in order to address occupancy or is occupancy general enough that we don't have to know those details right now? I, I think probably talk about slot positions would be best first. Loretta's nodding too. Do you mind if we go out of order, commissioners, and go down? Would it be the it would be the next um, the next category? So occupancy levels. Maybe we table that for a second, <laughs> a second or so, um, and and go to social distancing on slots. Does that make sense given that? Can I, can I just raise something? To, I just don't want to forget to circle back when we go back okay. to occupancy okay. is whether you're calculating employees into that number That's or not as they are in a lot of the other retail establishments. I just think if there's no specific guidance from the governor's office coming down, we want to remember that that has to be part of can, the calculation. Yeah, and for our purposes, can we all assume when we are talking about occupancy that we are speaking about inclusion of any employee in addition to patrons. So just think so. keep that in mind that that's the number where, you know, that includes employees because otherwise we're constantly having to be asked that question. All right, Bruce is saying yes. So uh, then good, really good point, Commissioner O'Brien. We'll go now to social distancing us slots on page four. And I think that it, it also goes on to page five with table games going right into the next section. So we should probably address those too. I don't think we need to get into all the other categories at this point. I think these are the two major categories we should think about before we talk about occupancy. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so this was, should be easy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so column A on the distancing notes that essentially they're disabling every other slot machine, uh, and this would go for all, all of the columns, uh, would result in a distance of approximately 4.5 feet uh, between players. Column A affords uh, uh, flexibility to the licensee to uh, implement any number of measures uh, uh, to maximize uh, social distancing. Uh, and uh, if less than six feet, the players would need to wear masks under column A and talks about measures such as the installation of plexiglass between operating machines, the removal of chairs from the disabled machines, 
and uh, gives the licensee additional flexibility to uh, suggest uh, other measures that would have to uh, be individually approved uh, by, the, uh, by the executive director. Column B uh, addresses disabling every other uh, slot machine and identifies the number of slot, uh, slot positions that would result at each of the three properties, uh, if that were, it, you know, if that were uh, uh, what the commission uh, de decided to go with. Uh, and uh, column C calls for the disabling of two machines between each operable machine and identifies the number of slot uh, operating slot machines at each facility with that configuration. Loretta, can you, before we get started on the general discussion, can you comment or we'll invite the licensees to comment on what is happening across the country generally, if that's helpful, I assume? My uh, research as uh, places are opening is uh, that it's primarily every other slot machine disabled, uh, but the licensees have open properties and, and could, address, uh, could address that as well. Sure, so I'm from I, Las Vegas. Let's, Go ahead. Bruce, uh, let's have um, Bruce Bann. Yeah. Uh, uh, I only know of two uh, locations that have opened up differently than every other slot machines. That is in Mississippi, where they've opened up every fourth machine, and Rhode Island. Every place else that I've seen has opened up every other slot machine. Mississippi did every four, not yeah, every. Yeah, would be okay. uh, one open, two closed, one open, two closed. Can and then uh, another just framing this really accurately. We're talking about six feet next to each other um, have, then we have the behind the aisle behind like you want that, to address that, Bruce? that that's about uh like almost five feet between the the, the two depending the co configuration of the floor on diagonal yes that so back to back it would be if you did every other it'd be about a five feet between yeah, approximately depending how you have your floor laid out some places have more space between them. It's depending on the casino. Some of them really stack each other close, but most of them here uh, have a, a decent separation between the machines. And then one other comment, those are not in rows? Uh, yeah, some of them that are like uh, in a circular shape uh, have more distance. The ones that are in rows, uh, if you do every other slot machine, that's about 4.6 uh, feet in between if you close the, uh, you know, count the machine closed in between uh, with it. Okay, great. I, if it would be helpful, I have a diagram of some of the different configurations. Oh, excellent. That would be, uh, I'm not sure if I'm able to share. Well, since that, she, she came with a um, presentation, a sketch. Okay, hold on. Let, let's see if it actually works. <laughs> um, Nope, it won't work, but I can certainly send it to you. Oh, uh, so you're having trouble with it because maybe you should be able to share it. Um, I, th I think it's a system control on my computer that I have to go in and change. The oh, but I understand. I, you know what I can do? I can email it to someone uh, if someone else is able to share readily. Okay. Jackie, why don't you email it to me and I'll try and share. Okay. Great, thank you. That will be helpful. The visual is always helpful. Uh, why don't we get started on questions, uh, commissioners? I, I had a question. Um, so the the difference uh, for for options B and C uh, here to to put in contrast with A, would there be not the partitions between the plexiglass partitions between the machines? Uh, based on these uh, calculations, Enrique. This was done without uh, plastic partitions between them. Right, so disabling one or limiting, you know, the, the, the number of machines, there wouldn't, 
the, the assumption is no plexiglass. There's no plexiglass here. That's an option, but it, uh, option. these calculations were done without the plexiglass. Mm -hmm. So the next question would be, are any, um, uh, have you been required licensees in any other jurisdiction to? Uh, to some jurisdictions have done that. We spoke to uh, Hard Rock in Sacramento and they initially opened up with just a few uh, plexiglass dividers between the machines and they were adding a lot of plexiglass dividers, mostly because of the demand of the slots and they felt that that gave uh, adequate separation. Seth, did you want to chime in on that? I'm sorry, I couldn't tell. Sure. Thanks. Chair Stein might have uh, Pat Madamba. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. Yeah, we can. Uh, hi, Patrick. Can yes, I can. Um, I can hear you now. Um, a couple things. In Mississippi, the requirement um, is six foot. Uh, if that works out to two machines, mean so be it. But the requirement specifically is that uh, the machines have to be have a six foot spacing and then what the regulator did with uh, in the same aisle with folks that are back to back the the measurement is not from the back of the chair to the back of the chair it's actually from essentially the nose of the patron or the edge of the seat to the opposing edge of the seat for six foot so you're That's not going back to back but you're going nose to nose um interesting thank you opening. thank you um, in no jurisdiction have we been required to put plexiglass in the machines. Uh, New Jersey, which is, doesn't have an opening date yet, but we do have minimum standards. They were just agreed to by the industry last week. Apologies. They were just agreed to by the industry last week is uh, every other machine, but to the extent that the slot machines aren't six foot apart, uh, a guest must mask, wear a mask. And the same is true at a table game the guests uh, must wear a mask. So essentially what you're saying is that if you're gaming on the casino floor, you must wear a mask because that's really how it's gonna work out in practice. Uh, because at a gaming table, you're typically not six foot away from a player. If you're every other machine, you're typically not uh, six foot away from a player. Um, Maryland is, is uh, when we'll be opening Maryland uh, sometime, uh, well, we're allowed to open on June 19th. That was the date that was given by the governor yesterday. Uh, again, it's going, it's, 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 um, a six foot requirement. Very helpful. And Kathy, I do have the, uh, I'm going to try to share the document that Ka uh, Jackie sent over. Let's see if this okay, works. Thank you. Sure. Here we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Thank you. Very helpful, Jackie. Okay. So I don't know, Jackie, if you want to comment, just tell me to scroll down if you need to. Sure. It, um, yes, if you wouldn't mind just scrolling down a bit. So uh, as I'm sure you're aware, we're in the process of reconfiguring a lot of our uh, slot floor now with uh, thanks to Bruce's team and help on that. Um, and some of these reconfigurations will result in almost a six foot distancing or more than a six foot distancing. Um, and for those that would not, uh, this is where we'd, uh, you know, we'd suggest wearing masks. Can, Karen, are you able to scroll down a little bit? I'm scrolling right now. Can, is it not moving? No. I don't mind. No. Is oh, I'm scrolling down. Oh, that happened the other day too. You can see at the bottom right one, that's a uh, 6.2 feet. Can you see that? Between the two. Okay, let me uh, let me try and share again. Hold on. Yeah, Scott. Scott just came on, Karen. I'm not sure if he's able to help us out. Scott, are you able to? Yeah, I was um, just going to suggest. Uh, for Karen to look and see on the the sharing um, option to see sometimes it gets paused. I don't know if it got paused. Well, obviously you stopped sharing those, so you can try okay. sharing. Okay, so again. hold on, let me let me pull it up again. Sure. Okay, and here's the document. Let's get back to your screen. Well, maybe. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. I'm just gonna move that. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna scroll down a little bit here and then share. Yeah, maybe try it that way. Is it showing it? No. No. Uh, your screen. It was sharing your screen. Okay. Oh, here it is. Try this. Is that showing it? Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Oh, it's different. Yeah, we got the top of the page. All right, so I'm scrolling now. Is it moving? Yep. Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> See. 
Good job, Karen. So did you want to go up to the top, Jackie, starting? Or? Sure. So these are just some of the different configurations that um, we're proposing um, with the idea of trying to distance um, as much as possible between, um, between the uh, different gaming positions. Uh, on the top one, what we'd suggest is that the middle chair would be closed off. Um, and then if you scroll down a bit, you can see the different configurations. As I said before, not all of them are meet the six foot mark, but that's uh, where we'd ask to uh, have a mask requirement. So you're, you're saying in your, for your facility, you're able to, to reconfigure their placement to achieve a little bit of distance with some but not all, right? Correct. To try to maximize it without necessarily turning off every other machine. So I think, you know, when we were talking about this yesterday um, among the licensees, I think there's a number of ways to accomplish, uh, to accomplish different things. And uh, that's why A was uh, of particular interest to us on this because it did provide for different options that uh, the different licensees might look at. Okay, so let's go back to Loretta's form now. Thank yeah. you. I'll like, I'll like Jack. Okay. Anyone have actually I should have said any questions for Jackie, my fellow commissioners? Okay. Everybody and, just moved around. Interesting. And I would suggest in column A is part of the uh, menu for uh, licensees to implement would be another bullet point on reconfiguring, re, you know, allowing reconfigurations, uh, you know, to Jackie's point, uh, to uh, maximize uh, uh, social distancing, uh, but still wear less than six feet uh, wearing masks to be required. Well, I, I, uh, I would be in, um, in favor of, in this case, A, mostly uh, with the understanding that there's, a, a, at least in theory, a, a number of permutations and examples that are going to be different for licensees. Um, I can imagine, you know, the floor at MGM different from PPC and Anchor, and so, and even the islands or the configuration varies tremendously. So, um, the notion that they could um, incrementally put some of these guidelines, uh, plexiglass, masks, physical distance, so that, you know, together they could have the best uh, outcome. Um, understanding that there's probably going to be a bit of a trial and error as they, as they move something and then, uh, you know, they figure out whether people, uh, you know, react or comply or, or prefer certain things. I um, I think that uh, A is a little, um, I mean, by, if you read A, only you only have to do one, so you could just disable certain machines, and I don't know that I'm comfortable with, um, I really do like the idea that if you are less than six feet, you uh, required to wear the mask, as opposed to, you know, just, say, disable machines and and we don't speak about the small, you know, the uh, less than six feet and uh, and the mask. I, so, I, I think in section, I think in uh, in that column, am I wrong, Loretta, that it says that it does presume wearing masks? But it says one or more feet. of the following. And then, if, if less uh, than six feet, players uh, must wear masks. If, oh, 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 okay, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, just. <laughs> if, so that was is requiring it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, th and um, then also they could reposition. They could add. Those are um, consider. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are things you could consider. But what is a must is if you're less than six foot feet, you wear a mask, right? Okay. That's well, what I was. Right. But but I think. I think I, you can't be one foot apart, one feet apart. So let's well, think about this. Right. Um, you know, yeah. the way it's right now, well, that's definitely allow for every zoom. I feel like I'm echoing. If I'm shouting, I'm sorry. Um, the, the way it's written, am I wrong? That we would want to make sure that 
they're achieving yeah. the greatest distance possible with, I think, business considerations that these options are, are highlighting. So we do probably need to plow through a little bit more detail under C, under A, correct? Um, I mean, for, for what it's worth, I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable with less than six feet, given what the current guidance is. I mean, right now, masks are mandatory and six feet, except for those limited times when you're drinking, et cetera. I, given the amount of time somebody could sit at a slot machine, um, I'm more aligned with sticking with the Mississippi Rhode Island. Mandate. Okay, so, um, and, and Mississippi requires every four, the two, the two, um, uh, if you're imagining roads. Right. I'm not opposed to reconfiguring to get as many going as possible, but I do think that the six feet's there for a reason, and particularly inside, extended exposure increases the risk of transmission, so to me that six feet matters. Um, so that's where I am at this point. Did Mississippi also require masks? They, they did not, Chair. There is there's no mask requirement. It's optional. And frankly, depending upon the facility, the percentage of guests that actually wear masks is, is very, very different. Um, in our facility, we had a probably 60 uh, percent at, at Gold Strike Tunica. I don't know what it was at Beau, Beau, uh, Beau Rivage, 60 to 70 percent. It was very high compared to some of our competitors around. Uh, there was, there is no, there was no requirement um, to wear a mask. Uh, the way, how we landed in New Jersey, frankly, with uh, the less than six feet was the less than six feet if you're wearing a mask. Thank you. But, and, and is there a minimum in New Jersey? But, but, one minute, one minute. Is there a minimum? There, is, there, is there a minimum in New Jersey even with the mask? The minimum is not by 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 the number of feet. The minimum is there must be at least. Uh, one slot machine disabled between a guest or a group of related guests. Okay. And then a suggestion, um, if I could. Yes, sir. Uh, to, on the on the piece of well, you couldn't have them one one foot apart. I, if we go with if you go with option A, you could change it to rather than promote social distancing, maximize social distancing, and have the plan approved by the commission, so okay. that um, th there wouldn't be any. So it would be closer to that, you know, five and a half foot that Jackie showed. Exactly. There would be some control over it. So we'd have Bruce there, Bruce Band and Burke with their measuring uh, tapes, which is, you know, that's that's exactly exactly right. Thank you, Seth, for that clarification. Um, but maximize social distancing, uh, achieving to the best of your capacity closest distance is six feet or over, of course, uh, with a condition of wearing masks. That's one way I'm hearing from Commissioner O'Brien, six feet, you know, it does appear to be a standardized uh, um, public health measurement in, in Massachusetts. Uh, six feet, there hasn't been a lot of deviation. With that said, there have been some choices where masks are introduced and then there's been some um, relief given. And the only example I have right now is the restaurants where while you're seated and you're eating, even your table needs to be at least six feet apart or there needs to be plexiglass or some kind of non-porous material between the tables that extends to six feet high and then you can remove your mask too for eating. So, but that six foot standard for social distance measurement purposes seems to be clear in Massachusetts at this point. So um, where are we? Commissioner Cameron, I'm not sure, once you got some clarity around, because it is a little tricky to understand it, if we went with something like what Seth said, where it's to maximize that distance as close to six feet or more with some kind of an oversight by the commission, would, and you're wearing, requiring mask wearing, does that get you more comfortable or where would you be? Oh, you know what, you're, I, I didn't realize, Gail, you, you were, I was I waiting. Just, I, I just unmuted. My apologies, yeah. No, it's okay, I saw Enrique's uh, hand signal. 
Um, <laughs> I'm out the notes, yeah. um, no, I, I, I am more comfortable. I would like it to be as close to six feet as possible, obviously. So I like the idea of um, having the commission approve the plan as well as, uh, you know, requiring the mask and, um, you know, seeing the plan itself and how close you get to that guideline. So we'd have the option if, if it, you know, it's three feet and we're not happy, we could say, no, we don't approve that. Commissioner Stebbins? Yeah, I, I like the idea of encouraging the reconfiguration. Uh, I think we've just seen some options that get us more to the accepted social distancing distant. Um, but, um, you know, this is going to bring us back to the conversation around, um, you know, the requiring of masks or not. Um, but I think something else we got to consider, and we're going to probably talk about this with table games, is we got to remember it's just not the patron sitting at the gaming position, but it's their buddy, it's their wife, it's their friend who's standing in the nearby adjacent area. Um, I don't know if that's going to be part of the conversation or not, but yeah. uh, I definitely want to encourage the the reconfiguration of the of of um, you know the game layout as much as possible. Commissioner Zunica, did you want to? Were you leaning in? Yeah, well, well I'll just make the point, um, or actually an additional point to one I made. Um, my preference for for a with you know with the rework about maximizing uh, comes from the um, my notion that there's all these other requirements that we're layering on um, that there needs to be some flexibility as to you know the specifics when when everything is put together which is what um, what Gail is also suggesting that I would suggest as well uh, having a rule that it's like you know a hard six feet where you know five ten is unacceptable and six is acceptable in my mind is less of a concern it's more about how it's sort of workable with all these other things physical and behavioral that are going to be layered so i think that um it would be fair to say that we we might have a consensus the four of us um, are seeing that the option as revised under A, and probably because B and C are just complicated for us to think about it, we're not including the elements. I think we're being practical here that the goal is to achieve that, that six foot standard to the extent practicable, maximize it as Seth suggested. Um, but also to implement as many um, other innovations that will reduce risk. Is it fair to say that we're comfortable with less than six feet because this option does require wearing masks? Without that, we would not be comfortable. Am I right? Yeah, I see. I think I've got, so that's a critical element. And, and again, I, I can speak for myself if it's four feet and it's not closer to you know, six feet, the comfort level, of course, goes down substantially. So I like the idea of our oversight. We would probably have expected that anyway, but an approval once we get Bruce and, and Burke and team out there with their measuring tapes. All right, and then uh, duly noted that we are, we are recognizing that six feet is the standard that we may end up yield, having to yield to because of the public health um, uh, science. And I think uh, Commissioner O'Brien has noted that. And that's why, Commissioner O'Brien, that's why you're not right now willing to accept less. Correct. So we'll get, that's right. we'll, that will be one that we can mark that we will be looking for some additional help from the public health experts. Okay, does, is that helpful? Okay, well, uh, so Karen, do you have questions on, on how to? Yeah, so, so for right now, for the casinos purposes, for their planning purposes, we can't 
confirm for them today whether or not they can do every other machine or I guess every, it's every third machine. We'll, ha we'll be looking for clarification from the governor's guidelines. Is that where we're leaving right. off? If they give the guy, if they give the guidance, otherwise it will come back to us. Yeah. Okay. Um, in my understanding, just that they'll they need to plan because uh, there's a lot of technical work. So we'll just need to recognize the uh, need for expediency on coming back if we can't get an answer. Right. I mean, the reality is is that you know, like every other industry in the Commonwealth, we're operating. Um, and as a regulatory role and you're operating in your in your licensee role subject to the standards of of the state and federal and local um, officials so with that guidance you know as commissioner o'brien points out six feet is six feet is six feet and unless we hear that under the industry standards there's some relief given i'm presuming that they are looking at these matters really carefully they They've done so with respect to restaurants. They've done so with respect to when you're jogging down a sidewalk. If you can achieve your six feet distance, you don't have to wear your mask. When somebody's coming by you, you put up your mask to protect those around you as well as yourself. So it will be, I think what will be helpful to the extent we can pass along this challenging discussion, um, you know, the experts can help us gauge the risk. But with that said, can I ask a more practical question? How much time in terms of days, weeks, has the light, have the licensees suggested that they need in order uh, to have this particular matter resolved in order to start up? Karen? Are you able to have help on this or should we go to each individual? Yeah, license? I mean, I think that that's, I mean, I, I think that it, my understanding, it's not something that can, you know, they are submitting plans to us, we review the plans, there's the um, IT component of tearing them off, and they may have to reconfigure the floor. So this is not a, a couple of days, where uh, I think it's longer than that, but I'll just refer to the licensees if they have comments on what they need in order to open, should the governor allow casino openings say on June 29th, what kind of lead time they need. Because I think it's, we're, we're in that period right now, but I'll defer to their comments. Right, and lead time in terms of the configuration, you know, regardless of what the configuration ultimately is, how much time it will take to get the slot machines, and we'll get the table games next. Brian, are you weighing in? Well, yeah. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, it, it really would depend on the requirements as to how long it would take for the re We are reconfiguring some of our uh, tables and uh, machines right now, as Jackie stated, with different configurations to try to maximize the space between machines and patrons. Um, but should it go to a uh, minimum six feet between every machine, it would be much more extensive. So we would we would really need to understand that, um, and we are certainly in favor of everyone wearing a mask. Should it not maintain, or if it needs to be four and a half feet, whatever you decide. Uh, but if it is a six feet minimum requirement, it would be extensive uh, work for us to do. Just let us know as quickly as possible. Um, and as we've said before, we needed ten to fourteen days notice, uh, if at all possible, for us to get everything prepared. Uh, we are now preparing for June twenty ninth. Uh, just in case, because that's three weeks after phase two, uh, and understand that that date may slip, but we're headed towards that date. That's very helpful. Lance, do you want to comment? Yeah, not much additional to add. Certainly, uh, columns A and B are fairly straightforward. Gets far more challenging for us if it is the two six feet. Our number drops to about 400 games, I believe. So that would require extensively. Um, changing our floor and that takes you know that's weeks if not months to to really maximize the floor if we got to get to the true 60. And I just want to be clear uh, and then I'll go to Seth. For those who don't know the casino industry the slot machines are not on wheels and can't just be it's not just a matter of having the gaming floor being your um, 
your limits or the, you know, the capacity of the floor print, but they're not on wheels. And, and I know that Brian's laughing, but this is, you know, this is really helpful for people to understand as well as what's under and what's over uh, the slot machines for why when you say extensive, um, it would, it, it would, uh, if you could just elaborate a little bit without any surveillance or security. Uh, yeah, certainly from, from our perspective, well, surveillance and security are certainly a, a part of that in moving cameras around the facility to ensure we've got adequate coverage. But obviously the, the main driver of the challenge is the wiring. And we are on a raised floor, and so pulling wire, if you will, is the, the local term. Um, that's, that's extensive. You're breaking through carpet. You're breaking through concrete. There's paperwork that needs to be submitted for your review and then approved, and then ensuring that there is adequate camera coverage. But under no circumstances are slot machines on wheels. I, I will confirm that. And I appreciate the smiles. I just wanted to make sure everybody was clear that this, because when Jackie put up her plan, there could be a suggestion that they could be easily moved. It's an extensive process, as well as the security cameras above, and those would have to all be approved by um, our team to make sure that the integrity of the game can be preserved. Okay, thanks. And just to be clear, that's not my puppy right now. All right, Seth, did you want to uh, add? Generally the same. I, I think it's, you know, we would need a minimum of two weeks for plans that require reconfiguration, we can prepare based on some of these options, um, plans, and we, the more restrictive the requirements are, the more we would need to reconfigure to maximize under those more restrictive requirements, and that takes lead time, um, again, a minimum of two weeks. But, um, you know, option A, I, I think we, we have plans ready to go with existing configurations that um, would allow us to move forward for approval. Any questions for our licensees, commissioners? I bet you're wishing they were on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, moving on, Karen, uh, I, I don't see you, but I'm assuming you're all set then on, on slots and we can move to table games. All these buttons, I keep pressing the wrong one. Uh, yeah, we're all set. Um, I'm just noting calendar wise, two weeks from the 29th is Monday. So uh, just be aware. And, and I'm also not noting our time. Uh, it is 1230 um, or 1228. This is a, an extensive uh, review and I appreciate the licensees being here for us because it's been so helpful to get your immediate input. <clears throat> I'd like to ask if, if my fellow commissioners would like to continue. Uh, and, and are available to continue, <clears throat> or if you would like to take, oh, I'm seeing, was there, was there this? Hmm, I think that I make a suggestion. Break. Now, um, that they might need a break, but also, is it a break or do we need to reconvene at a future time? I know we're very compressed here in terms of our decision making. I need some guidance from all of my fellow commissioners. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to take a quick break and and then you know for a bite to eat and then um, kind of keep this going. I think this is good, helpful discussion. And as Karen pointed out, we got some tight timelines ahead of us, um, so I'd like to get through as much as we can. Okay, Bruce uh, Gale. I'm fine uh, with uh, Bruce's suggestion. Um, I don't know about everybody else's availability. Okay, Enrique. Yeah, if we take a lunch break, I would I would say uh, we could keep going. Okay. You know, um, and and uh, Commissioner O'Brien, you've got no, the same. You're good. No, I, I've I've got coverage, so I'm good. If we take a break to eat, um, then I, I can come back on. Okay. So what I'm going to suggest is, I, it's been so helpful to have the licensees. I also know you have full lives and full jobs going on. To the extent that we take a, it, could we make it a short, short um, lunch break? Is 15 minutes work for you to get, to get over the, no, oh, Enrique's, what, Enrique, what would you like for a break? The cook in my household is a little slow. <laughs> and that would be me. That would be me. At least, at least you have a cook. Oh, I was going to say. Go yeah. <laughs> Coming to your house. I, yeah. It's not like I'm going to the Boston Cafe like I usually go. 
Okay. Um, well, I'd like to make it as limited as possible um, because I don't want to make this an endless exercise because they, they have work to get to. Can, can we agree on a 20 minute lunch break? Will that work? Sure. Yeah. Sure. 20 yes. minutes. And um, my, to the licensees, I see Brian hanging there, Jackie. Um, Seth, I see thumbs up. Lance, so you look okay. okay, excellent. And to all of our staff, Loretta, I, I, I appreciate you hanging in there with us. Is that okay? Sure. Yep. Okay, excellent. Um, and, and the rest of the team, I can't see all your faces. I see Elaine. Um, I'm sure Elaine, uh, Greg, you will be good. Okay, excellent. All right, then let's, it's uh, 1231. Let's reconvene at, um, at, at 1250, please. And I'll admit that was Chippy saying hello, so not to be confused with Mojo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mojo's being incredibly quiet, so thanks. <laughs> thanks, everyone. As we are reconvening today's meeting number 305, and I'll just do a quick roll call. Commissioner Cameron? Present. Uh, excuse me, Commissioner O'Brien? Yep, I'm here. Commissioner Zuniga? Here. Commissioner Stebbins? I'm here, thank you. All right, and so all five of us are here, and I think now our licensees are back um, as well, and we really appreciate the um, extended uh, meeting and, and your, your availability. We know you may not have planned on it, so thank you very much. Karen, uh, are you comfortable then with our discussion on the slots yes. and social distancing? Okay, then we'll move right into um, social distancing and table gaming on page five. I know we didn't discuss the sanitization. I think that's page six is the slots, so, uh, pardon me, the table games, social distancing, the bottom of page six. Oh, it's on my bottom of my page five. I'm sorry, maybe. Yeah, mine's page five. Too. Page yeah, five. So I've been adding notes, so it's it's messing up my oh. system. I yeah, so yeah. bottom of page five is social distancing of the table game. So if we want yep. to, there's general well, there is, on five. Uh, and there is one other item under um, slots that's not exactly a social distancing measure, but uh, Kathy, I know you had expressed an interest in trying to minimize uh, cash handling uh, with respect to guests. So there is a bullet point in columns B and C at the on the bottom of page four uh, with respect to you know, making uh, payouts slot payout, slot jackpot payouts uh, via Tito ticket or uh, in an envelope, uh, uh, in an enclosed envelope. And this would be, of course, after counting out under camera uh, coverage uh, to be able to validate the amount. But if that was something you wanted to address uh, or to leave that to the discretion of the licensee, I think B make, made it uh, at the player's request and C um, uh, uh, made it a directive. Well, I am interested in this. Uh, I'm not sure if my fellow commissioners are, but of course, one of the uh, prevailing practices that's encouraged is to have contactless payment. Everybody's trying to use their mm -hmm. Apple Watches, et cetera. Um, how is this being managed at other, in other states? And is this even a reasonable, uh, is this a reasonable feature to to impose it or or at least encourage? Does it help? Does it help uh, both the employees? Is it is it a effective um, measure that you're using anywhere else? Nobody wants to jump on this one. <laughs> Brian. No, I think okay, Jackie. Yeah. I, I think uh, we would appreciate the ability to um, pay using Tito tickets. Um, in terms of the jackpot, what we discussed with uh, Bruce is potentially being able to count it out on the chair so that you still got that surveillance aspect and then um, putting it into an envelope and giving it to the patron to avoid, um, to avoid the money. Uh, we are looking at different ways. Um, as you know, our, our restrictions, regulations here are um, 
very limited in terms of uh, the ATM machines right. and where they can be located, uh, different, uh, potentially different ways to, instead of getting cash, getting Tito tickets. So, um, you know, we've got to check on that and see if that's possible, but we certainly are looking at different ways to achieve contactless payments. Yeah, and just to note, that is possible with the ATMs uh, and the TRUs, but it's not permissible under the current restrictions. Uh, so we could make uh, Tito tickets available through the TRUs with ATMs, but ATMs and TRUs have been separated in the state of Massachusetts. So, yeah. And that would be a statutory uh, rest restriction. Yeah. Right. The other reason is that uh, the ATM machine here can't cancel out the uh, uh, TRU ticket, the, the not slot connected. Ticket. So correct. There's no way we for have to connect the systems. That's correct. Yes. Yep. So, uh, Loretta, what would your recommendation be? I'm, I'm not. Uh, my fellow commissioners, do mind? Are, are you, do we have a consensus that we'd like for the licensees to consider? Ex, you know, exploring the the best exchanges with respect to money, best practices to enhance. Uh, social distancing with money, contactless payments to the extent feasible, or Eileen, are you thinking? Uh, I guess my question, <clears throat> excuse me, in B, with the at the player's request, is there anything that stops that now? Would we need to affirmatively say that to make that an option? Or can they just simply request it? I, I don't think there's anything that would prevent that now if the payer wanted it. be unusual, but there would be nothing that would prevent it at this point. Okay. So the question is, do we want to encourage it or because otherwise think, it doesn't seem like, excuse me, it would need to be there. Yeah, I think it would be a patron option, maybe that would be offered by the licensee at this point. Mm -hmm. you know, Just remind it, people it's an option? Yes. Seth, were you going to say something? Seth? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> patron option, fine. I think to Bruce's point, it would be rare for a customer to ask for that, so to have it be a requirement. Um, would probably create an unusual experience that patrons aren't accustomed to. Certainly there are more and more of those in the COVID environment, but um, option I think would be the preference. Okay, thank you. Then any other comments or questions? Karen? I'm, I'm fine with making it a, an option or known. That, that's an option right. for people. Well, that's, that's, the, that's my question as far as taking the notes, because right now it's, Option B is at the player's request, but there's, uh, so the player would have to specifically ask for it, but do we want to say option provided and at the player's request slot jackpot or payouts to be made by a Tito ticket. So there's, when someone makes, uh, you know, gets the, the jackpot that they're told you can have it one way or the other and then they choose? Yeah, that seems to be the most effective way to do it. Okay, I'll write that down. Yeah. It needs to be understood that that's an option and it's a, a safety option. Okay, thanks for pointing that one out. Should we just, um, before we go on to the top of my page five on cleaning and sanitization of the slot, we'll go right to the um, social distancing on table games because I think we want to circle back to um, the more the other difficult subject matter on, on um, occupancy. occupancy. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, so similarly on the table game social distancing measures, the first column uh, leaves uh, considerably more flexibility uh, with the licensee with the directive to uh, maintain increased social distance and of course you could supplant maintain with maximize uh, social distance at each table and um, as written now, if less than six feet requiring uh, masks, uh, no congregating, and that's consistent throughout all of the, the columns, no congregating around the table and staff to um, monitor that. Column A is an option to install plexiglass between the dealer and the players, B and C, require the installation of plexiglass between the dealer and the players. Uh, all of the columns, all of the groups uh, direct no poker until further notice. 
groups B and C uh, focus on table game positions and uh, direct maximum number of players uh, per game. <clears throat> so for instance, <clears throat> you're given total positions with uh, four uh, players per, per uh, blackjack uh, table uh, in, in column B, three players per um, craps, three players uh, per roulette, and so forth. And then those numbers are um, dropped down for uh, column C, and you're given total number of player positions uh, in B and C. Uh, there are requirements in B and C uh, with respect to uh, plexiglass between player positions in column B. It's to install it where feasible. Uh, so, you know, blackjack would be treated differently uh, than uh, craps in, in B. Um, and in C, uh, it would be no craps or roulette until further notice. <laughs> Amike, do you want to start this? You're the you're the expert on table games. I was waving up my daughter, so I wasn't necessarily, but I'll start. Um, I I um I was uh, thinking about maybe a bit of a hybrid between A and B, in which you know there's some flexibility afforded, uh, but it's layered up on you know again maximizing the social distancing and and then not taking the may but maybe installing the plexiglass when that when that's not possible i guess uh, as a question as we get into into um option b it appears that that would not have plexiglass loretta because there's already some natural physical distancing uh, in column B, it's a requirement to install the plexiglass between the dealer and the player, and depending on the game, um, installing it where feasible. Yeah, it's between it's players. A, it's sort oh, it's of a the pull, pull it from the bottom in that yes. column. Yep. Um, I would be interested in knowing um, what we know about. Um, what is happening elsewhere and i suspect it's a combination of things but um that would be of interest to me what what is working now um what is what are the requirements in other states uh, what, uh, bruce, bruce band do you uh, want to try and grab that question I, I think a lot of places are using the plexiglass be, uh you know, between the players uh, on there, especially on the blackjack style tables, which are, are a lot of the games like, you know, three card poker, the, all those. Uh, I, I believe a lot of them are using that. Roulette is another story. It, it becomes a lot more difficult. Uh, I think most places are, are just limiting the number of players at that. Craps are limiting three players to an end, most of them, if they're offering it at all. Uh, I, I think those kind of games, even, well, I, I don't, uh, I guess Baccarat is mostly limited to uh, uh, single table, uh, like mini Bach and stuff like that. Uh, are you guys doing every, anything different in Las Vegas, Jackie? Or Brian, I should say. I can tell you, speak to Las Vegas, a majority of our tables do not have Plexi, uh, okay. but some do. Um, they put it out there for the guests that prefer that so they can choose. Uh, the same thing exists down in uh, Mohegan Sun, down in Connecticut. They've had some tables with, some tables without. And I think it really depends on the, the operation. Some have decided to go with it, some haven't. From a uh, games protection standpoint, the roulette and craps games just do not seem feasible to have plexiglass on them. If I'm down the end and I toss a chip in under a plexiglass, for example, and say, five dollars on the red eight i would imagine that could easily be um mis misplaced uh, and the bet might not, might not be paid off plexiglass on those long games like that could probably lead lead to more patron complaints misunderstandings 
How about um, when when there is no plexiglass and each patient is able to handle chips? Do I know that there's probably there's not widespread sanitization because that's just not practical. Is there, if not an enforcement of use of hand sanitizer, do we see patrons using hand sanitizer regularly? I, I think part of the problem with that is that patrons have chips in their possession. And as soon as they put them on, you're not going to be able to sanitize them. No, you can't sanitize. I'm talking about in between. Are you seeing when you know we get back to hand sanitizer? Yeah. If, if they're starting to use hand sanitizer and then there's a lot of contact on the table, but they're using hand sanitizer, I get a lot more comfortable than if they're not wearing a mask and they're not using hand sanitizer. Brian. So Chair, our, our protocol that we've put in place is that we will have hand sanitizer at every table. And when each guest sits down, we will offer them hand sanitizer with the pump straight from the dealer or the pit boss and squirt it straight into their hands so they don't have to touch anything. And that'll be for anybody that sits down uh, and they can have it as often as they want. And, and is that being, is that a practice that they seem to appreciate? They're not saying, oh, I don't want that, or, you know, like the masks, are they using the hand sanitizers? We were doing that before we closed and many people were taking it. Many like 20% or many like 80%? Uh, I, I couldn't tell you. Okay. There, there could be a problem when at a blackjack game, the person in seat one perhaps uh, isn't, is cognizant of their cleanliness and their chips are gonna go right to the top of the float on a losing bet. And on the next round of play, they're gonna come right out as a payment, possibly to the center person or the third base person. And that's just an example of two rounds of play. And this yeah. is gonna go on all night long. How feasible it is, is it to require the sanitizer? If you want to play, here you go. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you, you, it sounds like you think that is somewhat feasible. I, I don't know. Yeah. And helpful. Well, obviously it would mm -hmm. be helpful. But I just didn't know if you know. I'm not sure about the medical. If somebody truly has an allergy to the alcohol intake or something, and then they would probably have documentation. I was just well, wondering. Because plus, if they're contagious and then they cough or something into it after they sanitized once, right? They have to do it again. Exactly. You know, they're going to. There's certainly going to be risk. Um, in terms of the use of plexiglass, I just have that next question. Uh, one question on that. They are using it on certain games, but not universally on the, the same games, like for blackjack. It's not, it's not applied universally. It's sort of option of the patron. Do you know what I mean? Uh, maybe I'm not being clear. I understand where roulette may not be, it may not be feasible to use plexiglass, because of the concerns Burke raised with respect to the integrity of the game, just because of also the length of the game board. But for blackjack, plexiglass, as I understand, can be used. Yes. But you haven't applied that universally to all your blackjack game tables. Roulette and craps, you mostly place your own, own bets historically. Right. And it's difficult with plexiglass to do that. Right. But with blackjack and, and anything that sits at a, a a, a traditional blackjack shaped table, uh, right. it, it's more conducive to using plexiglass. Uh. Right, but um, I think I heard Brian say that it's not universally used on all blackjack tables, just on you, some. If you, were, if you were speaking specifically about our Las Vegas property, it is not. Okay. Uh, we intend to have our entire main floor with all of the blackjack and novelty games uh, installed with plexiglass, with the exception of, uh, as Bruce just mentioned, roulette and craps. And then upstairs, it would be 50% of those tables, the high limit area. Uh, some guests may want to have their own table in high limit. Some guests prefer to sit by themselves at their own table, where we would then just limit the number of people to be three versus the four with the dividers in between. 
And that's in our plan that we presented to you, I believe, right. several weeks ago as well. Right. I know this isn't, Lance, you don't have the tables issue, but Seth, and then maybe all the commissioners will want to ask more questions about your plan again. And sure. then, of course, the distance issue. Sure. We would, I mean, we're comfortable with, we're still trying to figure it out, but we'll offer some table game options with, with Plexi, some without. To um, We believe it's more of a, um, some comfortable, some players will be very uncomfortable playing in that environment and some players will be more comfortable playing in that environment. So we prefer the flexibility of offering it as a player, kind of a player amenity in this environment. Um, and we'll, we'll be installing it in, in some instances, but believe to require it as a, as a minimum for all tables. Um, we would have a concern with that approach. It would be inconsistent with our approach in other um, jurisdictions as well. Bruce, you, oh, Bruce, did you want to add in? Who, me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. Commissioner Zinnika. Yeah, I'm in favor of uh, giving the flexibility again to layer some of these options, really. Um, you know, whether, whether it makes sense for a particular table to have flexiglass, Flexiglass, or rather, or you know, a particular game to be limited to two or three people on one end, uh, whatever you know, whatever can be relative to um, maximizing some of these um, you know, <coughs> principles. Um, I'm, I'm I'm less in favor of, of of coming up with hard and fast rules for each one of these that again may result in unworkable instances. Question, are we talking, are, are you uh, both considering um, the plexiglass between the dealer and the players? You've been speaking about player to player, but what about dealer um, to player? The plexi does protect the dealer. There is no face-to-face -face contact. In addition, we are requiring all of our employees to wear masks and the customers to wear masks. So everyone's got a mask and there's plexi and there's sanitation or a sanitizer as well offered. So all of your tables will have the plexi between the players and the dealer? With the exception of what Bruce spoke about and that's uh, right. craps is a very different game as yes. well as roulette. And in high limit, we would just require mass. Can, um, Brian, can you help me understand? I'm trying to visualize a blackjack table with a plexiglass divider between the players and the, and the and the dealer. Jack, I actually think I photo? have a photo. That's great. Hold on, I'll send it to Karen again. Of course you do. Let's see if you can share it, Jack. <laughs> I don't think I can share, but I can just move forward to Karen. One second, right. should be there in a second. Because I, I worry about the plexiglass divider, obviously, and Commissioner Cameron raises a great point. We're also worried about the protection and safety and health of the employees as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of goes to probably where Burke and Bruce are interested in the security of the game of anything that prohibits the dealer from doing their job as well as protecting and maintaining the cards, the chips, everything that's out on the table. We, we have checked with uh, uh, a few tests and we are able to see everything with the surveillance cameras uh, through the plexiglass, it ha didn't inhibit that. Yeah, but I mean, just in terms of the dealer reaching out to collect cards or dealer reaching out to collect chips or uh, the, the plexiglass actually goes in front of the patrons and there's a space about that far underneath so it doesn't really inhibit the dealer okay. from doing their job. Okay. Um, I'm attempting to, sh to share the photograph right now. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. it's, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's difficult to see because it's clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, Karen, I'm not sure if you can zoom in. There's a little zoom tool. Oh, hold on. It's so it's my one white and one pink instead of two whites. Is it okay? Just bring it in. Is that better? It, it's zoom, I'm zooming. Can you see it closer now? Yes. Okay, I get a better sense. So you so can the, see, like with my cursor, you can see that, you know, there are different sections for different players and, and there are uh, barriers between players and then barrier between the players and the uh, dealer right there. And there's another picture. You want me to pull that one up, Jackie, now? 
That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, hold on one second. Yeah, I think it's important to note that a majority of the table is only exposed to the play or to the dealer. The okay. player really only has a section of the rail where they can stack their chips or rest their arms. Other than that, the access of the entire table is really up to the dealer, not the player. All right. Can go. everyone see the second picture now? Mm -hmm. The players? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it makes more sense. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, and if we're talking about um, just the plexiglass between the dealer and the players, it would just be that front portion we just saw, correct? Yeah. Just wouldn't have the divider scale. Right. Interestingly enough, to look at that divider, if the people are sitting back a little bit, there is no protection. It's really uh, not. Most of the dividers that you get uh, will be further out. These That was just a sample that Encore had. The mm. ones they're going to order are actually longer. So it would, oh, that's good. It they really is up to the. If I, There's sorry. Brian. Okay. Sorry. Ahead, Brian. <laughs> sorry, I do yeah, this in good. order. Um, it really, uh, to to your point, Commissioner, it really is up to the customer. If they yeah. lean far enough back, they could talk to their 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 buddy next to them. Right. But for anybody who wants that protection, there's a good like a wing between each side. It's almost like a clear voting booth. I hate okay. to, it, but it, it almost is like that where it's clear and you can lean in and have complete privacy, or you could lean back and move your chair back and actually see face to face your customer, your, your, your mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. cool. It will be up to the customer to continue to be vigilant and, and mindful of not right. scooting away from the table and looking at their friend. They, they actually have to be up on the rail. Right. Which Brian, is really what a people play. Follow up question, Brian, why not require the plexiglass in the high, uh, high roller? area between um, the dealer and the players i will always uh, what we want to do is offer options to our customers and, and i think seth said it as well uh, some customers may not want that may want to may prefer to have their own table their own table with some friends yeah but the dealer no but the dealer has to be yeah. there and the dealer has to be protected the right. dealer would have a mask and the customers would require to have a mask as well it just seems yeah. like you're a lot, you're making everyone else have the plexiglass, mm -hmm. but is to protect your dealers. But in the high limit area, you're not as interested in that protection for the dealer. Well, we we have it right now, staged for fifty percent of those games up there. I just don't sure. see why that the player would have that option since we're talking about. Um, protecting the dealer at this point with that one piece in the front. I think if you look at other jurisdictions across the country, uh, almost all the way across the country, many do not have plexi or only have it on half of their tables um, and do not require masks. Uh, we would like to go the other way, require masks of everyone, of the, of the employees and the customers, as well as have sanitizer, as well as have those options for those customers that want an extra layer of protection. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo what Commissioner Cameron said, though, is just when you look at it from the perspective of the employee, um, they don't have the option. I mean, they can't come on their shift and say, you know, I don't want to do it unless I've got the plexi. Yeah, I just, I don't see that <laughs> logic, I'll be honest with you. I understand you're trying to um, give the patron options, but I just, it would seem to me in this case, um you know health the health of the dealers is really important here well i will also note that that caught my ear and uh i think that we would just want to note that right now the logic doesn't necessarily uh extend uh, uh but i have to also say if we apply that logic which i i am concerned the obvious is the employee. We're not requiring plexi on the extended boards like roulette, correct? But we're allowing roulette to be played. Correct. Well, that's still that's still to be determined, right? That well, that, that's what right. That's right. Thank you, Commissioner Brown, for clarifying. That's right. But that would be right now. The practice is no plexi for roulette, craps. 
yeah, but limit the players. Limit, yeah. limit on players, um, not on blackjack either. They're not separating. Oh, you would limit it to the you sections would. that you have. The sections you have. Uh, yeah. But there's limits on, on really player numbers for every game in some way, correct, Bruce? Uh, essentially, yes, but the ones uh, for roulette and craps, it limits, and actually in here it says three players for, for the dice games. Uh, for the dice games, it's three players per end, and uh, roulette is three players all together. So, Gail, you see my point. Why I, went I do, I yeah. do, but I, I think the, the difference is it's not really feasible with roulette and craps where it absolutely is feasible with the other table games. And I just didn't see right. the logic in requiring it if you're, if you're, um, you're with a regular patron, but giving the option just because someone happens to be a high roller. Right. Uh, oh, this is saying, I'm hoping I'm not going to lose our meeting. Um, it says, Scott, it says a download. Um, oh, I'm getting a lot of funny things, guys. Up oh. oh. now, I'm back. You're back. Okay. okay, were you getting something as well? That was uh, Scott, and we all sat for a continued. I, I hope so. I'm sure that an IT answer, Scott. Kevin and, and Kevin, and uh, they're, they're actually really busy on their other project. But looks like we're back. There is a really major storm going on outside my window. If you've seen my distraction, so I was a little bit nervous over, you know, that we might get disconnected, but it seems okay. But um, I think that we've raised. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Yes. Yeah, Madam Chair, I, I think if we look at the way the state has looked at looked at restaurants and how restaurants are going to be allowed to have a, an employee that has a mask and customers that are going to not have masks on because they have to eat. Uh, we feel that if the customer has a mask and the employee has a mask and there's a separation of space and everyone's using sanitizer, that that would be a safe environment or a safer environment. That, uh, that's right. If, and if I could chime in as well, sure. um, commissioners, there, there's two aspects to these measures that we're talking about here. I think all three licensees have utilized medical experts to look at what are the key protocols that require you're required to keep your patrons and your employees um, safe and healthy. And that's primarily, you know, that's based on CDC guidance. That's primarily mass hand washing, hand sanitization. And many of these other measures are really patron accommodations to make folks feel comfortable that they're in a, in a place um, they're comfortable coming. And I, I would say plexiglass falls into that. And, and, you know, many would argue guest temperature screening is all there are, they're beneficial, but not absolutely necessary. And so that's why, at least from MGM's standpoint, we are offering that on some, ta some tables, but we don't believe it's, rec we need to roll it out throughout our company um, because of the other precautions we have in place. So I think throughout this discussion, it's, you know, what is, what is necessary and what is, you know, based on medical advice and CDC guidance, and then what is, um, additional measures um, that are helpful, but that patrons appreciate um, and make make the, the space even safer, but again, not absolutely necessary. Seth, I do think there's yeah. a difference though. Um, when you're talking about wait staff going in and being in that situation with patrons, they're not standing there in that close proximity for protracted periods of time. They're coming in and out, you know, and they're going into other areas with different airspace, et cetera. Um, so I do think there's a difference there when you equate to restaurants. And and to, to just echo Commissioner Cameron's comment about, um, you know, the comfort level of the patron, we also have to think about the comfort level of the employee. And having spent years waitressing and having to go into a smoking section and knowing, well, I either take it or I don't get paid. Um, I'd hate to see somebody in a position of saying, well, I either take the no shield table or I don't get a shift. So I don't know what the position is if someone says, I just don't feel comfortable being there without the plexiglass between myself and the players. Is, is, it, is it fair to consider at least offering employees the opportunity to use a shield in addition to a mask if they want to feel comfortable going into that environment? Is that something that has been used or practiced?
Eric or Bruce or any of our licensees? We don't have any information, uh, I don't think, Bruce, from our research that I noticed that the dealers are additionally wearing like the dental hygienist uh, shields, but we could look further into that for everywhere. Not that I've seen anywhere, Bruce. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more, again, getting, getting back to the point being raised about making sure the employees are also coming at this from a place of safety and security. At least having that available to them is something additionally they could do to feel comfortable, whether it's dealing roulette or dealing um, craps or, um, you know, being at one of those tables where there's not a plexiglass divider provided. Can I ask a question to Loretta or Bruce or Burke or anybody? Um, the numbers in terms of columns B and C, what does that equate to in terms of distance between people? Uh, you, that was more just mathematic based on total numbers. Right. I didn't know, but when you're you then apply it to the table. You're not achieving the six foot. Yeah. With those but do you numbers. have a ballpark in what you could achieve? You know, four feet. I mean, like, you know, what's the ballpark? Do we know? No. No, we don't, we don't off the top of our head. No. Okay. I have a question for uh, for Brian. Um, was your expectation, or or, or what happening? What, what's happening in Vegas relative to high limit having none none of those um, plexiglass? Uh, is that Typically, that uh, are those typically tables that have less patrons, just by the nature of the game. Yes, yeah, typically a high limit table that's a, a higher limit. A customer will want the table to themselves, or want to just sit down with uh, their friend, or they want a private table. Um, it, it's just not possible downstairs unless you're slow, uh, and in a lower limit area, we just have more demand. Uh, so we felt like we wanted to have the the plexi there, so we could put more people and more patrons there. In a safer environment, but it, it really we want our, our employees to be safe too, obviously. Yeah, no, and I, I you know all of this is is we, we need to recognize that it's layered of number of things that we are putting on top of each other, so that there's a minimization. Um, I think uh, I, I want us to get away a little bit from you know uh, the, the precise of each one of these. Um, I think that when we we aggregate um, the dispensing of um, hand sanitizer, the temperature checking, uh, you know, the, the screening and communicating um, with all of these other measures, physical as well. And, you know, that there's, at least in theory, an over, a total minimization aspect of things, um, which I think is, is, is appropriate. I don't know that we can hear you, Kathy. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh. The, the silent chair is actually probably pretty effective. Um, I think we just want to follow up on Commissioner O'Brien's question right before Commissioner Zuniga's uh, comment. Um, just if we could maybe get a better sense of the actual footage. Um, between these gaming commissions, it's going to be an important piece of information for, I'm sure, public health experts to have as well. To Commissioner Zuniga's point, I, I mean, I, I am somewhat aligned with that because I'm, you know, a realist. Casinos are opening across the country. We, you know, are committed to doing the very, very best here for employees and the patrons. The idea of requiring, you know, consistent hand sanitizing and requiring masks puts us already a good step ahead of other jurisdictions. What's interesting to me is that plexiglass is seen as an option that's not necessarily from your public health specialist, but rather from something that's psychological. And I think that that's, a, for me, an outstanding public health question. Uh, would they require plexi in 
they certainly have suggested that in the restaurant. Um, at least the, the, the early phase two restaurant requirements, as I understand it, if you can't achieve between your tables six feet difference, you must put up the plexiglass. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm not ready to concede that it's not a public health issue yet, and that it's, that it's primarily for the psychological benefit of the patron and not the physical benefit. So I, I think with respect to that issue, I, I can't say that um, the table games are trickier for me <clears throat> because they're not, uh, they're not, it's not a universal practice across the board. So, but I'm um, terribly aware of what Enrique is saying, and that's why in many ways, I, uh, I'm wondering if the combination of, of enforced use of masks and um, hand sanitizer would actually meet a public health standard. Uh, as well as the um, achieving as close to six feet social distancing as feasible. I actually wonder if they would prefer that over plexiglass because of the need to keep plexiglass clean as well, but I don't want to really introduce that element because I'm presuming that any plexiglass that's going to be put well, up is going to be sanitized. Yeah, and I, I'm, I think the better analogy might be uh, a supermarket than a restaurant where the plexiglass, because that, that checkout person has to stand there with one person after another, and it's a safety issue. In fact, a, a supermarket who wasn't employing that, they were sued and forced to do it. So um, yeah, the employees yeah. didn't feel safe. So I'm, I am, I, I still don't understand the rationale of we're going to make, we're going to have it at the lower levels, every, there's plexiglass between the dealer and the players, but upstairs we're going to uh, let the patron decide. And I just, it just, I still can't follow that logic. I understand there may be fewer people, but I, I think from a protection standpoint for dealers, uh, you know, I just don't understand. They say, oh, I'm upstairs tonight, I don't have it. If I were downstairs, I would. I just don't see that where you are requiring it uh, at the, at the lower level i just I, I just can't follow that logic so i i appreciate mr cameron's comments and of course it's i want to make clear that when has indicated its level um of use of plexiglass mgm has indicated its level they both are different and so we just want to make sure that we don't uh you know assume anything about either I think the use of plexiglass we need to explore further and whether it's something that we mandate versus, you know, incur, yeah. right? Sure, it's, it's every other question. A says it's, A says it's um, discretionary, B and C say it's mandatory. So it's really how we come down on uh, these three categories. But, and, I, and I'm just saying I'm not prepared to, uh, I'm not prepared to take a stance on it because I feel like it's a matter of public health I'd like to understand more. I don't know if, if others are more inclined to want to, to reach a consensus, if there's four or three of you who feel strongly that it should be mandated or encouraged. Gail, do you want to? Yeah, I, I feel like, um, you know, I just, again, I do not see the distinction between um, I'm talking about just the plexiglass now between the dealer and the players. Uh, I am fine with the option of certain tables between players uh, having it and others not, and that's the comfort level. But that dealer who stands there all day long um, or all shift long, um, I just think, uh, you know, I just, I am in oh. favor of, say, B, where we require it between. The dealer and uh, the players. And so, Gail, are you saying that you're going to require um, both licensees to have your position would be on all games or just on? Well, black? The, we we just talked about the games that were feasible. Well, it really I, isn't I wanna, right. So I just want to be clear that I'm not sure that the other licensee was planning on putting it on. And maybe correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Seth. It was going to be optional. But you're saying it would be a mandated.
Is, you're not doing 100% of blackjack. That would, this is up for Seth. Right now, yeah, it's we, not proposed to do we 100%. May, we may end up with 100%. Um, you know, I'm part of this isn't having my lawyer hat on. From a minimum standard standpoint, I'd rather maximum flexibility. And then if our best practice, we decide to go a bit above and beyond that, which is very possible. Um, so we're still we're still working that through. I believe we are going to try to get every um, blackjack table with flexi, but again, we'd rather the, the flexibility uh, from a minimum standard requirement. Okay, so that's blackjack. And any other tables, other tables that um, you're putting on? Mexico? We, we, we would not plan to have it on roulette or craps. Okay. Uh, but all blackjack style setups, we're likely going to. And no support. poker right now. Correct. Okay, and Brian, um, with the exception of what you said about high rollers, we understand your position on that. Um, otherwise, 100% on blackjack tables or uh, was the games. Yes, yeah, the same blackjack style tables. That's correct. And that that uh, has been your plan all along. And no problem. I, I, I think as, as Commissioner Stevens was suggesting, I think uh, the face shield on in addition to the mask conceivably achieves some of the same option, uh, some of the same protection than the plexiglass. So I'd, I'd be interested in hearing if that's, you know, something that is being considered. I, I actually think that some people find a face shield to be uh, confining and, um, and, you know, may fog up glasses. So I think the plexiglass, which is a little, little farther away from a dealer, let's say, is, um, Maybe a better option. Okay, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, I'm coming down on the same side of this as Commissioner Cameron. Um, when I think about the employees, and if it, if if there's a feasibility argument or some other health argument, I'm I'm more than willing to listen to it. But simple, um, it, it doesn't seem to me to be a client choice. Um, the safety of the employee in terms of if it's feasible, I don't see why we wouldn't require it in the circumstances. Mr. Yeah, I um, I, I'm almost coming down on the idea of you know every blackjack table re, you know requiring some type of shield, um, but at the same time I, I'd want the employees who are dealing those other games where there aren't shields to at least have access to a, a face shield uh, if by choice they feel more comfortable wearing it, um, making it available uh, to the employee. We want the employee to be safe as they're dealing as it's been pointed out. They're there for a long time facing the same customers or a whole slew of different customers. So um, at least making that type of PPE available to them if they want it, um, I think would go a long way towards um, addressing everybody's concern. Can I ask one industry question, um, Bruce, Dan? Are all industries um, keeping craps and roulette tables open or are they keeping some of them closing them because they can't provide that protection? I think most of them have as an option, like if a high roller came in and wanted to play, they, they would have available not everyone's keeping craps and roulette open just because, because, of, because of the sanitize, sanitization problem. So that's where I'm having trouble drawing a line and I don't want to draw, um, I don't want to artificially draw a line that would have a big business impact. So I need to understand, you know, if I'm not putting plexiglass on the other tables because it's not feasible to play the game. I feel like the risk to the, the if it's not a, the, you know, the equivalent of the dealers and the employees who are running the games are still high. So I just really want to understand, um, you know, the, the really the need or impact of, of um, the plexiglass. I very much appreciate enhancements like this. So I love that you're introducing it. 
I don't want to penalize you for introducing it. That's my main, my main thinking. Um, because again, if it's really important, then we probably shouldn't have the Latin craps. But if it's if with she, with um, face masks and possibly, you know, I, I respect Commissioner Cameron's uh, uh, description around the impact of a of a, a shield because I I sense that's probably hard to work with. I know that hair salon stylists will be wearing shields regularly, so it's certainly being they're being employed. Um, but I, um, I guess I just want to understand the, the health. So, but I think I'm hearing three people um, would like to see at least shields or more, um, more uh, plexiglass for blackjack. Um, I'm not hearing anything with respect to craps and roulette. And then I'm hearing from Enrique that he'd like to you know, keep, I think, calm A and the flexibility. I thought we were tabling the craps and roulette discussion. We hadn't gotten into the deep. Like my comments were blackjack only because that's oh, what we're talking you. about. Mine too. Um, and so yeah. I would need to understand more, sort of the protections to see if you the company on the others before we move into that conversation. Well, that that and I'm having a hard time uh, just ruling on blackjack alone. If we're going to if we're going to keep roulette, and, so let's talk about roulette and uh, craps. Eileen. Well, I, I'm not really. My my first question was, what are these, what are these percentages of gaming positions translate to space wise? And we don't have an answer on that right now. Okay, so so yeah. the next question really is, let's talk about the machination of the game and cleaning and, you know, what the plans are there in terms of is it feasible? My hair is so long. It's all like. So that's um. So we're talking about distance as well as sanitization of the game. Um, Gail, do you want to comment? Um, yeah, the other thing that kind of goes hand in hand is the position of um, uh, the this is just gonna drag on dealer, on. per se. I learned a new trick. Um, do you know what I'm saying? Yo, oh, you did. How to? Uh, how to? Yes, put someone Sorry, on mute. Because it was a so, distraction. Uh, Bruce, Bruce Band or or Burke, tell me a little bit more about who stand. You know the the um, the risk to a dealer in in craps or roulette mm -hmm. and and players to themselves as you know as com com compared to uh, blackjack. Uh, I I think at craps you you have a lot more. Uh, you know, people there, you have a box man, you have a stick man. Yes. Uh, you, you have the dealers on the other side. So you have a lot of personnel there. So not only is it, uh, you know, a risk to them, but it's also an expensive game for the casino to run. So mm -hmm. it has to be financially viable for them to run that many employees uh, uh, with it as well. So uh, like I say, I, I would be surprised that you would get them running a craps game unless they had a higher roller. Uh, to come in and, and play it. So uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong, Brian or Seth, if uh, you would run it for just like the average guy. I, I might be wrong with that. Uh, roulette, you have one dealer dealing it. Uh, and with three people spread around the table, you you might be in, in you know, easier to, to do at that point. You mean in terms of distance? In terms of distance. Yes. Uh, distance, uh, it really depends what size roulette table you have because there are different sizes. If you have a bigger roulette table, uh, the, the spacing might be three and a half, four feet. In, uh, in roulette, literally half the time, the dealer could, be step, could step back literally parallel to the wheel and right. be more than six to eight feet apart. And yeah. they do work the table. By that, I mean they walk up and down the table to assist with a bet. And of course, to pay off a bet, someone on the far end, they'll walk down and push those chips to them. But then they are more than welcome, I would think, to back up four, five, seven feet away from the action again. Then they have to muck the chips and everything else with that. So they're, they're down by the, the roulette wheel head. Loretta, do you have anything you want to add on this? No, I think Bruce and Burke have a better understanding of the you know, those games than I do. So I don't have anything to add. 
and uh, then in the game of craps, as Bruce was saying, the stick stick person is in the center of the game with his back to the main aisle of the casino, and the players are traditionally right on his right and left pocket. So there would have to be some requirements of uh, what kind of distance he, you would allow with the face mask. And then, of course, the base dealers, if you've ever seen a don't player, um, they usually nestle right over next to that base dealer. So um, craps is a unique challenge. And I think we can provide a schematic of the distances. Uh, I think we had that uh, of the player distances. Oh, you do have that? OK, great. I mean, I guess, uh, Kathy, the, what I would have to add is that if your concern is to protect the employee and to relieve the employee of the responsibility of having to make the decision, should I ask for a shield? Shouldn't I ask for a shield? Should I take a shift at a certain table or not take a shift? You know, then your minimum standard should reflect that concern. And that, you know, may be to require more of the dividers. It may mean um, to start off at the initial uh, reopening uh, with, you know, maybe no craps, maybe roulette, but, you know, that's just what I'm hearing from some of the commissioners with respect to the employees. You know, if you want to stay focused on their uh, minimizing the number of decisions they have to make, you can set min minimum standards to do that. I, I just received a schematic of craps if you got if you folks want to see that. Can you share it on okay, paper? Sure. You want share to see that? Paper. Okay. Thank you, Sterl, for providing this. Uh, is it up there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess that looks here's like the roulette. This, oh, this, no. is, this is dice. Crap table. Here's the stick person, and yeah. down here would be the box person. I think it's the other way around. No, I, I'm sorry, I have it exactly opposite. Here's the box, here's the two dealers, and here's the stick person. Mm -hmm. And these are some measurements you can look around to see what. This is on a 14-foot game. Uh, craps is usually a 12-foot game or a 14-foot game. So the base dealers on either corner at the top, you can see if you put a patron here, that's five feet away. Mm -hmm. um, can you show me that again, Bert, please? Where the page, the, oh, that's where it says patron. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. So that, that looks like that's five feet away from our measurements. So I guess a patron right here, literally on the hook could be almost six feet from either player, uh, either dealer, sorry, the, the uh, stick. It looks like it could be feasible to have uh, one or a party of two that know each other on either side of a crafts game. It may be possible. <clears throat> Meaning the other one, it is another question, which we can table, but um, whether there's gonna be guide lines on like restaurants, the maximum party, a party could come in and want to take a table over maybe in high limits or something like this. Um, is there going to be a max? We do have that now. Um, the, the restaurant limits are at are six, six or six. Party. I didn't know if that's necessarily going to correlate or whether. Right, right. For restaurants, we have it, but waiting right. for see if we have that. Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll make a point, just an offshoot of um, of a point that Bruce Band made earlier, that as he was applying the feasibility um, to the one any one particular game, I'll make it about the overall operation. And I don't know that we're there yet, but I would be interested in, as we layer each one of these uh, requirements, if you will, or guidelines, um, there's at least in theory, um, a 
a tipping point uh, out there, at which point there's unprofitable or unwieldy or too unwieldy or too, um, too much to, to do and to operate. And so, again, I don't know that we're there yet, but that, that's, that's something that's been in my mind as we discuss each one of them necessarily by themselves. There's an aggregate effect here that I think at some point we need to consider. I think that's fair. I think that's what I'm struggling with, um, Enrique, uh, to make sure that, that what the right balance is. And of course, you know, I, I just wish I had a little bit more information in terms of the science on the, on the risk. Um, in terms of um, a, whether we have a consensus on if we're going to require plexiglass for all blackjack um, without waiting for any further guidance, then we would want to probably give that, because uh, I'm hearing from Seth that that, that hasn't been in the cards right now so that would be some a plan that you would need extra time for and if it's going to apply to the high-end rollers which i know brian you did you know i want to be fair to to both the licensees you know brian did indicate that their goal was to provide on all the tables but then did note the exception which of course um we did note that the doesn't regardless of who the patron is we're concerned about the employee but to be fair i didn't want to note that Wynn was going to extend it um, widely the plexiglass ac across blackjack so you might even be further ahead already on that um, plexiglass I don't know if Seth if you actually need more lead time on on you know getting that in place or if you would want to say something I have a uh, someone forward me a picture of a crafts table with plexiglass if mm -hmm. anybody might want to see that oh, sure. yes sure. Yeah. all right here it's we not go pretty <laughs> um oops did i just lose it yes yeah, there it is, there is. Uh, if you, can we just expand it i'm trying to see what i can do with that thank you maybe the zoom there you go there you go there it looks like the dealer right here. Is that a dealer? Yeah. No, that's a picture. The now here's a divider. It looks yeah. like there's a patron over here on third base in a divider. And it looks yeah. like they have room underneath to reach down. You know, very, look, it looks cumbersome, obviously. Yeah. And the box, the box person is sitting over here in between two shields for their base dealers also. So it extends out over the table, correct? Yeah, yes. it, looks yes. like it's, it looks like it's over the table. Now, craps is a game where there's a lot of talking going on and uh, bets are verbalized and bets sometimes are not verbalized as clearly as they should be, which could lead to confusion, pro and con to the casino. Yep. So this could be um, past posting. Yeah, this could be uh, a little tough at times for the casino to understand what bets are being tossed in when uh, dice are in the air, uh, chips are always flowing. Yeah. Commissioner Z Zuniga knows all about that. Uh, do we know where this is? Yeah, Mohegan. This is Mohegan. Um, it says at the top, Foxwoods oh, and Mohegan Sun on day one. Um, oh, yeah, it's a little, I couldn't see it. So Actually, I would be interested in hearing, um, I would be interested in hearing A, if they mandate it in, in Connecticut, and um, B, if we could talk to somebody, maybe you know one of the gaming agents there to find out if in fact there are issues, as you're thinking, Burke, there may be. In terms of right, uh, right. yes, um, games protection. I think that would be a uh, point of emphasis to find out information on that. I think there'd be problems. Connecticut's tribal, though, right? 
Yeah, yeah, we've yeah. been talking to Mohegan Sun and Foxwoods, Gail. We'll, we'll give them another call. And Yeah, we have a pretty good uh, connection at one of the casinos. Yeah, so no, I, I would be interested before we make a decision on this, if, uh, if in fact they mandate it um, and how well it's working out there. Mm -hmm. I don't I think they can mandate fields. it, though. I see one of those. Right, I not, the, the, tribe, the, the tribe may mandate. Being the tribe oh. mandating it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hold on, everyone, because we are talking. We've got Brian. We'll put you on hold for a second because I'm going to go to my three commissioners first. For, uh, Bruce Evans. Yeah, I just look at that setup, and you know, some of those plexiglass pieces extending out over the table. Yeah, have somebody bouncing their dice off the plexiglass screen, and okay. But I'd be curious okay. to see if it's mandated or not. And then Commissioner um, O'Brien? No, that was my question is when you were asking for the mandate, I'm thinking, well, they, they can really decide whatever they want to do. So I'd be curious to know the decision. What was the analysis that prompted them to think this was the way to go? That would be helpful. And then whether it's mandated or not, just how they got there. And then uh, I'm not sure if another commissioner, Commissioner Cameron, did you have another comment? No, I, I okay. expressed an interest okay, so in finding I out. Go, I want to go to Brian who had his hand up. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to say that picture is actually from Foxwoods. They decided to go that route. Mohegan did not. Uh, I've been to Mohegan since they've opened, uh, and a majority of their tables do not have plexi, and none of their craps tables have plexi that I saw. So the two sovereign nations decided to do completely different things, uh, right. and they're five minutes apart. Right. Interesting. Yep. It would be interesting to hear how their patron experience is and how they're if they're finding any um, challenges in terms of enforcement, you know, of the gaming, um, the gaming integrity. So it was interesting when we went to Mohegan. Uh, the customers had the choice to sit down at plexi tables or non-plexi tables, and it was about evenly split actually, and they had the choice to sit wherever they wanted. So I think some people are uh, more risk averse than others. Uh, yeah, I guess I keep getting back to the employees, though. I mean, mm -hmm. right. Despite having plexiglass, Brian, are they still limited to the number of positions per table? Uh, they did limit the number of uh, patrons at dice. Uh, it was three per end, uh, similar to what Bruce had mentioned. Mm -hmm. and what, what about blackjack? Is that three regardless of whether you have dividers or not? I didn't see, but I... I I want to say it was three for the ones that didn't have plexi because uh, they had taken the chairs away. That's what they indicated to uh, Burke and I that they were going to do. Okay, thank you. This is tough, tough stuff, uh, and I know you you're all um, living it every second, and you know we we've been chewing on it, but not with the ability to share among ourselves. So we appreciate everyone's patience. It's. Uh, the fun of us being able to, to talk together. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, Karen, I think I'm going to suggest and, and have my fellow commissioners chime in that we we note, um, I think, some similarities that there's an expression about concern for the safety of the employees. Okay. As, um, and but also looking at the practicalities of the use of plexiglass for at least two games, craps and roulette. Um, and I guess I'd add that just understanding the health benefits of plexiglass, it all makes sense to me that the more you shield, the better. Um, so, but uh, because of the expense associated with it and because of the patron experience, I think I just would like to understand, um, you yeah. know, just it seems so obvious. I just want to understand that if there's any input on that we can get from our public health experts and from the licensees experts. It's interesting to me that you know there was a line drawn at some point by the licensees. And then right. Commissioner, Commissioner okay. Zoom is of course weighing the, the cost um, you know, doing the cost benefit analysis. We want to be careful. In terms of going through each provision, it seems as though, Enrique, that each jurisdiction has had to go through this in, in terms of their guidelines. They're quite, they're quite detailed, um, giving, uh, prescribing uh, on, those, on, on exactly what we're, we're going through. So, 
you. I, I, I can just ask a question just for clarification so what, make sure I'm hearing things correctly is that there is some uh, angst about what to do with the table games, but it sounds as if there's at least uh, the commissioners seem to be open to allowing less than six feet for the table games. It's just a matter of for individuals playing on table games because of where the dealer's position is and where the um, players are playing. It's just a matter of whether we're requiring plexiglass and or another barrier on top of masks. Am I hearing that correctly? I, I'm, well, you know, you can call me six feet today, I guess. I, I'm yeah. not there yet. I, I'm, I'm not saying no, I'm just, I'm not saying that I embrace that. Okay. Uh, and I'm the same way. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really wondering if, if we really are concerned about people playing around games and some games don't have plexiglass and, and they're only comfortable if there's plexiglass and should we not, should we ban the, those games for the time being? So I just don't, I don't have enough information uh, on, on, uh, Blackjack seems to be, there seems to be, as Loretta says, some kind of a minimum that perhaps we can all get comfortable with, even though the licensees may not love us for it. If we all have plexiglass around the dealer, all dealers, we might be comfortable with that. That's what I feel like that's a potential consensus. Enrique, what do you think? I, I think that's a fair characterization. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's not unanimous, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, I think, um, you know, again, I begin, I begin to worry about the workability overall. Um, if we're really concerned about any one instance um, about transmission, let's face it, we should consider whether they should reopen at all. Um, and so what, what instead, what we are trying to do, I would suggest, I, I, as you did earlier, is to layer as many protections as are feasible to minimize the overall, um, you know, the overall risk. But as somebody who's done and thought about a lot of risk management in the past, we're not going to bring down the, the risk to zero. Let's just, let's just face it. Um, and, and, and that's true for every other industry. It's true for every, for, for the state, what the, what the governor is going, going down, uh, you know, must be evaluating. And so, um, you know, what, what we're left with is the workability of each one of these. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that we're make, we've, we've reached a point uh, in, in which any one of these is unworkable. I think it's all a matter of, you know, ultimately the cost-benefit analysis. Um, but I guess that's my point. If I could ask the licensees a question, Seth and Brian, what would be the lead time to order, you know, if you had to order more plexiglass, what kind of lead time are we talking about there? Well, <clears throat> it's in very high demand right now, as you know. Um, it, it would be, we would need lead time. I don't know exactly how much, I mean, we're, we're having some installed now. The, the reality would be that we probably would have to open with less than we'd like to. Um, and as we're able to roll out additional plexi, um, be able to open those additional games. Um, because I, but I, I can't pinpoint an exact lead time, Karen. And I, I did want to make one other point. Um, you know, I, what I'm hearing a lot of, and, and it's very fair concern, we have it as well, is the focus on the health and safety of our employees. I know we as MGM, and I'm sure Penn and Wynn are similarly situated, that protecting our employees and their health, health and welfare is a top priority. Um, so, you know, we perhaps in the meantime, after this discussion, we can provide additional information about the measures that, that we do take with respect to employees. An example, uh, in Tunica, when it reopened, there was no requirement of plexiglass or face shields. We offered face shields and made them available to all of our dealers in case they feel more comfortable with them. Um, very few, if any of them, decided to use those, but we, we had them available. Um, and it goes back to my theme of minimum guidelines and, and best practices and flexibility to 
I think Commissioner Zuniga's point, a layer approach. So we, I'll, I'll find out and get to the commission to, through staff um, any such measures with respect to employee, you know, options for employees and, and what our policies are around their comfort level um, because it's something we deal with um, every day and we're very committed to. So I just ask, um, I'd like to clarify too, um, the states that mandate plexiglass for even the blackjack, I just would like to understand that. And, and I think it's important to realize that we are one of the highest states when it comes to uh, our numbers and the cities in particular. So uh, something required at another location may not be exactly um, the model we want to look at. We need to look at this particular state and region and um, take as many precautions as possible. And, and again, it may well be that this will be resolved uh, by the state. The, again, not unlike our last discussion, it's the lead time that's, I know, difficult. Um, I think the lead time is probably more of a an issue for, if I'm guessing right, MGM right now than when. So um, it would, if you didn't, if there was a supply issue, it would probably mean that you just wouldn't have as many open tables at the beginning, if that was an issue. Okay. okay. So what I do also want to comment on the, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to rely solely on, we offered a protective a piece of equipment and it wasn't widely asked for because there is sometimes a stigma to asking for it when it's not mandated. Maybe you don't want to be the person with the face shield when everybody else doesn't have it. So while I can understand that may be the experience, I also think we do need to think about sometimes minimum uniformity just eliminates any risk that someone isn't going to ask for something they need or feel comfortable wanting. So for efficiency purposes in moving this discussion along it sounds like for both table games and for slot machines we are looking to go back to the governor's advisory board and or any other health officials to get that answer is six feet six feet or can it be less than six feet if there are other protective measures in place that's really the threshold question i'm hearing from from you as commissioners am i uh and then, and then the next one would be if it's less than six feet and, and, uh, and because it's unlike slots where you're looking at a machine rather than interacting more closely with a dealer and other patrons, is a mass sufficient to protect or should plexiglass be used? Yeah. Or not, neither is sufficient. Or okay. does time also weigh into that? I mean, it may be they say plexiglass and masks, you can go 10 minutes and not worry about a thing you get past a certain point and now you have a problem. Okay. Yeah, and that's, and, and at these table games, you're gonna be there, as you pointed out, for Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner Brian Long. Okay. Because it, seem, it seems as if with, you know, with the, with the social distancing, we need, you're looking for that, further clarity from on that uh, group of questions before you can really move forward. Our licensees won't be able, if it's six feet, if it is six feet with masks and, and it must maintain six feet, it does not sound like it would be feasible to really run any table games. Am I right? I'm saying on the heads of me. So okay. I would probably say so, but you know, that, and I'm seeing the same thing uh, on my game. It, it just wouldn't be feasible. There's no way to get six feet the table games. Well, then what about Rhode Island and Mississippi that have the six feet rule for the slot machines? Uh, Bruce and Burke, do you know what they're doing with table games? Not, not totally, but they, uh, they do have table games from what I understand. Are you, are you sure that Rhode Island has table games, Bruce? Uh, no, not not a hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure. I, Mr. I really meant to check that last night, and I have to say, it, I just didn't. Is Pat Patrick still on the the call? Rhode, Rhode Island, Rhode Island has table games. Yes. Yeah. Open now. Oh, they, oh, open now. Okay. Yeah, yeah I know they yeah. have them, but I'm I I can't remember um, 
if they decided to keep them shut down. Does anybody have that? Uh, my, my notes say Mississippi has a three chair max on the blackjack style tables with the corners and middle seats remaining at the table and other seats from the other seats removed. Okay. And Rhode what? Island? Westy just texted me that Rhode Island does not have their tables open. Yeah, that's Our right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, <clears throat> there we have uh, a, another comparison. So that there must be some information out there to help us understand this better. All right, um, uh, Lorette, I'm going to have you help me. Um, in terms of social distancing on table games, do we have any outlier provision? No, nope. it looks like we covered all of that. Should we go back to then to our overall occupancy issue? I think so. I think we've, you know, worked our way through slots and table games and then back to page three uh, on the occupancy. Page three, and, yeah. All righty, uh, because I think Commissioner Stebbins, you had raised the, the, the valid point that when we're talking about occupancy, we're, we're, now that we've gone through the exercise we have, we do know that there are going to be less, less um, players just by virtue of even if we you know, make some fair assumptions, we know there's gonna be reduced players. Um, and if we make the assumption of, let's just say for the sake of today's discussion that it, it is every other slot machine. So let's say it's a 50% reduction in slots. We can have some kind of a reasonable discourse in terms of table games. I don't know how you figure that out. You know, a, a, a third or something. But I think we can turn to our licensees to help us because you've been thinking about this long and hard. So in terms of occupancy, uh, Loretta, why don't you just go through it again at a sort of high level and then we'll start our dis discussion. Sure, so at a high level, the A column relied on building code occupancy levels and calls on you to set a percentage of the building code occupancy level for the gaming floor. We've got some of those numbers in the footnotes. MGM's number is 7,480. PPC and Encore may want to update their numbers. I, I'm not sure if you have updated numbers. You saw this chart the other day, and, and uh, if you do want to update your numbers, I suggest doing that orally now. Um, so Loretta, have, um, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Um, I just, if we could get back to you on that tomorrow, we're okay. just having our architect look at it and make sure that it, that it incorporates the uh, traversing areas as well. Okay. And same with you, Lance. You want to get back on that number? Same for us. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so the numbers that we were working with are, are reflected in the footnote. Uh, the percentage level offered in column A is 50%, but obviously you could uh, uh, you could um, you know, add, uh, use a, a different percentage. Um, we'd have to consider if you use this formula, uh, the uh, employee uh, levels as well, uh, which then the licensee could extrapolate when it's counting uh, guest entries um, and their plans are required to address that, you know, how they would do the accurate count on the guest entries and how they would manage the uh, queuing uh, for entry and what they would do if they reach occupancy level uh, and uh, potentially need to turn uh, people away. Uh, the uh, B and C uh, levels, uh, rely on the number of a percentage of the number of gaming uh, table uh, number of gaming positions, uh, which takes into consideration both slots and table games, depending on what formula you use from columns B and C earlier. 
you know, plus an additional percentage um, uh, of what was offered here was the 25 and the 10% uh, in columns B and C respectively. Uh, column B uh, talks about a, uh, an optional reservation system with the idea that that uh, could help for planning purposes. Column C uh, calls for a requirement of a, a timed uh, reservation system. And I know the licensees do have, do have some thoughts um, do have some thoughts about the, the requirement of the reservation system. Which we, we addressed a, a, in connection with the um, earlier discussion on time yeah. and contact tracing. So commissioners who, if you have a uh, position or do you wanna hear from the licensees first on this? It looks like Gail's suggesting the latter, like the latter hear from the licensees. Oh, yeah, I'm, trying. I'm trying to unmute myself. Yes, I would like to hear from the licensees. That would be helpful. Licensees, are, can I impose on you? Lance, I, now that we've gotten to that table game discussion, can we start with you? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I don't know that we have a strong preference, I'm sure, between the, the difference between the two calculations. You can still arrive at the same number just because the your doing gaming positions times X, or if you're doing simply a percentage of capacity. I will tell you that as I understand it, I believe certainly the majority, if not all jurisdictions, as I understand it, though I, I certainly may be wrong, are deferring to capacity and taking a percentage of building capacity. But that said, don't, don't necessarily have a, a strong preference. I think you can get to the same place using either calculation. I'm sorry, though, Lance, I couldn't quite hear your final statement. So the, the, they, are, they are not doing the, um, the occupancy based on the building code, but rather the gaming position? No, they are. They are deferring to building code and okay, building sorry. capacity. Thank yes. you. Yep. And that is our understanding as well, that uh, most of the other jurisdictions have gone with, with the building code occupancy. Um, our concern about making it, tying it to the gaming positions is if you include employees in that right now, we might be over at the 25% even. Because uh, so many employees are going to be on the floor, we're going to have security, you know, increased security. Um, we obviously have, uh, our games are spread out, I think, more than some other jurisdictions. So we've got a lot of free space for people to uh, circulate within that. And in terms of the reservation system, well, we've got- can I, just, what, can I just, before we do that, could I go to Seth on just yeah. MGM's sure. question? Thank you. We, you know, we much prefer the, based on billing code, it's more consistent with what we're seeing in other jurisdictions. It provides enough cushion to accommodate um, you know, household guests who, which we see a lot of, um, you know, say couples who come and one person's playing and the other's is there. Um, we want to be able to accommodate that, which, um, so if you're looking at 25% on top of available positions, if you look at, you know, guests kind of on and off the floor plus employees, it's much, much tighter. Um, we'll probably come under on, you know, almost a daily basis. Um, I presume every day come under 50% of our building code with our limited operations. But again, it gives us that um, flexibility uh, to adjust. It would be much, much more challenging um, because we're going to have to control, by the way, um, and I could be more of an issue with MGM than the other properties, but I think it's similar. Um, to control the floor capacity, we're really going to have to control access to the facility because we have a carpet tile once you're in, you're in. And so it's really going to amount to how many people come in the door. Um, that's how you're going to control how many people are on the floor. Um, we have no other real way of doing it. So um, it's important to have that, the cushion of the building code capacity uh, numbers, or else we think we would probably need a higher percentage on top of the, um, the gaming positions. Right. Questions, commissioners? I had a question about the number. Um, 
I know, so MGM's number came in as, is that the entire gaming facility capacity? No, that's just the gaming floor in the South End market. Okay. And so the other two numbers, Loretta, what are the ones that we're looking at for PPC and Encore right now? The numbers uh, for PPC that came in, um, uh, and uh, Joe Delaney helped uh, with the plans, and I think in discussions with the licensees as well, were without any of the uh, food uh, uh, stations. So PPC was just gaming area at 5783 and uh, Encore at the uh, almost 17,000. So those came in from the plans, from the architectural plans. Okay, and then in terms of what's being carved out to add, that's the, just the seating areas that would be open or any restaurant seating area? Uh, my, understanding, but my understanding is that the open seating, seating areas, not the restaurants. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that. This is not theoretical restaurant space capacity. This is actual space that would be open. That's my understanding. Okay. okay. Questions? Do we have any disagreement with the proposal from the licensees to rely on the building code occupancy rate? I I'm just not sure. If, I mean, if you don't, if you have less, it depends on whether table games are open or not. I don't know. To me, yes, you can have other people, but if you have less gaming positions, and part of that space based on that, I'm not so sure the 50% makes sense to have that many people milling around if there's no food being served. I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not so sure I'm there in 50%. Um, totally. so could, we, could we do this? What if we said it's the percentage is still up for you know, discussion, depending on the other? Or is that too vague? It will be based on occupancy rate? I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, 50%. That assumes everything's... Yeah, I guess the question would be, is there any realistic possibility you're going to get any new information that would change your mind in the next x number of days or is this basically it and do you have yeah, so you're going to have Eileen's point is that if table games are not part of the overall if they're they're not running then they're, then you would have more people who are just milling around right. Possibly, right as guests or patrons who aren't even gambling and of course, that's a concern because if they can have a drink and then they start to gather. Could I, the only thing I would add, if I could, yeah. commissioners, is so. one of the ways we will control social distancing and, and the six foot rule is through um, access and building capacity. And so just because, you know, 50% of, in our case, um, 7,400 doesn't mean you know, on a, on a weekday, on a Tuesday, we would have, we would let 3,700 people in the building. That would be, would be very crowded and we wouldn't be doing social distancing. So um, we're committed to controlling our capacity um, to allow for social distancing based on um, what we have going on. I, I, I think at some point we just have to have an upper limit that, um, we're often going to come in much lower than that is reasonable and allows us to have guests, employees during, you know, the busiest times where we would still, you know, be, be doing social distancing. Eileen, would it, I would agree it with, oh, go ahead, Jackie. Sorry. Um, I agree with Seth. I think uh, it's incumbent on us to monitor the uh, social distancing once people are in the building, but what we are trying to also provide for is if someone, for instance, wants to uh, eat at one of our restaurants and traverses the casino floor to get there, that, you know, once they're in the restaurant, they wouldn't count for that, but all that access into the casino floor, um, you know, uh, would, would count towards that. We're uh, looking at implementing a system uh, throughout surveillance to count people. So uh, we anticipate that the accuracy should be quite high. Is there a simple math calculation when you look at 50% um, and then you look at the square footage of the gaming area, what, how many feet between everybody there would be? 
I mean, can we just do a simple math that confirms 50% would give you plenty of space? Uh, actually, we have a meeting set up to do that tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm also wondering. You know, I understand some people would be in a group, so some would be clustered safely together. Right. But it sounds like Eileen, it, just to uh, see if there's a simpler way, if, if, it sounds like if that is in fact the case and there's enough room with 50%, you'd be okay with that, how, with the caveat that if there are no table games that we would put in there, that that expectation would be that that percentage would be reduced. Is that how you're feeling? Well, it's mixing the two though, right? Because the, and I, I welcome anybody else's thoughts, but part of it is assuming, if not full capacity, close to, I mean, every, no one has poker, but for the most part, everyone's trying to get at least some or most of their table games going. Yep. Um, my, my concern is the milling about factor if you don't have that, whether that would adjust that percentage down for anybody. I, even though I know that reference point is coming in in the other two categories as a calculator that's not relevant to. Okay. Building code occupancy. Uh, I, Eileen, I think I think that's something that could be monitored. Um, my guess is that they could. I, I don't know what the science. Uh, the one thing I've observed in, in in grocery stores is that you know they they reach some point. I don't know whether it's they twenty five percent. Whether they I think okay. Twenty five percent. Whatever, whatever it is, and then they manage the crowd. Of course, one comes out, one goes in. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any given point, you may be at different contacts. You know, once once you're in, um, and I think that should be um, part of what's given to licensees here. Um, you know, the, the the notion that depending on what ends up happening with the games and how many people end up either go into a game or go into a restaurant because there's not availability or there is, or whatever the case may be, that if they see a lot of congregation in the, the corridors, let's say, because there's not enough um, gaming positions available, that, you know, that in, 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 in order not to get to that point, they start limiting access, um, which number, which keeping to the point of, of a particular, um, overall cap, I don't know, it make, makes, makes me wonder what might be the science be, behind that. But but I look forward to the information they're meeting tomorrow on this. Yes, There's and I think we can, I think we can qualify it enough to say 50% or whatever numbers uh, achievable is that, that we're, where the social distancing can be maintained, you know, some kind of a, a, a condition. In other words, 50% of the occupancy level sounds just fine to us right now, but as Enrique points out, how the, how they, the uh, patrons convene and what it looks like, if that number is too high to maintain social distancing, you're gonna have to make adjustments. So it should be, there should be a, a kind of a condition. It's a conditional um, to, um, provision. Do the, do, I know the restaurants have to keep tables, you know, six feet away, et cetera. Do they have an overarching capacity percentage too or is it just purely based on like spacing i think it's based based on the six brian's six shaking six his feet. head no do brian do you know the answer to that or yeah it's, okay. it's six feet there isn't an occupancy and jackie it's outside please, too please correct me if i'm wrong but I, I believe it's just six feet or if you can't maintain six feet between tables you must have a six foot six high, foot high plexiglass right okay that retail has a uh, limit that's it, retail is at 40 percent 40 okay so that's why they're actually monitoring the number of guests so perhaps um loretta we can do something that gets with the language that gets to the concern which is that the 50 percent of the occupancy level will work provided that the licensees maintain you know in, work to enforce the, the six feet distancing. Because it's kind of, it's just very hard to, it's hard to imagine how, how the flow of the patrons is going to work. It's yeah. going to be a real challenge for the licensees. Um, you know, if they have the six people clusters who came in together, that's one thing. But if the right. three of the clusters start to convene, you're going to have a challenge and it's going to be up to each licensee to work to separate them. 
And I guess not unlike when when they first opened, uh, they, they 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 made a lot of um, adjustments to the gaming floor, the mix of tables and games and slots. Uh, my guess, I can only guess that um, there's gonna have there th there will have to be some period of time to adjust. People coming at the times and the games that they're preferring. Karen, do you have enough on this one? I think we have kind of a consensus on this point. Yeah. Okay. Again, we're not voting today. I think we're, we're, we're going to where we have very thorny issues. Cleaning and sanitization, uh, Seth, I, I've been practicing that word. <laughs> so have I. Yeah. I stumbled over it every time, and I was so uh, privately pleased when I heard you too. Um, so, on slots, and then you have it also with respect to table games, and we'll just assume um, that plexiglass will be used um, when we're thinking about, as in some contexts, let's assume plexiglass is part of the, the overall plan when we think about sanitization. So, Loretta, do you want to walk us through this uh, slots and table games? Sure. Uh, so, column A. Uh, differs from B and C uh, in uh, column A talks about uh, standardization being required at a minimum level uh, frequently and at regular intervals. Column B expressly is of every four hour requirement and column C is expressly uh, every one hour requirement or when the chair turns over uh, to a new player. Um, and I believe the other items um, in column A, the other three bullet points carry through to B and C, and there's a difference in C on uh, signage, uh, reminding players. So making wipes available to players and C adds signage, uh, inviting players, reminding players. Uh, that they can uh, clean the chairs and area themselves as well. Now we did already have highlighted a supply issue, potential supply issue with the wipes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we talked about today uh, the question on the requirement of a log uh, that, you know, a detailed log of every machine would be uh, uh, not a good use of resources. Uh, um, but a requirement that you know generally cleaning shifts uh, and zones cleaned uh, could be um, could be logged, but in a per machine basis uh, was probably not an efficient way to go about it. So, just as a premise of reminder, that uh, we've been told that interestingly enough sanitizer for your hands it seems to be more readily available with also a reminder that we do have Massachusetts companies that are have kind of pivoted in their businesses and are making these supplies so we want to honor that as uh, Commissioner Stebbins pointed out but you are short on the wipes if I were to go into the casino and I hadn't seen when it was last wiped down and there's no wipes available could I ask to have it wiped down? Yes. I know, go ahead, Seth. No, you go ahead. I, yeah, I, 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 think, I think you could, and we there's, there's additional, um, I mean, EBS is, they're cleaning regularly. Um, there's obviously disinfectant solution that EBS is using, and so, um, the short answer is yes. Um, you'd you'd have to find a person, and they'd have to make the request. But yeah, we would accommodate a a customer request to wipe down a machine. And and likewise, well, you know, fortunately, we've been in a position where we've been able to source wipes, so we will make wipes available. Um, but of course, any of our customers could ask uh, for assistance in wiping down a machine at any time. We're also going to have a system set up where it 
uh, alert our uh, PAD, which I think is Seth EBS, uh, <laughs> to come and, and make sure that they rotate frequently through and uh, the time is, is uh, there to wipe down the machine. I, I'm wondering. I'm, I'm more concerned with the turnover than um, necessarily an hourly clock. Just because if it's slow and nothing's going on, I don't see the point in making people wipe things down when nothing's happened. It seems to be the contact that's the issue. So, you know, a, a combination of regular intervals and a no event later. You know, and when a player turns over, a machine turns over seems to be a more effective guideline. And Commissioner O'Brien, I think that's something that we've learned uh, from Las Vegas and our experience there is setting an hourly time limit in some cases is too much and in other right. cases isn't frequent enough. So. Right. That's why yeah. I asked my question because I figured if I sat down and thought, I don't know, but if it's every four hours, am I in hour two and a half? You know, I'm sure many people will try to bring in their own wipes, just like we do on airplanes now. Um, but I just wondered if somebody uh, was particularly concerned, could they have, you know, some people are going to feel comfortable just using their own hand sanitizer. You know, that's enough for them. But the accommodation could be made because otherwise the hourly thing sounds a little bit arbitrary to me. I would agree. I would. I would think just, you know, for the for the patrons' use, if they want to wipe down the machine themselves before they use it or use a hand sanitizer, is fine. And I, I, I guess I'm expecting our licensees will have enough uh, folks on the floor to keep an eye on when a machine is being vacated or a patron's leaving the machine that they can give it a quick wipe down before somebody else uses it. Um, I also think the log is a little too. Uh, uh, burdensome, and I'm not quite sure what information it would get. Yeah, I think it only makes sense when you have a timed protocol. I think right. if we're not going to do that, it doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. Right. I guess the only thing a log does, though, is the person knows they have to verify that they did it, so they do, in fact, um, conduct that cleaning. So even if the log is every four hours, but, and I really, you know, uh, I know, Seth, you said there may be an issue with um, enough wipes, but um, I think the way it's worded here is sanitize, uh, to sanitizing wipes to be readily available for guests wishing to wipe down. I mean, it would seem to me, you'll just make your best effort to get those wipes out there and, um, and people will see them and use them as they see fit, right, in between. Yeah. So I'm I'm comfortable with um, here. I just I would I'd love to hear more about the the log though because I knew I do know log helps log do help people if you know you have to sign for it you kind of you're going to do it kind of a thing. What what, what were the thoughts on that? I understand an hour is is very burdensome. How would a log every four hours be? So I think the issue with the log was uh, just ensuring what, what you were looking for, clarifying what you were looking for. So for instance, um, we do think it would be overly burdensome to have a log that's attached to each machine and have- Oh yeah, no, all. But correct. Just, what we could do is provide, you know, here's the cleaning schedule, here's the rotation, here's the zone, and I think that can be, we can achieve that. Yeah, that's right. Your procedure. Right, so that person who conducted the cleaning, say, a few times on the one shift would have to then kind of certify that they did, in fact, do that cleaning? That, that's fine, yep. Yeah. So are we leaning towards something like um, column A, but say at regular intervals, but no less than? When a player when a player leaves a machine or a or a gaming position, well then that, that so that's a different that would be different. So either yeah, I'm kind of I'm almost going to extremes. I'm almost merging A and one little bit of C in that. 
I'm sorry. Uh, I'm almost I'm... merging the regular intervals in A with the reference to or upon a player leaving. Yeah, so that the interval is measured when the player leaves as opposed is, to it. Is that hard? Gail, you're hard to keep track of though. I mean, you, you have a cleaning person trying to observe a, a whole batch of slot machines and somebody, you know, you have people who like to move frequently. They feel like the other machine's going to be, you know. But I just so thought I just they said they had a, that's, I thought they said they had a mission, I mean that it triggers when the slot turned over. Someone I gets it up. Triggered. No. Ryan, do you want to explain the way the system works? Yeah, it's, it's basically a timer for each zone. So when, uh, if you were on a regular interval every hour, it would alert you that zone A at 10 after needs to be done, zone B needs to be done at 20 after, and it just continually pings your uh, unit that's uh, attached to your wrist and allows you to remind you to go clean this area at this time, at this time, and it keeps you on schedule. Um, it oh, does not- It's it, not it, device specific. Yeah, it does not have the ability to tell you when somebody gets up. Right, that's what I thought. So that would be um, very would be difficult. difficult. Yeah, which is why having the wipes there for the individual users yeah. makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. Right. And, well, what we're hearing is that there might be a wipe shortage. Uh, let's assume if there's a wipe, there's not, if they have wipes available, they put wipes out. Um, if they don't have wipes available, they would at least, if somebody wanted it to be wiped down, a request could be made. Um, they're not gonna say no to that. But what about turnover? Um, how often do we want to know that the whole machines were sanitized, even if there were 15 players or two players? Is it based on an hourly rate or is it based on usage? It sounds like usage would be really hard to monitor. Yeah, I can imagine scenarios in which usage is very hard. I mean, I, I, can, I can also imagine on a slow time that it would be feasible. Um, but uh, I, I, I think it's unwieldy to try to require every turnover. Okay. I kind of like, I I like this. Sure. It's, even gonna, it's even gonna change per section. So some yeah. sections are very busy and some yeah. sections are not busy at all. So it would be very difficult to manage. Yeah. Yeah, I, we'll, I, I'm kind of interested in Brian's notion of, you know, a timed cleaning of each section and you know invite staff that if they see a patron get up and leave that they go over and clean that machine like your commissioner Cameron's point of giving them the responsibility to have to track every player but if they visibly see somebody get up and leave go get a quick wipe down uh, if you see the patron depart so to the licensees, would your plan that you're submitting to the Gaming Commission as part of this uh, sort of indicate your cleaning plan to that level of detail? Because if that's the case, maybe for this for this process, the, the protocols, it would be enough to put the um, requirement under column A frequently and at regular intervals, but you're still approving the plan. So you could still look at the plan and make sure the plan makes sense for the property. Would that help? Doing it that way? Anyone? Um, that, that sounds fine to me. And I just, um, again, I just would love some clarity on, I don't know that we heard from Lance about availability of wipes. So we're good with wipes. Um, okay. Where we're struggling a little bit is the, the touchless um, hand sanitizer. And so filed all under PPE accessibility, but uh, unlike MGM, we have been able to procure wipes. Uh, uh, I guess also unlike MGM, we've been unsuccessful in procuring uh, touchless hand sanitizer. That's, an, that's interesting. Yeah, so it sounds like Um, and Seth, you tell me if you can get the wipes, then you you're going to make them available, right? Yeah, absolutely. For those who choose to use them. Absolutely, and we we have some wipes, but we're using them first. I we're not confident that we have enough to make them readily available to all patrons um, at this stage. We mm -hmm. have a limited supply, and we continue to try to procure more. If we can get them, we'll make them available. It's also important to point out that that doesn't mean that just because they're available, the machines are going to get wiped out. The patrons will choose to do it or not. 
So right. I guess really the underlying issue we have to help the licensees with because we care about some level of knowing that they'll be sanitized is this somewhat of an arbitrary decision around intervals unless we do something very concrete which is every time somebody vacates you have to wipe it down versus some something based on no less than a certain number of hours and well, uh, could you do some combination of you know you know in, a, in any event no greater than x as sort of a generous gap you know and or individually wiping down any used seats in terms of you have some and maybe this is not workable for you guys, but there's a gaming table where two seats were used, that was it. There's no point in wiping everything down other than what was used, or is that too cumbersome? I think on tables, that might be a different analysis than slots, because that might be that they, when they turn over. So should we just stick with slots right now? Or is that what you were thinking? Because okay. I, I feel, is, is it the same plan no matter what? Well, else? you have the benefit of having a dealer at each table and a pit boss at each table. Right. It's right so there. more eyes on the table than... Um, they might wipe down more, right. right. That's my understanding. So if we could just stick with slots for a second. Um, it sounds as though the group cleaning makes good sense. Um, what are other jurisdictions doing? Is it basically every four hours? Or is it basically every hour? It, it varies, and I think it varies between the different licensees in the jurisdictions. So, um, you know, I, I think as we're learning more, we learned that one hour may be too frequent, and um, there was a lot of wipe down of unused machines. So I think it's some combination of training our employees. If you see someone get up, please go and wipe down that machine. Otherwise, you know, do a, a, do a regular rotation. Right, I'm seeing, I've seen that as well. I think Indiana has, uh, they have something interesting of uh, no fewer than a ratio of one dedicated cleaner for every 50 positions and every effort to disinfect machine as soon as patron ceases to play. So that's a different model. Most of the jurisdictions have the requirements to increase uh, frequency uh, of cleaning, um, more specific things on table games as for the reasons we uh, talked about um, uh, and also in there requiring the submission of plans for more for fuller details of the cleaning protocols. Uh, Indiana has taken a little bit of approach now they only have I think um, three casinos in the state. Is that wrong? Is it three, or is that Michigan? Indiana has 13. Michigan. Indiana has 13, right? So Indiana's taken a little bit more of a um, approach that uh, addresses your concerns, Commissioner O'Brien. I like how Jackie presented the training that to encourage interval uh, cleaning around use, but then have some, but no less than. Um, a cleaning every certain amount of time, and it's a full cleaning. Um, and also with the right cleaning agent. Could, oh, Commissioner O'Brien, was that a hand motion or no? No. <laughs> um, the only thing I would note for just while we close out this topic is whether, um, particularly given that it do we do we want signage to, to let people know that they can ask for the wipes or not? It's just something we haven't talked about. I thought the wipes were going to be a bit there if they if they have them. If there's a supply chain for them, will they be category C? Just category C has this bullet mandating signage, letting customers know that they have the right to ask for for the wipes or, or a cleaning agent. So do we want signage or just general information to, you know, the patrons coming in? Could it be signage already available? So they're either there or right. if you can't get them, you can have a sign that says you can request them? Because if it's there, you don't really need to have right. much signage. Right. 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 But if MGM is in the position of not being able to put them out, then would you have the sign that says, <laughs> yeah. you can ask. <laughs> yeah, but we, but a cleaning agent. I mean, we could have a cleaning agent that just 
supply chain issues specific to the wipes themselves, but I, I think it's less of an issue committing to upon, you know, if someone requests to have a, a, a cleaning agent available, we can manage that even without wipes. All right, because it says signage to remind players um, to sanitize machines before use or asking a slot attendant to do so, but if it's, that's not a wipe necessarily, it's just a sanitizing agent. But otherwise we don't, the other two don't remind them to use it, it's just available. So the question is, is the patron expected to do the wiping? That's kind of the implication. Yeah. Yep, that was my thought on, on uh, making them readily available, sure. I mean, the signage was just over and above that and right. the option of, or, you know, reminding them they can ask for staff to, to do that for them. Right. Okay, we need us. We need to know who is most comfortable with what. Gail, what are you most comfortable with? Um, this <laughs> um, I, you know, I think we've given them uh, the licensees um, quite a bit of direction here. I mean, I'm comfortable with. Um, I like the idea of okay, say it's every four hours, but encourage your staff to. Uh, if they see someone, I mean, that's a training issue, please just go wipe that machine if you see them leave. Um, also, uh, having wipes available as much as possible. Um, and, you know, however we let people know that they're there, they'll see them there and they'll use them as, you know, everybody's gotten accustomed to doing for the most part. So, I'm, yeah, I don't, I'm uh, comfortable with, um, it's, it's, not exactly A, B, or C, is it? It's, uh, but I do actually like, you know, even if it's a log that's easy to manage, just so the staff knows, I have to sign off that I did this. Um, I do like that too, and maybe that's just a four-hour thing, you know, just so you know it gets done at least that amount of time, and then people are going to be vigilant about looking for people leaving, and secondly, the individual patron has the availability to clean the machine as well. I, I'm leaning, just so you know, I'm leaning toward giving them the opportunity to say, you know, if you see there's been a, some turnover and there's an opportunity clean, now I know that probably not the cleaning that might require an additional set of hands, but to the extent it could be used, I think it's always great to do the turnover, but otherwise no less, no less frequent than, you know, if, I just don't know if it's two hour or four hour. I guess four hour makes sense. It's in column B and it was proposed. So that's where I would I would go with um, with the idea that there's also going to have wipes to the extent they're available mm -hmm. and hand sanitizer. Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, I, I agree with what, what, what you just said. Uh, yeah. I think that's a workable. Uh, personally, I think, uh, uh, you know, I'm a lot less concerned about transmission through objects, but I know there's a lot of un, undefined um, science here. Uh, I think I think the the overall riskier part is when when you're in close proximity to somebody who's sick. But um, but I think particularly to this cleaning and sanitation, I think it's perfectly fine the way you just articulate. Yeah, Bishop Stevens. Yeah, I'm. I'm more in favor again of you know making wipes available for the convenience of of the of the patron and if there are supply issues then at least making staff available or staff can be called over to clean down a machine um, training the staff to see a position getting vacated and trying to uh, to give it a quick clean you know the 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 kind of block of time uh, you know, two hours or four hours, I think is helpful, but, um, you know, two hours, you know, four hours on a Monday morning is going to be different than four hours on a Friday night. So, you know, it, it's more just kind of keeping up with it. Um, and, you know, that saying we clean things every two hours or every four hours, that's more, I think, to just offer some comfort to the patron that, we're staying on top of keeping the facility clean more than it is trying to limit contact. Michelle Bryan. 
Yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, if you say something like uh, cleaning at regular intervals and in any event, no less frequently than if you wanted to put, you know, four hours in and train employees to, you know, try to go wipe down at turnover, um, have the sanitizing wipes available and signage, if not available, that they have the right to ask someone to wipe it down. I think that kind of covers everybody's ideas. Karen, you got enough on that one? Are you good, Karen? I apologize, I didn't realize I was muted. Yes, so I have, just for the summary, is casino staff to sanitize operating slot machines and chairs frequently at regular intervals, a minimum of every four hours. Uh, sanitizing wipes, if available, uh, licensees to effectuate best efforts to be readily, readily available for guests wishing to wipe down slot machines and chairs before using, or signage to tell patrons they can ask, uh, and then the sanitizing solutions complying with the CDC guidelines, and then a log to be maintained to, tra to track slot cleaning using a zone and schedule, not per individual machine. That's my summary. Does that comport with your understanding? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think you got it. Sounds good. Even better. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yep. Then let's go right to our, our cleansing of the, the table games because it's just a little bit of a different analysis. That's on page now set five. Yes. Yeah, so the first so the first bullet point in that section on page six. Uh, talks about the guest use of hand sanitizer in column A is guest sits down and is encouraged to use the hand sanitizer and B and C is the guest is required sort of as, as Brian indicated okay you're, you're here here's the hand, hand sanitizer uh, you need to use it. Um, there are uh, measures for uh, cards and chips and column A uh, gives uh, most flexibility to the licensee uh, and ask them to use alternative, identify and use alternative procedures to minimize touching, whereas B and C says must limit, must implement uh, uh, limits on touching uh, of cards and chips to the extent possible. There are uh, chip sanitization um, uh, measures on each of the uh, columns. Uh, a and B is on a daily basis. C is every two hours. When we really talked that through with the licensees because of the uh, ways the chips are utilized and they can speak and, and Bruce and Burke can speak in more detail of it. Uh, you know it may be that uh, daily uh, uh, sanitization of every chip that reaches the cage uh, is uh, a more feasible uh, way, but we can uh, invite their comments more uh, on that. Um, uh, with card uh, replacement or standardization, column A, uh, ask the licensee to deal with that based on the volume and frequency of their play and their plans would address that. Uh, with um, uh, and I guess I, 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 so that's A and B as well and then C is replacing the cards with every new dealer. The next two bullet points in column A carry through across A, B, and C. A, B, and C. And then the last one is the sanitizing the dice after each yes, shooter. Yes, yes, after each shooter for B and C. Can you, can everybody remind me on um, one point, um, Jackie was going to address it earlier on the occupancy level where we have that um, extra provision around counting guests. Can we just make a note that we need to go back to that? Um, I, don't, I don't want to forget, I had circled it. So, How do we want to get started on this one? Um, I think, Commissioner O'Brien, you were addressing uh, the idea of a sanitizing the, the rails and the chairs, which are different than 
um, the slots, there is a provision that in this in this case it could be a requirement of sanitizing chair and table ra rails when player leaves the game. And I guess a new game a new player approaches the game. So that was a requirement of sanitization as opposed to it's not in the first two it wouldn't be expected that the the dealer would be wiping things down. Seems to me that Beth, what is it? What are you doing now, um, Brian or Seth, in terms of the table games for cleaning out in um, other jurisdictions? Uh, we're just doing it more frequent, frequently than we did previously. So on a regular basis, similar to the slot approach. Yeah, but not necessarily every time a chair is vacated. No, and, and certainly to the previous comment, if someone requested it, uh, like MGM, Seth, we would do the same. It would be easily to get somebody to come over and do that for someone. Yeah, yeah that's the same, increased frequency. And then what is, we'll start then with the encouraging of this hand sanitizer. We touched on this earlier. You know, do you encourage, do you require? It's a real, much more of a touching surface. I know that Commissioner Zuniga has mentioned that there's some evidence that the virus doesn't transfer as easily through surfaces, but of course, these are issues that the industry is addressing. So, is there any reason other than a medical reason why we should not require people to use hand sanitizer? If they have a medical condition, we wouldn't impose it, but it's just, is encouragement enough? Can I see, do you think encouragement is enough or should we or not address it? I think encouragement is enough. You know, if you put somebody, if you offer somebody, uh, you know, a, a squirt of a bottle, you know, they, there will be the occasional person that says, you know, thank you, I just did it or whatever. And most, but most people will take it. Others thoughts? Is is anyone else requiring it or I think that it's a one is it are they going around and just squirting if you want it? As opposed to we don't leave the hand sanitizers at the table. So it's only the um, dealer that has it, right? Is that right? Brian's saying yes. I actually think at MGM our approach would be to have the the bottles on the table available. Okay. Um, and not have the dealer squirt into the hand. Um, oh, it would be sitting but, on the table. All right. Yeah. And then um, Brian, you know, the dealer. And they wipe the table down? <laughs> yeah. And then they wipe the bottle down? Yeah. <laughs> Brian is otherwise saying, if you ask for it, like if I put my hand out, the dealer would say here. And then right. Yeah, the whole idea is that you don't touch the bottle. So if someone right. else squirted it there, it would be touchless. If right. everyone touched in the bottle, you'd have a problem. Right. That's, I'm more comfortable with that idea of potential. one person dispensing as opposed to, and it's just an extra touch point. Your hands. Yeah. If you touch the bottle and then you sanitize your hands, it should be okay. I take the sanitizer, then I sanitize the bottle and... <laughs> yeah. Wipe it on the plexiglass. <laughs> it goes on the plexiglass. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it's hard, but it is it's so serious too. When we think about the numbers, you know, we can't, can't let this discussion, because it seems almost surreal that we're talking about it, in any way reduce our vigilance when you think about what is happening and the potential going forward. So, you know, it's, it's okay. This is where these decisions, Loretta, you didn't create this out of the blue. Other jurisdictions have been um, struggling with these types of provisions. So here we are. So, um, you know, I think we we'll at least know that hand sanitizer needs to be available at table games and, and available upon request. Mandated would be hard to enforce is what I'm assuming that you would all say. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Next one on the um, alternative procedures to minimize touching. I think you've, you've really 
focused a little bit on that when you spoke about the provisions for plexiglass with respect to blackjack, and then the challenges on the other um, on the other games. So I think we could um, on number on on A and B on that. Uh, and Loretta points out that B and C make it a requirement. But it says to the extent possible. Okay, so I'm going to say, I, I know it's really getting late. Everyone, hang in there. Um, on on number one, we're we're all right. We've gone through that. Karen, you're good on on the yeah. first bullets with respect to the second bullet. Are we comfortable with what is put forth in um, B and C? because it does say to the extent possible, or do we want to just use the softest approach in A, may use? If I say, I'm gonna say, how about B and C? No or yes? Okay, Eileen says yes. I'm I'm, I'm comfortable with, uh, with B where it says the, the limit, you know, to the extent possible. There's, there's in fact already a lot of games that limit the, you know, the handling of cards, for example. Um, but the reality is that some chip, that chips is, you know, is currency, and 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 that's, you know. I frankly don't see much difference between A and B and C. Yeah. Between B and C are the same. They're the same. <laughs> that's why I just said let's go with yeah, the B and C is the same. Yeah. 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 I think the language to the extent possible is a little yeah. stronger than may, so I would be more comfortable with that language. Yeah. Okay, so we've got Gail, Eileen, and me, uh, B and C being fine. It's just on that provision we're not adopting above. Uh, Bruce, do you feel the same way? Are you seeing it says limit the touching of cards and chips by players to the extent possible versus may use alternative procedures to minimize touching. One is stronger because you're instructing it's a limit. Yeah, I'm comfortable with the extent to the extent possible. Yeah, it's that language on the end. All right. Um, above in, in, in C, uh, it says sanitize the chair and table rails when player leaves game. That is not addressed in A or B about the sanitizing. Am I wrong? Um, no, no, it's not. It really. The, the um, it really was captured like in routine cleaning, regular cleaning, increased cleaning in the general me measures at the end of the document. Do we feel strongly about when when the tables turn over that they that there should be uh, a wipe down or if somebody or if they have wipes available that people could wipe their own chairs? I think it would be the same. Actually, Go ahead. I'm, I'm more concerned about the table rail than the chair. Um, I feel like that's like a more, more more of a touch point than the chair itself. So you could draw on the slot procedure that there was a consensus around of you know, increasing the cleaning, making whites available for the yeah. player to do himself or upon request a staff member could do it. I'm very comfortable with that. Are others comfortable with that approach? Yes. Yeah, I am too. And, and I agree with Eileen about, you know, that, that it's a touch point part, the rail, that if anything is, is the concern. Like the slot machines, you know, they're, they're being touched constantly. Um, so, you know, otherwise, I think it's diminishing returns. licensees doing is everything okay all right thank you um, now going to um the chip the, sanitization if you yeah want. chip sanitization that's a, a difficult process i understand and i think it might be helpful if you heard about the process uh from uh from the licensees or, for, or from bruce does somebody want to, this is a, um, sure. is, I'm sorry, um, 
we have um, we've gone through a lot of different we've looked at a lot of diff different techniques in order to implement this and so we went from literally sanitizing them on the table which isn't as effective or efficient to um, new machinery that we're looking at purchasing putting it in the cage and sanitizing them as they come through the cage and so that would be when they go to the cage it's after it's not necessarily while they're being played right it's it's, right. it's an interval clean cleansing right so the idea would be you know you've got your chips you play with your chips we understand that it could be obviously mixed up during that process if you win and lose but uh when you take your chips and you take them to the king to uh uh to turn in uh those chips would then be sanitized uh so you'd be putting essentially clean chips out constantly very very similar approach from mgm yeah the idea is that we just continuously uh, clean chips coming through the cage. But we, we could not accomplish cleaning all chips every two hours. It is, I don't I know that would be. I understand it actually, it was a matter of the integrity of the chip almost got affected by trying to clean them at the table or something. Is that right? That discolored them or something? Uh, we didn't have, it, yes, there's a lot of different issues. The chips have RFID. Uh, inserts that we had to be really careful in terms of the materials that uh, are available to clean the chips. And then we found um, this new machinery, which we think is going to be more effective. We also, also think that cleaning the chips in the cage um, will, um, will be safer in terms of uh, the integrity of it. Yeah, I, I'm okay with that. I think uh, there's a lot of chips at any given time in, the, in a table that never get touched during the whole day, um, just depending on, on the game, and that the ones that come in and out of the cage are the higher, the ones that did the most. So getting them there and, and putting out, you know, every time there's chips that go back to tables, those are, you know, newly cleaned. I think it's a good process. Anybody? Yeah except have any kind of additional input on that? I Okay, so I think we have a consensus there, Karen, on, on sanitization of the chips. Now moving on to, sorry. Then there were a couple general measures that carry across increased frequency of cleaning, focus on high touch areas. They carry across all three columns, make hand sanitizer and wipes with signage available in the pits carries across, and then you have the issue of the uh, dice in columns B and C with the measure of sanitizing after each shooter. And I have seen that that is being required uh, in a number of jurisdictions. And that's no problem for us. Yeah, no problem. I, our approach would just be to give new dice to each shooter rather than sanitize. So we have a, a, a that's easy. And otherwise, no objections to the other ones. Licensees, no objections. Okay, good. Well, so then do you have to deal with the sanitizer place cards? Yes, we did not go through that. Um, oh, wait, I'm sorry, did we miss that? Oh, we had minimizing touching of cards, you know, right. limit, limiting the touching of the cards to the extent possible, and right, developing protocols uh, uh, for A and B, developing protocols to replace or sanitize cards based on the volume or frequency uh, of their uh, play. And then column C, thank you, uh, thank you, Eileen, was uh, placing them with each new dealer. So what are you guys doing now? Yeah. I think most of them are just going to, to replace them at the end of each shift. Is, is that what you're planning to go yeah. with? Yeah. That's, what, That's what it. I, yes. When you say shift to the dealer, I take it you mean like? Yes. Yeah. It wouldn't be after each dealer because they rotate through, uh, you know, move down the, down the pit that way. but. Uh, with players touching them and everything else, it makes no no sense actually to do it after each dealer. Got it. 
so the so the description in the A B of develop and prioritize based on volume and frequency makes the most sense. Yeah, it, 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 you know, as soon as you get the cards on the table and the players touch them, that they're contaminated at that point. And Commissioner O'Brien, to Bruce's point, af after they're used, at that point, after the ship, we just destroyed the cards. Right. That's mandated. There's, Don't there's we no require cleaning. you guys to do that or something? Yeah. Correct. Further questions on the, I'm sorry that we, we skipped over the cards. Any further some, uh, player, some players handheld games, the uh, cards are exchanged and replaced more frequently. They're not 12 hours. It could be four or eight hours. So uh, some of the handheld games have different time requirements anyway, which would be okay. uh, good. Do, do you expect on that, on that point, do you expect, uh, you know, Brian or, or Seth, that there will be many handheld card games? No, there's no poker, and we're going to minimize any touching. And yeah. Bakara, uh, we destroy the cards every single play. Okay. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then, barring any further discussion, I think we've gotten through sanitization. Just so I can confirm, so you're comfortable with the protocol to replace or sanitize cards based on volume and frequency of play, A and no. B? I think it's the C one, isn't it, Eileen? No, it was um, the description they gave was that um, the A and B description makes is more applicable than the C. Oh my God. Well, that's but good. This is for the, for the cards. I just want to make just sure. Just for the cards. Just for the cards. That their protocol to say that so the A and B is. I would highlight that. That's what we would go with. Develop protocol to replace or sanitize cards based on volume and volume frequency of play. Okay, got it. But actually, they won't sanitize; they'll be replacing. Correct. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Hard to sanitize. Got yes. it. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. But I figured that there might be a way. When I read that. Tricks for everything. Alrighty, let's go to the cage then. Okay, so the column A in the cage again gives most flexibility, would require the licensee to do one or more of installing the protective barrier between guests and cage employees uh, in combination with uh, possibly installing the partitions between cage windows and or closing alternative cage windows to allow for the increased distancing or other me methods as approved by, uh, by the executive director. Uh, and on those measures, columns B and C both would require the partitions between the guests and the cage employees would require either closing alternating cage windows or installing the plexiglass between windows for distancing. Uh, and B and C also include that the cash would be provided in enclosed envelopes upon request, or I'm sorry, B is upon request, C is enclosed envelopes. Uh, there, then there are measures on disinfecting the counters and touch screens. A is frequently and B and C are hourly. All three columns require hand sanitizer being available in the, near the cage area for patrons. All three columns uh, require protocols to maintain uh, the six foot distancing for queuing. Uh, and interactions in the cage area with uh, signage available. So Loretta on the cash, is the only difference between B and C that B says it's in an enclosed envelope upon request? Yes. And C, it would just be done as a matter of course? Yes. Okay, other than that, B and C are the same, right? That is right. Okay. And, and Loretta, you took this from different jurisdictions that are doing it one or the other way. 
That's right. Everything here appears in some plan of a jurisdiction. Nothing was just uh, created by us without having seen it somewhere. Um, uh, so they all exist someplace um, with, again, you know, allowing the flexibility in the first one to come up with the combination. Um, and, you know, we did, I, I did see this combination of requirements in multiple jurisdictions, you know, it's kind of self-explanatory, The you know, the plexiglass, removing windows or adding plexiglass if you're not going to remove the windows. Um, maybe it'd be helpful to just hear from uh, our licensees what they're doing now elsewhere. Sure. So we are, uh, well, we do intend to add plexiglass uh, for, the, for your recommendations. Can I just ask about the, the social distancing? Is there, are we, are you able to maintain six feet at all times under scenarios or are we dealing with a social distancing issue as well? Are you talking within the cage or with respect to patrons waiting outside the cage? I guess probably both. I don't know. We haven't talked about employees yet, but I really was thinking at least on the outside. On the outside, we will have markers for social distancing requiring people to uh, stand six feet apart. Uh, we'll have stanchions uh, set up for that purpose. And, and laterally? Um, so that's in the queue. They'll be six feet apart, but next to each other. How is there? There's a possibility of being another patron at the cage at the same time. Correct. Um, I'm trying that to. That is where the closing of the altar. Oh, everybody's speaking. Right. I'm yes, sorry. Sorry, that's where the plexiglass would be um, put up to protect them. Between, the, so it would be six feet in a row or some extension out. Correct. Is that needed for MGM and? Uh, in yeah, the, we 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 don't have a large enough cage to do every other window, um, so we we plan to use plexiglass um, external of the cage, um, laterally between and and between the guest and the cage employee. And then at PCP. Yeah, we do have the luxury of likely going with every other cage window open, and we have already installed the plexiglass in between customer and uh, an employee. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. So, in terms of the differences, um, the cash how it's provided, I feel I feel as though we're we are looking now to B and C because the plexiglass is being put forth by all of you anyway in some fashion. So if we look at B and C, um, the differences would be how cash is presented. I'm not sure what the general practice is. I, you know, I just know money is generally dirty. Um, uh, in terms of germs, um, but it's going to be a, it's a cash-based business, so money is going to be counted and exchanged and touched all the time, correct? And so then they get paid off, paid out their amount of winnings, and the idea is it can be put in a envelope in order to protect them from what's likely to be quote unquote maybe germy money. And then they can bring it home in an envelope and it can sit for a while. Is that the idea of why it goes into an envelope? I just want to understand the thinking. Brian, are you investing in, in some of those dis uh, money disinfecting? We have two units that were supposed to arrive today, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be able to disinfect all of the gas. Um, I, what we intend to do is count out the cash in front of the customer, which is required and then offer them an envelope. I think some people will wind up taking it out of the envelope and just talk. We're gonna have a big, huge pile of envelopes, uh, to be frank. 
Um, however, I think they should be available for customers that want it, and it's very thoughtful and it's protective. So I think yeah, it's so the, the idea is so that they just aren't touching money that could contain germs until perhaps a later time when the germ supposedly is. That's correct. I just wanted to make sure I understood they wash their hands, or they can wash it. Get to a place where they can wash their hands. I understand. Got it. Okay, so that's a. Um, so really, it's a question of if you do B upon request, or do you mandate it with everyone? It sounds like Brian's saying we might have some other issues with people touching an envelope and then tossing it. Yeah, I like the idea by request. Yeah. So. Okay. Good consensus on that. Hey, got it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, and then it's really frequency of disinfecting, right? Yeah, disinfect counters and touch screens frequently or hourly? Hourly. You would like hourly, Annie? Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, I think it, I'd, I'd ask you guys, um, it would seem to be a more frequent use area than maybe some of the, you know, mandating every area or machine be done on a frequent basis. I don't know if hourly is too frequently or whether that's fine with you guys. Doesn't seem onerous, but you can tell me if you think it's too much. I guess uh, we'll focus once. Yeah. <laughs> We're fine. I think They're all, hourly, hourly works. Are there. Yeah. So it's so hourly is fine. More often. Okay. Yeah. So say at in you know frequently and no no greater than hourly or no no less frequently than hourly. No greater than hourly. No greater than. No less frequently. No, no less. It. No less than. Yeah. Until it's time for me to stop. <laughs> they all need to stop. I know. I appreciate everyone hanging in there. So close. You know, yeah. it's so close. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, but again, I'm just a reminder none of this is it's too little. You know, none of these are too little. So, everyone, thank you so much. Um, so, I think. What we just said hourly and no less frequently than hourly okay um and you know what if something becomes impractical yeah. come you know we we all we we know how to get in touch with each other so um make uh hand sanitizer i think again there's a might be a supply issue but this seems to be something that's recommended across the board uh loretta correct um the hand sanitizer seems reasonable um and then the I think I already uh, had asked the question around the queuing. It was actually, I was actually thinking my concern was next to each other, but the queuing, you'll, you'll do what everybody's doing, keep, keep the crowd um, with, with markers on the floor. Do we have any other questions on the cage? There really were very few differences, correct, Loretta? I didn't That's miss right. Them. Okay, good. good. Just to be clear on the cage, we're giving you the option of the plexiglass dividers or closing off a window if you have that flexibility or that capacity. As long as I think the six feet is maintained, that was, I think, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought that it, if there it can't be six feet between, then they would use plexiglass. And where you actually can achieve that, right, Lance, by because you have more you can. space. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank I you. I think all three of them said they intended to have the plexiglass, right? That was, I think you're going to use plexiglass in the in front. In front. Lance, but not necessarily on the side. That is correct. We've got uh, we've got enough space in that cage to do every other window, which will provide uh, more than six feet. Right. Thank so you. to the side, don't plexi, in front, plexi. And then for the others, you're going to have to have it on the side as well. Correct? We're going to do both, front and, front and sides. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Uh, these are general um, measures could have probably been put into optional forms too, except I think that, Loretta, you made a judgment call that these are are relatively standard across jurisdictions and so we should just go through them and if something sparks another thought because of course the problem in doing this at such a late hour the problem is the omission but i know that loretta's and the whole team's uh process was so thorough there's probably very little that could be omitted 
But the other thing is, is if there's something that the licensee sees that just isn't workable, then we should just hear it. But these, um, you want to walk us through them? I'm looking now at page eight. Sure, and many of these on the standardization, you've in signage, you've seen throughout the prior uh, pages, so we can go quickly. There are a few elements that you haven't seen in the other pages, so I do think it makes sense to go bullet point by bullet point so we don't miss anything, uh, but I will try to uh, draw your attention um, as well as you'll know the things we haven't discussed already today. So. Uh, on additional measures for the gaming area, sanitization and disinfecting products, as well as hand sanitizer, touchless where possible, will be made available at each point of en entry and exit and throughout the gaming area for usage by guests at their discretion. And I'll just move on unless anybody stops me. Mm -hmm. now, if there's a big, I'm going to keep my eyes on the paper, so you have to do a verbal okay. objection. Okay. Next is enhanced cleaning and sanitization throughout the gaming area with staff deployed regularly to clean and disinfect restrooms and high touch point locations. The next is signage at each point of entry and at prominent locations throughout the gaming area to remind guests of safe practices, including frequent hand washing, use of hand sanitizer, proper wearing of masks and to stay home if sick. Uh, on that one, Loretta, does it make sense to tell somebody to stay home if they're sick, if they're already on site? Go home if sick. Okay. <laughs> I think there's actually- Although we may have covered that in our initial screening and entry. Right, right. Yeah. Actually, okay. the state has developed um, standardized signage for that. Okay. Uh, Okay. Moving on, in areas where lines normally form or are expected to form inside or outside, signage combined with other methods, including an appropriate level of staffing to remind guests to remain six feet apart. I, I have a, that all makes sense. I have a general concern, obviously, about each property and how they're going to handle queuing up of guests that arrive uh, when they've reached capacity and how each licensee plans to deal with that. They don't need to share those plans with us, but that'll be part of what I'm looking for. Moving on, casino staff to implement and monitor procedures for elevators, escalators, and stairs to ensure social distancing. Loretta, right, just on that one, and it's just a technical thing, it, it, it might not be casino staff, but it'll be. Yes. So that's actually, uh, and it's really to uh, Commissioner Stevens' point too, and I know Commissioner Cameron's raised it in earlier meetings, the, the challenge of the enforcement. And we, we started off, I think Commissioner Zuniga started the, the meeting today with enforcement measures. So I think the, when you say it may not be casino staff, to oh, I think it might be hotel staff, hotel security. We don't, okay. yes, just that. Okay. So that's important yes, to know staff. because, of course, we also have just the staff. Codes, and so we want to make sure that there's a clear understanding of you know of how these measures will be enforced. So I think Commissioner Stebbins, you were just suggesting we might want to see that plan fleshed out a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, that was really about queuing up on the inside. I mean, you know, we've been privy to some uh, guidelines that will be instituted for our own building of, you know, no more than four people in an elevator and we all have to turn and face the wall. So I, I, I worry a, a little bit to your point, Madam Chair, about the enforcement piece of, of some of those uh, areas of the property. And those, and that would be a, a, I think, if I'm, if I'm guessing correctly, that those restrictions are applying to you in the hotel um, through the governor's advice now. So you're already addressing it. So um, it will just be also who encounters it, and if it escalates, what's the, what's the plan? And that's, and that's all part of our training procedure that we're going to implement before we open. Um, 
so it will be detailed in a plan and uh, we can provide that to you. Right, and then uh, Commissioner Cameron, that would, we'd want to, and Commissioner O'Brien, we'd want uh, to understand, you know, make sure that our GEU you know, understands that plan and their role, so if, if any, right. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Um, Okay, we are in the middle of the page at uh, provide appropriate receptacles for disposal of PPE. Yep. Next is no promotions or activities that challenge the ability to maintain the six foot social distancing. Yeah, that one we're having, that one's got a big asterisk because we need to understand that because already if we, there's a possibility that we've discussed activities that challenge six feet social distancing if we if activities includes playing a slot machine right i think what i envisioned were promotions you know giveaways uh that sort of thing okay. um you know out, outside of the uh normal operations that we've already gone through okay, thank you I guess, are we gonna even have those kinds of activities at this time? Yes. It could be giveaways. Yeah, I, I think sure. there's ways to do it safely, but you know, more in terms of giveaways, less in terms of big events. Okay, great. Ballet service? No ballet service until further notice, although we did have discussion yesterday uh, that there may be access, uh, disability access issues. So I'd suggest um, that that would be updated to, you know, unless to address a, a disability access issue. And the guidance actually, so it's in the operators of lodging safety standards. It says um, that ballet can be provided um, to accommodate physical or geographic constraints in order to accommodate individual guests with disabling conditions. Great, thank you. Good, good, thank you. Next is, I'm sorry? No, no, just gonna start the next one. Each licensee's plan. Shall detail procedures for dealing with guests who are non-compliant with the required COVID-19 related health and safety protocols. Again, this is on the enforcement piece, so. On the, yeah. Okay. Next is each licensee's plan to outline measures to ensure air quality, including possible filtration upgrade to increase fresh air and ongoing inspections and maintenance of HVAC systems. And we got great reports on that at our last meeting when they went through their plans. Okay. Next is each licensee's plan to identify anticipated supplies needed to stop furthering the spread of COVID-19 and measures to ensure the availability of supplies. And that should, that's really, should, I'm missing a bullet point. So that's the end of that bullet point. Okay. Next. Loretta? Yeah. If you could, could we, could we back up just a minute to the non-compliant guests? And we've talked about it, you know, the enforcement piece, but I think We'll have plans, but I think um, I just want to make sure we're on the same page that, you know, at least MGM's plans, and I presume it would be similar at the other two, would be that if if someone's non-compliant, we'll tell them they're non-compliant, they're going to need to leave. If they refuse to leave, we trespass them. They still refuse to go. GU needs to come and arrest them for failure to abide by a valid trespass order. Um, that's really the process that's going to be uh, employed in any um, situation where there's failure to follow the rules. That's one of the reasons I mentioned earlier, the requirement versus encouragement is a unique issue for our property, given the nature of casinos and that we have law enforcement on site and how we deal with those. Um, I do think there will be uh, an increased demand on GU interaction, um, hopefully not substantial, but um, you know, witnessing just anecdotally, you know, going to supermarkets and other places, um, uh, I see every day that goes by fewer and fewer people using masks and people getting closer together. And so um, I think it's a, a real issue that we will need to work closely with GU and be prepared 
um, for that, depending on how strict we're enforcing all of these. Yeah, and I think there may be, uh, in the same way at the supermarket, who may have never, you know, hired a security guard before, but had to hire security to uh, make sure, you know, that the measures of, you know, wearing the masks and any altercations around that uh, were under control. Since some of this can be anticipated, uh, having you pay attention to your security staffing uh, levels, because I think it is contemplated as you said in the first instance, uh, uh, casino security uh, uh, being uh, to, you know, to deal in the first instance uh, with this, but certainly law enforcement is on site uh, and it would be prepared to step in. But it, again, uh, you know, asking you to anticipate any uptick in your security needs and staffing accordingly. Yeah, and as, as to, you know, the GEU stands ready and able to assist as needed for public safety, but I think there is an expectation that we want to diffuse situations, not escalate situations. So uh, coordinating with the, the licensees and their security departments to try and manage these situations without having to bring in law enforcement would probably be better across the board as much as possible just to uh, prevent escalation and prevent contact as much as possible. And we'll just, we'll have to see, see how it goes, but continual feedback between the departments, I think would be helpful and seeing what works. But uh, to Loretta's point, making sure there is sufficient uh, security there to make sure that they can effectively diffuse situations and move people along as much as possible. Uh, so moving on, um, in the bottom quarter of the page, each licensee's plan to detail procedures for managing guests with fevers uh, uh, and or who exhibit other symptoms of COVID-19, including maintaining a supply of the non-touch thermometers for this purpose. Next is each licensee to designate and identify for the commission a key level employee to act as liaison to federal, state, and local public health agencies. This liaison, the public sa uh, pandemic safety officer, shall be responsible for notifying the local board of health as well as the commission if the licensee is alerted to a COVID positive case on the premises to assist with data sharing and identification of individuals for contact tracing. Uh, since it's 24 seven business, the uh, individual may designate uh, others on staff to ensure responsiveness on a 24 seven basis. And the person shall work in conjunction with the compliance department uh, to maintain a, a record of all material con communications with public health authorities uh, related to uh, COVID-19 at the gaming establishment. I have a question on that. I just want to make sure that I understand it's a 24-7 business, but I want to make sure that it doesn't get so designated that the, the, the chief um, pandemic safety officer is not always apprised of an incident. In other words, you know, I really want the accountability to be with a single individual. So while that individual may not be on the premises and, and somebody else may find out the news of a diagnosis, that individual, it, the, the responsibility of, of it getting processed all the way, way through stays with the, the initial um, uh, designated pandemic uh, safety officer. Does that make sense? It does. We've actually already designated our pandemic safety officer. He's very pleased with his new title and he's very senior in the organization and uh, he will take care of making sure, we'll make sure that it's, it gets to him rapidly. Right, because of course, if it's a 1 a.m. diagnosis, how to get to the local public uh, uh, health department, it's not going to happen at 1 a.m. anyway, but it just needs to happen in timely fashion. Um, and so that responsibility should lie with one individual and they can, they can manage their responsibility appropriately. Excellent, thanks. Who is the okay. senior level person designated, Jackie? Brian looked awful Krause. happy there, so. <laughs> <laughs> not Brian. <laughs> no, it's uh, Eric Krause, who's our senior vice president. Um, oh, yeah. 
and uh, I work very closely with him, as does Brian, and and so and we will connect to the compliance department. And we thought that he's the one who's been in touch with the uh, public health department and um, the Everett um, uh, Department of Health. So it's appropriate for him to to handle. Yep. Thank you. We know Eric. And a couple more in this category, each licensee to obtain and follow legal advice to ensure appropriate safeguards in the event of any HIPAA protected material. And each licensee's plan to include protocols to be implemented if the licensee is alerted to a COVID-19 case on the premises, including a deep cleaning of affected areas. There were some additional measures moving on uh, to protect the game sense uh, area, uh, requiring the licensee to install protective plexiglass barriers on the counters with an opening to allow the items to be split underneath, to place markings and cure de queuing devices at appropriate locations to assist with the distancing around the game sense areas, and to uh, make sure that those areas and inform staff and security that those areas are reserved for game sense related activity except in an emergency. We did include on this document some employee related measures as Just yes the game sense, but they um, the game sense uh, areas will be cleaned at the same rate as the rest of the gaming floor correct. That's yes that would be part of the that was part of my understanding as well as. Okay, great, thank you. Can, yeah. All right, moving on. Okay, with general employee related measures, and I know that licensees have already uh, submitted uh, plan draft plans uh, and are expected to submit a more detailed plan, but. Uh, so they are expected as businesses and employers in the Commonwealth to follow all the guidelines by the CDC, Department of Public Health, Governor's Office, we can put the local boards of health as well, and the guidelines set by the Gaming Commission. Must provide employees with training, COVID-19 specific training, which provides an overview of the mitigation protocols, including disposal of PPE and recognition of COVID symptoms. Again, identifying the pandemic safety officer, this time identifying the person to all employees and encouraging any employee who has a COVID-19 related concern to report it to the pandemic safety officer through a process to be implemented by the licensee. At each employee entrance, requiring employees to undergo a temperature check. Also at each employee entrance, uh, placing markings or queuing devices and or queuing devices to maintain social distancing of employees reporting to work. Posting signs, setting forth a checklist of the symptoms, instructing employees to remain at home if they experience any symptoms. Signage in back of the house, reminding employees to follow CDC, DPH, and again, we can put local uh, Board of Health guidelines for hand washing, using sanitizers, wearing masks, and staying home. So those would be reminder, reminder signage. Establish protocols to maintain social distancing in the dining areas, uniform areas, shared office spaces, and other high density employee areas. Posting rolling periodic announcements in the back of the house to remind employees of all of these COVID protocols. Requiring employees to wear masks while performing their duties and well, providing, right. yes. Sorry, I'll go, go ahead and finish and that one. Also providing masks for empl all employees. Uh, just, Loretta, is there any need to um, focus on the employees who may or may not have to wear gloves? Uh, we could put that in. It's um, 
you know, my understanding is that, you know, gloves are required and provided for all employees whose jobs require them to wear gloves anyway. Okay. Uh, we could certainly add that. No, as long as it's understood. I, I didn't know if any of the any of the new requirements would require additional wearing of gloves by employees, but it sounds like it's pretty understood at this point. When, when we've gone through that, it, um, I've, I, I'm on, of the understanding, but correct me if I'm wrong to the licensees, that anybody who would be required to wear gloves under a COVID protocol was already required to wear gloves under their normal work protocol. Correct. <laughs> It's just going back to, I'm not sure if it's under number, the, the, the light, the, there's no number, the um, uh, bullet, the second bullet on page 10, the licensee shall also establish protocols to maintain social distancing for high density areas. Yeah. I know they asked this question the last time that, uh, or close to the same question, the last time we met around, was a round table discussion, but there was a quite a bit of discussion around the back of the house area with the use of the computerized bars. Are those gonna be what are used to for the drinks now, are the computerized bars in the back solely? Are you concerned about, the servers will be making their drinks then, correct? Or will there be a separate bartender? No. Okay. No, so it, it's the servers. The servers each have a, their own unit that they'll go up to. They'll punch in their number and put in the drink code, and it'll you know deliver the drink, and then they will be the ones who take the drink uh, back to the guests. So they bring the drinks, and theoretically, because they're holding it down low, that it's all safe. Correct. The employee. Well, and they're using. They'll them. be required to wear a mask, obviously. Um, but they're not mixing. Then, okay, so there's none of that, those concerns about touch points, but then there's a queuing. Do you worry that you might have your employees getting kind of stacked? Because yeah. you know, the back of how? Well, because it's, if I understand correctly, you have what, three of those bars? And so we have the, the bars are actually. Oh, Brian, sorry. Sorry. We have seven of those bars that have been converted into machines, and, and all of those drink dispensers, there's four per station. So as Jackie was saying, they shouldn't have to wait as they used to wait in a long line for one bartender. Now we and, have whole machines in every bar. And now I remember that they actually get their own, pardon me? They're actually spaced apart quite significantly. So there's, you know, I'm just thinking back to, I haven't measured them, but it, it, clearly they'll have uh, ample distance between the machines. Before that night or during their shift, they will have their own area. That's my understanding. Yes, Ryan, can you confirm? So they're not cross-contaminating machines? Uh, they will most likely, uh, when it's busy, they may have to share with one other person. So if we have eight servers in one bar and there's four machines, two people would be sharing. So we would have the ability for them to have wipes there so they could wipe it off if they wished. And then they will all be washing their hands, all have sanitizer and all have masks on. Is there a hand, there's a sink associated with that for hand washing? In every too? bar, there is. Right, okay, so it would, at the worst, it would be only two individuals lined up. And I knew you had answered that, but I just couldn't remember because I was wrong on the number of the computer I fire, so thank you. All right. Okay, I think we're left you on the next one, break schedules and shift times. Yep. Um, it, they shall be staggered to the extent possible to avoid congregating in back of the house. Employee meetings shall be conducted in a manner to promote social distancing. Employees shall be encouraged to wash and or sanitize hands frequently and may use front of the house restrooms to facilitate doing so. All back of the house areas shall be cleaned frequently, including but not limited to employee entrances. <coughs> locker rooms, dining areas, security and surveillance areas, count rooms, cages, and routes of travel between those areas with specific attention given to high touch areas. And that completed the general guidance around employees for this document. Any questions on, on the employee section? 
I just have one question, uh, just to be clarify, on the employee entrance uh, regarding temperature checks, uh, would that also include our own MGC employees or state police? I'm not sure what they're doing right now. I think at, at, at Encore, they are testing our folks as they come in just in, um, in, for an enhanced safety measure. Is that correct? That's correct, and I think it, irrespective of where they come in, even if they come in through the guest entrance, they would still be tested. Uh, we okay. are encouraging everyone to come through employee entrance, but um, obviously because of the guest testing, everyone would be uh, captured. Okay. So, Karen, let's get to my um, point I made earlier that we really want to make sure that there's cross training and cross um, understanding because we do have the GEU folks, the gaming agents, and then of course GameSense advisors. So we want to make sure they're complying with what we're expecting of the um, the licensees here. Correct? Everyone's in agreement with that. All right. Yes. And, and yeah, one we of the things that we're doing is we're developing um, sort of a procedure for our vendors. So, you know, we've also got uh, leases within the premises, so we can certainly share all of that as well. And then if there's any concern that's raised by either uh, MGC or the state police or, um, or the gambling council for their, on behalf of their employees, you know, we, we, need to, we need to have conversations. We want to make sure there's no, no concerns. I, and I think um, Dana and our team has already spoken with Bruce and Angela around IEB and, and their, so the IEB and GU have full access to multiple entrances and exits with our employees. We control it by limiting their access to certain entrances. I okay. believe um, Bruce and Angela have indicated that IEB is perfectly happy complying with that. We haven't, I don't know that we've yet had the conversations with GU, but that would require their, you know, active cooperation in, in only entering and exiting through those, those points so that we can have a protected envelope of the back of the house employees and IBGU. We have agreed to that, yes. Karen? That's all, I'm all set, that's helpful, thank you. This was an exhaustive um, process, but a really important one. I want to thank uh, Karen, Loretta, Bruce, Burke, and everybody who I'm not acknowledging, but I know contributed to this effort, so thank you. Um, but most of all, thank you too for the licensees. Your input was really valuable. Um, my fellow commissioners, do you have any questions for anyone here before we, we close this discussion? In terms of ne next steps, I think there'll be a revision. So the document is no longer mostly three options. So in that draft can perhaps be circulated appropriately in accordance with open meeting law rules. Um, Karen, and then um, we can share with with the proper stake uh, stakeholders um, after you know once we get comfortable with the uh, revisions. And if need be, we can convene. Uh, we have a couple of meetings coming up, as you all know, um, and we can address uh, any outstanding issues. Okay, and then we'll wait to hear. I think we we do need to see what the governor's office does and and stay very um, you know, aware of what's happening in the, um, the federal government and the local governments. And then of course, if we learn something from jurisdictions that are, are underway, we have the ability to, to, to correct or add or edit. Okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Enrique, would you like to make a motion? Uh, yes, and before I do that, I just add the same thing. Thank you to everybody. It's clear it's clear that everybody has worked so much on this. There's been a lot of thought and, uh, and research on what everybody's doing. So collectively, both licensees and staff, thank you very much. Um, with that, I'll move to adjourn. I'll second. Any further edits, discussion, comments? No, just right. thanks everybody for their good work. That's that's universal, I think. Commissioner Cameron, anything? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, Commissioner. just to thank you. Nothing. Nothing. Commissioner Bryan, I'm sure you feel the same way. Thank you. And oh, I did. I thank you to everyone, particularly the licensees. I know this was a long day for everybody, but I think very necessary. Thank you, everyone.
um, of being real combo. Okay. And again, to the licensees, stay safe. Before we say goodbye, stay safe to all the team members. Many of our team has stayed on all day long. And, and whether they were working along the way, we just appreciate their attendance. So roll call vote. Be safe, everyone. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye, thank you again. And Commissioner Stebbins. All right, thanks everybody. Chair yes, thank you everyone.